whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's now time for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And here's an important announcement for Whistler fans in California only. Beginning next Sunday, January 2nd, due to California's going off daylight saving time, the Whistler will be heard in California only one hour earlier from 8.30 until 9. Remember the change in time in California only. The Whistler will be heard at a new time from 8.30 till 9. In other states, the Whistler will be heard at the same time as always. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Delayed Christmas present. Christmas was really over. For it was one o'clock in the morning at Pete's Cantina, a tough little night spot on the outskirts of Panama City. But the melody lingered on. You could hear the chimes of the big church a block away playing a death day for David. There was practically no business. Four hostesses, all Americans, were sitting drearily at the far end of the ballroom near the bar. One of them, Mary Winslow, billed as Candy Porter, just sat gazing drearily into space, thinking bitterly of a past from which for a while there had seen no escape. But for five months now, she'd been relatively safe. No one had been around asking any questions. As Candy Porter, blues singer... Mary Winslow had found a kind of security, not a happy security, for she was far away from home. And as the chimes became silent, Mary wondered if it was worthwhile. A reverie was broken up as she looked up and saw Spanish Pete, the fat, greedy owner of the cantina, approaching her table. Candy, Candy, look, there's an American gentleman just came in. He wants to buy you some champagne. Champagne, oh, you hear please, that? Please, Pete, not tonight. It's Christmas. I- I'd rather be alone if you don't mind. I do mind. Look. Pete. All right, all right. I'll let him spend his money on champagne. Ah, uh, now you're smart, baby. Here he comes. You turn, see the tall, heavy set American approach. Suddenly you become tense. You recognize the type, don't you? After a year of running away, you've learned to spot his kind in a moment. You fight to remain calm as he reaches your table. Sit down, Mr. Fontaine. Sit down. Sure you don't mind, Miss Porter? Of course not. Thanks. In that case, I guess I will. I'll go get the champagne. I keep him on ice. Eleven years old, fool. Cigarette, Mr. Fontaine? No, thanks. He don't mind if I do. Of course not. Light? Thanks. Strange, spending Christmas so far away from home. Mm-hmm. How come? Business. Important business. Couldn't it wait? No. This business means a lot to the... people I work for. Oh, well, here's what you say, bubble water. <laughs> For Marseille, 13 years old. You said 11. That was from La Havre. This is even better. Now I put him back in the ice. You want some more? You just call Pete. I got another one on ice, just like it. Well, I guess it's kind of late to wish you a Merry Christmas, Miss Porter. So I guess I'd better just say, uh, season's greeting. Anyway, here's luck. Here's hoping you find whatever you came here after. I've already found what I came after. I'm glad. I hope you will be. Why shouldn't I be? Because I came after you, Mary Winslow. With the prologue of delayed Christmas present, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. But now, since this is Christmas weekend, I want to thank you for inviting us of the Whistler cast into your home on this special occasion. 
During the six consecutive years that the Whistler has been broadcast by Signal Oil Company, many of us have had the pleasure of celebrating Christmas with many of you a number of times. And believe me, we feel it a real honor that you consider us a part of your entertainment family. Tonight, on behalf of Signal Oil Company and the independent signal dealers who serve the states of California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Nevada, and Arizona, I want to say... We hope that your Christmas has been a merry one. May your new year be filled with peace, prosperity, and the good health with which to enjoy these blessings. And now back to the whistler. a year, it doesn't seem fair, does it, Mary Winslow? After a year of hiding, using one name and then another, after five bitter months of singing at Pete's Cantina as Candy Porter, blues singer, this man Fontaine has come to take you back to the States to face the consequences of one horrible night. You're sure he's a detective. He couldn't be anything else. You can't run again. There's no place you could go. You've only one card left. And as you face the man across the table and listen to his even, level voice, you decide to play it. If you play it carefully, it might be an ace. I think you know why I'm here. We're leaving in the morning for Los Angeles, Miss Winslow. Like the billing says, my name is Candy Porter. I know what the billing says. I know what it said in Brooklyn when you were billed as Doris Trent, in Denver when you were billed as Gladys James. But... When you first took a powder out of Los Angeles, you were Mary Winslow. You know, it, it's almost funny you should call me Mary Winslow. We used to work together, her and me, in the same floor show. We could have been billed as twin sisters. The, the customers used to mistake us for each other, too. Now, look, Miss Winslow, let's quit kidding. I'm not kidding. A, a lot of other people have made the same mistake you have. And like I said, I, I knew Mary Winslow intimately. I think I could help you solve your case if you, if you let me tell you about her. Sure, sure. Go ahead, it'll make you feel any better. Thanks. You see, Mary Winslow was really just a good kid that got a bad break. In love with this swell guy and, and scared to death of a hoodlum. She, she told me all about it. it. It's quite a story. How about it is? Yes, it was quite a story, wasn't it, Mary? And it all began a year ago Christmas Eve at the Christmas party given by your employers in the pink room of the Swank Wilchester Hotel. You really enjoyed yourself that night, didn't you? And you were quite the hit of the evening. You sang three numbers and went over big. Your fellow workers didn't know your many talents. Everyone told you what a fine singer you were. And when you left, you were feeling good. So good, you decided to drop into the cocktail lounge, make a phone call, and have a nightcap before going home. <laughs> Scotch and soda. Mix it. Make mine the same, Bill. Got you? I, uh, I heard you sing tonight. You were terrific. Thanks. What's the matter? Did he stand you up? Who? The guy we just talking to on the phone. No, I guess he didn't stand here. Didn't he? And he's on his way here right now. <laughs> yep, that's the answer. Lucky guy. Here you are, folks. Oh, take it out of here, Bill. Dollar now, look out. here, oh, Mr. Oh, take it easy. It's practically Christmas. What's the harm of my buying you one drink? Like I said, I like your voice, Mr. Here's your change. Oh, thanks, Bill. You must be a detective. You know my name and everything. No, no, not everything. But it uh, wasn't any trick to find out your name. I just asked one of the boys if I could dance with. My name's Joe Clark. Oh, I see you've never heard of me. Should I have? A lot of people have. Most of the boys and girls are on the night spots, know me. Well, then that accounts for my ignorance. You see, I seldom haunt the night spots. Well, you should. With a voice like yours, you could be packing them in in a good nightclub. Oh, now I get it. You're a professional talent scout, and you want to get me into the movies. No, no. I'm a gambler. Shocking. 
Why should it? Live and let live is my motto. And that's exactly what I'm going to do right now. Huh? Live my life and let you live yours. Good night, Mr. Clark. My, my, my. Just think, tomorrow I can tell all the girls at the office I met a real live gambler. You could tell them all a lot more than that if you believed in your voice as much as I do. I... Really? Uh -huh. You've heard of Domingo's on Sunset out near the ocean? It's an undercover gambling club, isn't it's it? It's more than a gambling club. It's a swell full of show. A lot of big people go out there, people that count. And they're all intimate friends of yours, I'm sure. Uh, not all, but I know quite a few. Could push you right to the top with that voice. Oh, that's the oldest line I've ever heard. It's not a line. <laughs> yeah, but skip it. Go on home. Listen to the radio. Eat candy. You can have a terrific time. You go to Domingo's with me, you can't tell what might happen. You might have to meet a couple of show producers. So play it safe and go home. It may be dull, but you'll always get to work on that. Is that all you have to say? That's all. Nighty-night. Wait a minute. Yeah? Could we, uh... Could we be back fairly early? Leave any time you say. Well, what are we waiting for? Oh, well, now you're making sense. I'll call the cab. Never mind. I have a car. It's parked right around the corner. Clark used just the right approach, didn't he, Mary? You realize you're being a fool. But as the hours pass, you tell yourself your fears are groundless. Joe treats you with perfect courtesy. You watch the gambling for a while, then proceed to the silver room and enjoy the floor show. Afterward, you have a little food and watch the dancers. Do you mind if we leave now? I said we'd leave any time you said. What is it? The music? Yeah, I guess that's it. Another guy? Another guy. My, uh, my fiancé. What happened to him? He's in the Philippines. Research. Mm. Chemist? Doctor. Doctor Frank Wilson, M.D. That was his car we drove out here in. <laughs> he told me to keep it warm for him. Well, too bad. We could have had a lot of fun. Well, shall we go? Was it just the song, Mary? Or was it that uneasy feeling you have about Joe that made you want to leave so suddenly? It must have been the song. Or as you're ready to leave the club grounds, Joe is still a considerate escort. And hop in. <laughs> Oh, unless you want me to drive. Uh, I'll drive, unless you mind too much. <laughs> no, I don't mind. Probably be safer, too. For several miles, Joe says little, seems preoccupied. And you feel relieved when he breaks his rather strange silence. Oh, uh, say, Mary, would you mind stopping for a minute to drive in? All of a sudden, I'd have an awful headache. Maybe I can get some aspirin. I doubt it, but we'll give it a try. Uh, you can keep the motor running while I'm gone. I'll only be gone a few seconds. Okay. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Joe! Get gone. Joe, you, you shot him. I said get gone fast. There's a gun in your ribs, baby. You just saw what happened to one guy that crossed me. Is, is he dead? I don't know. Oh, you. You. Oh, why was I such a fool? I'm right at the next corner. The car's been tailing us for the last time. I'm minutes. glad. I hope it's a foul car to save me the trouble of phoning the police. <laughs> He didn't turn, baby. You shouldn't have said what you did about phoning the cops. You better pull over and park. We got a couple of things to talk over. I said pull over! Yeah, 
That's better. Please. Please, Joe, don't kill me. I, I know you can do it easy, but I'll never talk about tonight. That's the way you feel now. An hour from now, you'll feel... Oh, no, better. I won't. I'm a word of honor. I'm making a deal with you, Joe. I'm trading you my silence for my life. I swear I won't talk about it ever. Okay, I'll take a chance. You drove the getaway car, so we're partners now anyway. We're going to have a lot of fun together, you and me. Now what? How about dropping me off at my place? Tell me where to go. I live about six... After you drop Joe and you reach your apartment, you're so weak you can hardly stand. Your senses are reeling, your brain is spinning. You practically fall into bed. You try to snatch a little sleep, but sleep is impossible. Finally, at six o'clock in the morning, the newspaper is shoved under your apartment door. The headlines sicken you. Drive-in operator shot and hold up dies. The subheadings are even worse. Unidentified man and woman seen fleeing from scene of crime in dark green 47 model Chevrolet. Pedestrian believes he can identify both car and woman. There it is, Mary. Hopeless, isn't it? Even if you called the police, your story would sound phony now. It's closing in on you, isn't it, Mary? Yet frightened as you are, you're certain of two things. That you're not going to become further involved with Joe Clark. And you won't allow any unfavorable publicity to fall on your absent fiancé, Dr. Frank Wilson. You were foolish to risk a life of happiness with him, weren't you? For a few moments of excitement with a gambler, a murderer like Joe Clark. But you decide there's only one thing you can do, Mary. Leave town, disappear, and never see Clark again. You dress hurriedly, packing only a few belongings, and then spend Christmas day and night at the home of a girlfriend. The next morning, you're on an eastbound plane. Three months later, you're singing in the Golden Lion, a prosperous little nightclub in Brooklyn, New York where you become a featured performer under the name of Doris Trent. You're a great success under your new name. And then one night you have a visitor. You're sure it's Mr. Vern Shields, London musical comedy producer. Come in. I'm... Well, well, what do you know? Long time no see, Miss Trent. Doris Trent, it says on the program. All right, Joe, now that you've found me, what's on your mind? You double-crossed me, baby. You're crazy. That's why I left town, so I wouldn't have to talk to anybody. But you could still write, couldn't you? I don't get you. That anonymous note to the police, written just after you left, telling all about that driving job. You gave the exact time, my name, where I lived, what I had on, everything. But not a word about the girl with me. Funny, huh? You're the only one that knew all of that, baby. Oh, no, Joe, you're wrong. Believe me, I didn't write any notes. Couldn't have been anyone else. Two days after you left, they picked me up for questions. Anybody could have written a note like that. Well, one of your enemies might have wanted you out of circulation and tried to frame you. Yeah, maybe, but I died. Joe, I didn't write it. I've kept my bargain with you a hundred percent. There's one way you can convince me. How? Marry me tonight. Marry you? Yeah. That way I'll be sure of you. Wives don't testify against their husbands. Besides, I'll know what you're doing all the time. Oh, Joe, I, I, I gotta go to my show. Let's talk this over tonight or else. You can run up to Connecticut, but go ahead, do your show. If you've got any ideas about calling in the cops, don't forget you drove the getaway car. And in case anything serious should happen to me, there's a written confession in my pocket telling exactly how you helped me pull the job. How we used your boyfriend's car. How you kept the motor running waiting for me. Your doctor would love reading about that, wouldn't he? No. No, he wouldn't. And don't get funny. Go ahead and on to your show. I'll wait for you here. You start down the hallway toward the powder room off stage. Suddenly you realize what a fool you've been. But you're not going to keep on being a fool, are you, Mary? Not with that wall telephone just five steps ahead of you. 
Operator. Oh, operator. Get me police headquarters. But quick. I hang up quick, babe, and I mean quick. You should have looked around before you called. I had a hunch you'd try to double cross me. Now I know for sure who wrote that note to the cops. Oh, I didn't, Joe. You just tried to call him, didn't you? All of a sudden, I've lost interest in getting married. We're just going for a little ride. Come on, babe, start walking. No, Joe. I'm not moving a foot, not an inch. If I have to be shot, I'll take it right here. Let go of my arm. Hey, what's going on here? Something wrong, Doris? This guy bothering you? Yes, he is. He, he, he wants to date me. Tell him to leave, will you, Eddie? Maybe I'd better take him into the office and call the cops. No. No. Thanks, Eddie. There's no need for that. He's just another wolf. Tell him to leave. That's good enough. You heard what the lady said, bud. Start traveling. Okay, chum. Anything you say. I'll see the lady later. We parked right across the street. Just trying to... You should have let me call the cops. I would have if he hadn't had you covered with his gun. Oh? Thanks, kid. Hetty, i got to get out of town fast. After what you just did for me, that's a cinch. Grab some clothes while I phone my wife I'm bringing you home. We'll uh, I'll go out the rear entrance. My car's on the lot next door. Tomorrow I'll call a friend of mine in Denver. It'll put you to work right away. Yeah, you better change your name, though. That'll be easy. I'm getting used to it. So, Mr. Fontaine, that's where I met Mary Winslow in Denver at the Hi Hat Club. Built as Gladys James. She, uh, she roomed with me about two months and then she, she left. Just like that one night when, when a waiter told us some guy wanted to interview her for a magazine. That's, that's the last I ever saw of her. That's the end of the story? That's the end. And Mary Winslow told you all this? Oh, we, we were very close friends. Oh, so you were. You expect me to believe that? Oh, it's true, every word of it. You know something? You ought to be writing stories for the movie. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Now that Christmas shopping is out of the way for another year, most of us are figuring ways to get our badly stretched budgets back into shape, which makes now a mighty appropriate time to talk about Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. Mileage, of course, is only one of the reasons that folks who insist on getting the most from each gasoline dollar choose Signal. In addition, they like the superior performance that goes hand-in-hand hand with mileage. You see, the only way today's signal gasoline can give you such good mileage is by helping your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, you also enjoy quicker starting, faster pickup, smoother power, the things that make driving more pleasure. So, among your resolutions for the new year, how about resolving to put signal gasoline to the test in your car? See for yourself why drivers who insist on quality as well as those with an eye for economy, are both switching to signal the famous go-farther gasoline. And now back to the whistler. Well, Mary, it looks as though you've lost, doesn't it? That your one card wasn't enough. The man across the table, the man you're sure is a detective, who has come to take you back to Los Angeles, to stand trial for a hold-up and murder you had nothing to do with doesn't believe you, does he? And the jury in Los Angeles won't believe you either. Yes, Mary, it looks as though you've lost. But you're going to play the game to the end anyway. And as the piano player across the floor plays the tune he's played a thousand times in the last two weeks, you quietly watch Fontaine and await his next word. How long did you say you've been here? I didn't say. I, I got here about five months ago. Like it here? 
No. That's what I figured. Look, Miss... Cigarette? Uh, yeah, thanks. Hi. Mm-hmm. Thanks again, Miss Porter. Did you say Miss Porter? That's what you said your name was, didn't you? That's what the billing says, too, isn't it? Oh, thanks, Mr. Fontaine. Thanks for believing me. Uh, there's just one thing I'd like to ask you, Mr. Ask me anything. Uh, knowing Miss Winslow as well as you do, do you think she might come back to Los Angeles sometime and sort of clear things up? I think she might. Someday. You see, a, a girl like Mary Winslow gets to feel kind of soiled after working around in joints like this. She'd probably want to spend a little time, maybe out in the desert, in the sunshine. Sort of freshening up before anybody she cared about. Yeah. Maybe she would. Well, this was a pretty long trip for nothing, you must say. Just one more bum steer. But I'm glad it came. I always figured that confession we found on Joe Clark was a phony. Clark? Is Joe Clark in jail? He's dead. The Brooklyn police got him one night about uh, five months ago. Anyhow, they got the tip. A woman called the police one night from the little nightclub, the Golden Lion Club. She hung up before they answered the phone, but the Brooklyn boys decided to investigate anyway. One of them spotted Clark parking the car across the street, and he got trigger happy. How was that? Joe Clark. Finished. Well, Miss Porter, if you ever run into Mary Winslow... I'll there. tell her all about the Christmas present I got from a swell cop named Fontaine. <laughs> I'm not a cop, Miss Porter. You're not? Then... Then who are you? I'm a private investigator. Working for a guy named... Wilson. Dr. Frank Wilson. Frank Wilson? That's right. He's in love with Mary Winslow. Doesn't care where she's been. Just wants her to come back and marry him. Well, uh... So long, Miss Porter, and Happy New Year. Mr. Fontaine. Yes? Do you... Do you think you could arrange for me to go back to the States with you? I guess I could, and I was figuring on taking one lady back. Are you going on through to Los Angeles? Not for a while. I'd kind of like to spend a little time in the country somewhere. But I think maybe before next Christmas. Well, I think I'll find Mary Winslow again. That whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Now let me repeat an important announcement for Whistler fans in California only. Beginning next Sunday, January 2nd, due to California's going off daylight saving time, The Whistler will be heard in California only one hour earlier from 8.30 until 9. Remember the change in time in California only. The Whistler will be heard at a new time from 8.30 till 9. In other states, The Whistler will be heard at the same time as always. Featured in tonight's story were Joan Banks and Jack Petruzzi. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen and directed by Gordon Hughes, with story by Edward Bloodworth and music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer 
bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Lie or Consequences. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Presently, I'll tell you of nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Within the human character, the line between good and evil is a thin and waving one. And very often, the one small impulse for good will outweigh and nullify the bad. Such was the case with Michael Cobb. Mike wasn't bad, really. It happened while he was a kid before he knew any better. He'd gotten into trouble, gone to prison, served a stretch. Now he's out, and he's learned his lesson. He's proving that. He's going straight, working hard at his job in the office of a large department store. He's married to a girl he loves, and he's happy. Mm, delicious, delicious. <laughs> oh, nobody can cook a better breakfast than you, darling. Thank you, sir. Now, Mike, but, uh, don't bolt your coffee. I gotta run. I'll be late. Well, a couple of minutes won't make any difference. Well, maybe not most days, but today is gonna be a big one. The last shopping day before Christmas, you know. Stores will be jammed. We'll be swamped with work until late tonight. Besides, I don't want to spoil my record. Six months and I haven't been late to work once. I know, I know. It's fine. I'm sure the store appreciates it. Yeah, Lane, I... I think they do, too. I really think they like me down there. You know, like my work and everything. Oh, sure, Mike. How could they help liking you? No, no, I mean, well, I'm beginning to feel like all that stuff is all forgotten. Almost like something that's never happened. It is. It is forgotten, Mike. Everything's different now. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Oh, this is going to be a lot different Christmas than the last one, isn't it? Yes, Mike. You were wonderful, Elaine. Coming to see me, sticking by me. Oh, darling, I promise you there'll never be another Christmas like that. Never. I know there won't, Mike. From now on, they're, they're all going to be really merry Christmas. Yeah, you bet. Oh, gosh, that reminds me. I haven't got your presents yet. I'll have to run out my lunch hour and find something. Now, now, Mike, you're not going to go spending a lot of money on me. Oh, maybe next year we'll be more than No, no, never the... you mind. I'll get you what I've done, please. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, I will be late if I don't run. Hey, 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 here's your hat. Oh, thanks. Well, goodbye, darling. If I don't get home before midnight, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yes, it looks like a Merry Christmas for you at last, doesn't it, Mike? For the first time in your life, almost, a real Merry Christmas. You notice the smiles on people's faces as they walk down the street. They get sort of a kick out of the fancy red and green draped windows of the store. The holly smells good in the elevator. And you chuckle as you pass the toy department with a perspiring Santa Claus pulling on his red coat. Then into the office, everybody smiling. Yeah, you know what, Mike? Maybe you're getting that thing they call the Christmas spirit. Well, morning, George. Merry Christmas. Hi, Mike. Pretty cheerful this morning, huh? Oh, why not? It's almost Christmas, a day of good cheer. Well, what's the matter with you, Sourpuss? Uh, nuts, humble. Uh-oh, the boss on the rampage again, huh? Yeah. Well, what is it this time? You haven't heard? No, what? Yeah, somebody lifted another thousand bucks out of the receipts last night. What, again? Yeah, it makes about ten grand that's been missing in the last six months. Well, no wonder Mr. Humboldt's upset. Yeah, the detectives are in there with him right now, and they've got old Gus, the night watchman, in for questioning. I suppose we'll all be on the carpet like the last time. Oh, gee, that's not so good. $10,000. Hey, that's grand larceny. Yeah, and the cops are probably getting pretty sore about not pinning it on somebody. Now, look, here comes old Gus, fresh from the Inquisition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Homeboy. Gus. Uh, hey, Gus. Yeah, Mr. Osborne? Are they playing questions and answers in there again, Gus? Uh, yeah. There was you this time, there was you that time. The only time I got to sleep when they called me down here for this. <laughs> What for would I want to steal money for? I got a wife. Fine wife. Four kids. I steal money, I go to jail. They starve. What for would I steal? Sure, sure, I guess. But I know why you're so worked up about it. Yeah? You probably had to admit where you were last night between 12 and 1 o'clock. 
How come you know that, the high boss? Go on. Everybody in the store knows that, Gus. It's a standing joke. Everybody knows you eat your lunch every morning between 12 and 1. They know you go up to the 13th floor and stretch out on one of those divans in the Louis the 15th room, the classiest in the joint. Okay, so what's wrong with that? I got to eat. Why not in style? Sure, only for that hour. Anybody could come in and move out the other 12 floors and you'd never know it. All right, so what? Maybe that is when somebody stole money. I do not know. I only know I did not steal. And this is the only time I got to sleep when they have to go asking me questions. <laughs> what a character. Hey, uh, is that true about his breakfast from 12 to 1? Sure. There's a night watchman for you. <laughs> that probably explains why they're so sure the thief is somebody inside the store. Somebody who knows about Gus and what time he won't be on this floor. Yeah, it could be. Uh-oh, that's Humboldt. Yes, Mr. Humboldt. Yes. It's right away, sir. <laughs> Just as I thought. It's my turn now. Well, if I start screaming, you'll know he's putting me on the rack. Okay. I'll bring a branding iron to your rescue. Don't laugh yet. You'll probably be next. If Humboldt really decides to catch a thief, he'll catch one by hook or crook. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Mike. Oh, now, what's the matter? You don't seem as happy as you were. Something happened to dampen the Christmas spirit, maybe? Something you can't describe, can't even put your finger on? Just a funny, sinking feeling? Forget it. George Osborne has been in and out of Humboldt's office, and almost the whole day has gone by and nothing's happened. And everything seems to have calmed down. In fact, it's George's turn to have the Christmas spirit. I really didn't expect it this year, but there it was in my pay envelope. Nice and crisp and green. With the best Christmas wishes of the J.C. Devers store. Oh, gee, that's swell, George. Yeah, real honest to gosh Christmas bonus. I can sure use it. <laughs> Who couldn't? I don't know whether you'll get one or not, Mike. You've only been here six months. Then maybe. Uh, by the way, why don't you mosey in and pick up your pay? It's almost nine o'clock. We close in five minutes. Well, I guess I'd better wait for Mr. Humboldt to call me. Golly, I thought we'd get paid earlier. Still haven't bought a lane's present. Ah, well, don't worry. Most of the smaller stores will still be open for a couple of hours. Yeah, sure. But I, uh, I thought I'd get her something she liked. We were well, a little store up on 10th Avenue. Oh, well, it'll be open till late. Say, I wonder if they found out anything about the 10 grand. Boy, they've really questioned everybody around, though. They didn't question me. In fact, they'd never questioned me about it. I don't quite understand that. Oh, well, I don't know. I guess you got such an honest face or something. Yeah. Uh-oh. Yes, Mr. Humboldt. Well, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'll send him right in. Well, maybe we spoke too soon. He wants to see you. Oh? On the other hand, maybe he just wants to hand you your Christmas bonus in person. After all, you are getting to be the fair-haired boy around here these days. I'd better go in. <laughs> you might even be in line for a promotion. You can't tell. Okay, okay. You wanted to see me, Mr. Humboldt? Yes, oh, uh, yes, Carl Conner. Uh, sit down. Sit down. Uh, thank you, sir. Carl, you've been with us uh, six months now. Yes, sir. And I must admit that in that time you've demonstrated an admirable aptitude for the work. Thanks, Mr. Humboldt. Yes, in fact, there's been some discussion of raising your salary, promoting you. I even talked to Mr. Prentice, the manager, about it myself. Well, thanks, Mr. Humboldt. Yes, and that's why I regret very much to tell you this. I must inform you that we're forced to dispense with your services as of tonight. Dispense? You... You mean I'm fired? I'm afraid that's it. Yeah, your two weeks pay is in this envelope. Wait a minute. If I'm bed so good, why am I being fired? I'm not at liberty to offer any explanations. I have my orders just It's got as... something to do with this missing money, hasn't it? I told this you This is your it... way of telling me you think I took it, isn't it? Now, call my... That's idea. it, isn't it, Mr. Humboldt? You've questioned everyone else in the department. With me, you figure questions are unnecessary, don't you? Well, since you put it that way, Cobb, naturally we must take into consideration your past. You know about my prison record. I told you about it. But I've told you about it if I was going to steal again. I'm not accusing you of stealing again. I only say we can't afford to take chances. We simply find it advisable. All right. I understand. I understand a lot of things now, Mr. Humboldt. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Humboldt, for the Christmas bonus. Hey, hey, Mike. Mike, wait a minute. Well, did you get it? Did he give you a Christmas bonus? Yeah. 
Yeah, I got a Christmas bonus, all right. Hey, what's up? What's the matter? Oh, nothing. I'll, I'll tell you about it later. I'm leaving now. Oh, yeah, you're in a hurry. Uh, but wait, uh, I, I almost forgot. Uh, with my bonus, I can pay you the 30 bucks I owe you. Huh? Here. 10, 20, 30. That ought to help with that present for your wife, huh? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, George. Thanks. Merry Christmas, Mike. <laughs> yeah. That premonition you had this morning was right, wasn't it? That funny, thinking feeling. Now you know, don't you, Mike? You knew it all the time, really. All this past six months, you've been kidding yourself. That dream bubble has burst. Merry Christmas, Mike. The crowds are still cheerful on the street. The windows are still bright and gay, and the holly still spices the air. But you don't see or feel or smell. No, there's only the sensation of a chill wind cutting you to the bone as you wander the dark streets, not knowing or caring where you are. Hello, Michael. Merry Christmas. Huh? Oh. Oh, hello, Reverend Ewart. Hi. I didn't see you. So I noticed. I was just getting home from my last minute shopping. Won't you come in for a moment? A cup of tea, perhaps? Why, no, I... I... Oh, come on. I haven't seen you for a long time. That is for a chat. Besides, it's chilly out. A cup of hot tea will warm you up. You look as if you could stand warming up, Michael. Come in. No, no, I've, I've got to get along. Oh, come now. That lovely wife of yours will miss you for a few more minutes. I tell you, I've got to go. Very well, Michael. I won't keep you. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry, Reverend. I didn't mean to... You know... Well, I understand, son. You're troubled. Is there anything I can do? No. No, I'm all right. Well, I know you too well, Michael. I've known you all my life. Now, I've, I've helped you before, haven't I? Why... I don't know. I don't know whether you did or not. All that stuff you told me about turning over a new leaf, forgetting the past... I believe it. Oh, yes, of course. Hal, well, maybe you should have told it to some other people instead of me. It just don't work, Reverend. It just don't work. All that stuff about being good and doing good. It Hal, does. it don't pay you off. It does, Michael. It does. You must believe that. Even a little good done brings a great reward. Yeah, maybe to some people. Only maybe some of us are behind an eight ball we can't get around. Michael, please come in. I feel I must talk to Not you. Not tonight, maybe... Reverend. But all the talking I can stand. I'm going to do my own thinking. I know what I'm going to do. You can bet your sweet life I know just what I'm going to do. Yes, your mind is made up now, isn't it, Mike? Humboldt made it up for you, didn't he? You hate him, don't you, Mike? And all the smug people like him who've never done a stretch and stir. They're your enemies, aren't they, Mike? Whether you wanted them to be or not. And you're just one of the cell rats. Okay, if that's the way it is, that's the way you'll play it. What's that? Footsteps following you? Maybe if you stop by this lighted window. Yeah, you were right, Mike. They're following you, all right, two of them. You saw them duck into that doorway when you stopped and turned around. Tail. They got dicks tailing me. Why, sure, you dope. They wouldn't let you just walk out of there. They think you took the money. They're going to tail you, hound you, track you down. Okay. Okay, if they think I took the money, I'll give them reason to. This time, I will take it. You are listening to The Whistler, brought to you by your friend, the Signal Oil Company. Marketers of famous Signal Gasoline, your best buy today. Remember to let every go signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Christmas, Mike. <laughs> a very merry Christmas, isn't it? Six months of going straight and you've given it up. You're going back, back to the store and get your share of those days' receipts. Yes, it's all so simple, isn't it, Mike? 
It'll soon be 12 o'clock midnight. And old Gus will be up in the Louis 15th room on the 13th floor. The safe in Humboldt's office will be a cinch. You've seen it many times. And as for the two dicks tailing you now, it'll be duck soup to shake them. Duck soup. That's right. You're heading up 10th Avenue now. You can double back and... What's wrong, Mike? Why are you stopping? Could it be that tune, the brightly lighted window, the old man standing back there? Of course, now you remember. 10th Avenue. This is old Mr. Samuel's little store. This is it, where you're going to buy Elaine her Christmas present. And there it is. What you heard, the music box, sitting on the counter next to the open door, playing... Good evening, Michael, and Merry Christmas. Hiya, Mr. Samuel. You came in just in time. I was just about to close up. I guess down at your big store, you've been closed for a long time. But here, well, we little fellows have to stay open to get all the business we can. What can I do for you? I, uh... Is this the music box that Elaine likes so well? Ah, uh, yes, that is the one. She was very taken with it. Ah, how her eyes sparkled when she looked at it. Yeah, that's a part of her something inside, isn't it? Oh, that is right. And when you open it, it plays the little tune. So. Yes, she was saying how it was her favorite tune. Okay. How much is it? Well, it's, uh, it's usually priced at 75, but I'll give it to you and the young lady for 50. $50? Well, yes, you see, it's a genuine antique and it's the best thing I have in this store. Well, I'm I'm sorry, but that's more than I figured out. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, too. I I would have let you have it for less if I could, but 50 is the lowest. Sure, sure. Well, okay, forget it. I'm sorry. Come back again. Now what's the matter, Mike? Why are you stopping? Could it be you can't make up your mind? Could it be you're thinking about the music box? About Elaine, about Christmas. Yes, this may be your last Christmas with her, you know. Your last chance to give her a decent present with clean money. Money you earn. It might be a nice gesture, eh, Mike? A little token of all that might have been. Oh, uh, Mr. Samuels, I'll take it. Wrap it up as a gift and I'll take it. Merry Christmas, Mike. That's what's written across the package. It was going to be a symbol for a wonderful new life, wasn't it? And now it's an ironic farewell. Your last attempt at doing good, as Reverend Hewitt called it. Too bad it won't bring you that great reward he promised. It won't have a chance. Because there are those two dicks still following you. And you, you're heading for J.C. Deaver's department store. Office of Henry Humboldt. And the interior of his face. It's almost 12 midnight, and you have to duck those girls, guys. 30 pick. girls, 30. The greatest little show in town, starring Tootsie Laverne and her 30 raving beauties. A new show just started. Only 40 cents. Take it, mister. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. 40 cents. Thank you, sir. A new show just started. Hurry, 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 ladies and gentlemen. You're doing great, Mike. Those dicks will follow you in, but you won't be there, will you? No. You're heading for that exit sign down at the side. Through the curtain, push out through the door, and there you are. In the alley. And free. Okay. Now, up to the street. Lose yourself in the crowd. Turn down fifth toward the store. You're okay now. No need to look back. Or is there? They're there. You didn't shake them after all. They were wise to that trick, and they were waiting for you outside the theater. Yes, you should have known. Now what? Maybe you've got an idea. Yes. A good idea, a honey. Why not lead them to the store? Sure, that's where they expect you to go. But beat them there and hide, down in the freight dock, behind one of those big crates. They'll never find you in that mess. Then when they get tired looking, you'll be able to slip in and do the job. How's that? Brilliant. Yes, brilliant. Yes, 
here's the store. There they are, a quarter of a block behind. When you hit the alley, you'll run for it. Make a dash back to the back. And you'll be so far ahead then, they won't know whether you got in or not. And you'll fool them entirely. You'll have them searching the whole store. Okay, here it is. Okay, you made it. You left them way behind. Here's the freight, Doc. Okay, come on, coppers. Just try and find me in here. I'm found it. Now he's left. I told you you knew we were following him. Sure, sure. But let's not waste time. We had plenty of time to get in. Probably with his employee's key. Okay, okay. Get out your skeleton and let's go in after him. Work like a charm, didn't it, Mike? You're sitting here in your crate, comfortably waiting, while they search the entire store. They've been there long enough to do it. It's almost one. If they don't hurry, you'll have Gus to worry about. Not that that's too much of a worry. But wait, hold it. Well, that does it. Yeah, too bad. Hey, flash your light around. We could have ducked into one of these crates here. Yeah, 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 but we never find in that mess. He could play hide and seek with us there for days. Yeah, you're right. I guess we might as well call it a day. It's a fine way to spend Christmas Eve anyway. Go on, let's go home. Okay, I'm right beside you. Well, Mike, Merry Christmas. This is better than you expected. They're leaving, actually going away. Leaving the place to your tender mercy. You won't have to dodge them coming out. They aren't going to camp out in Humboldt's office. They're actually walking away, down the alley, and you're set. Good Lord, I'm the box. Something's wrong that's going. I can't stop. I can't. Hey, hey, Joe. Joe, Yeah. I hear it. Come on, right over here. I've got to stop. i got to. <laughs> okay, right here. In this place. Too late. Okay, Cobb. We finally cornered you. Come on out. No use hiding in there now, Cab. Come on, come on, come on. We want to talk to you. Yeah, yeah, I know. I got the idea. Okay. Okay, you got me. Yeah. Thanks for the music. Let us right to the dance floor. Yeah. That's the great reward the minister was talking about. Great. I don't get you. Oh, you wouldn't. It's a private little joke on me. Yeah? Well, that music maybe did you a big favor, Cobb. Favor? That's right. Maybe you'll see what I mean if you'll answer a few questions for us. I don't see why I should. You got nothing to be afraid of, kid. If you'll just answer a couple of questions straight. I'll answer one. I didn't do it. I had nothing to do with okay, it. Okay, okay. You had nothing to do with it. We didn't ask you that question. But answer this. You brought that music box to the store on 10th Avenue a while ago, didn't you? You know I did. You saw me buy it. And you paid for it with two twenties and a ten, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, part of that money was marked. It was money that had been stolen from Deaver's department store. I tell you, it wasn't stolen. That was the dough. I got my pay envelope. All of it? Didn't somebody else give you part of it? No, I just earned the whole thing. Didn't George Osborne give you part of it? Osborne? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he did. Oh. He paid me $30. He owed me. Okay. Now, this is very important. How did Osborne pay you? In what denomination of bills? Well, I... Yeah. Yeah, I remember. He gave me three tens. Tens? You're sure? Sure, I'm sure. And the twenties came to you in your pay envelope, huh? Yeah. You'll swear to that in court? Of course. Okay. That does it. Thanks, Tom. Hey, wait. You mean... That's all you wanted me for? It was enough. You just proved for us who stole that ten grand from the store. And the way you were acting, we just almost thought it was you. We hadn't have known better all the time. not the end of the story. The Whistler will bring it to you in just a moment. Meantime, Signal Oil Company joins with 1,800 Signal gasoline dealers throughout the West from Canada to Mexico in hoping that this has been a good Christmas for you. It wasn't the Christmas we had all hoped and prayed for. There were too many empty places at the table, too many empty places in our hearts. As we look back, we may wonder if perhaps we didn't give quite enough, not quite enough of our efforts of our money, 
and of our blood, which can mean life itself to a boy at the front. Yet even the regrets that may tinge this season's gladness can prove its greatest blessing if they fire us to new determination, to new and greater effort through the coming year until our prayers are finally answered and peace again returns to heal this confused and torn world. Yes, if, as this Christmas of 1944 draws to a close, we will rededicate ourselves to this, our job, we may, each of us, hasten the realization of that ancient promise, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, quite surprising, isn't it? The police didn't suspect Mike at all. You see, it was this way. Because of his record, the cops began to tail Mike in the very beginning, when the money first began to be missed. Twice they had him under observation at the very time the money was stolen, so they knew he didn't do it. But they kept watching him in the hope he would lead them to the real thief, and he did. Yes, because when things got hot, the thief finally tried to frame Mike by giving him some of the stolen money. Marked money this time. George Osborne? Oh, no. In fact, Osborne almost gummed things up by paying his debt. The detectives hadn't counted on that. That's why they had to be sure which bills Osborne gave Mike. The tens weren't marked. The twenties were. The twenties Mike got in his pay envelope from Humboldt. Yes, Henry Humboldt, the office manager. You see, things were getting too hot for him. The trail was getting too close. He knew the money was marked, and he knew the detectives were watching Mike. So he gave him some of the marked bills in his severance pay, trying to frame him. It couldn't have worked, of course, but Humboldt didn't know that, and neither did Mike. And Mike almost did something he'd regretted all his life. He almost went back to a life of crime. Yes, if the music box hadn't have jammed and started playing just when it did, and the detectives had gone off, Mike's life would have gone down the skid. Because it did play when it did. Well, next week he'll be back at the store in a better job. Yes, and he got a Christmas bonus, too. They saw to that after Humboldt was arrested. And all because the music box played. Maybe that's why Mike said... <laughs> no, sir. That music box sits right there on the table where everybody can see it. <laughs> Darling, I really think it means as much to you as it does to me. Oh, I guess maybe it does, Elaine. Just like the Reverend Hewitt says, a little good brings a great reward. Yeah, for the rest of my life, that little gadget's going to mean a Merry Christmas. Darling, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Mike. The Signal Oil Program will bring you another strange tale by The Whistler. The Signal Oil Program is broadcast for your entertainment by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal's famous Go Father gasoline and motor oil, and by your neighborhood Signal Oil dealer, who is at your service daily to keep your car running for the duration. The Signal Oil Program, produced by George W. Allen, with music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking for your friend, the Signal Oil Company, and suggesting once again that you let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler, transcribed by the Signal Oil Company for Christmas Eve to enable the entire production staff of The Whistler to spend Christmas Eve at home with their families. Signal, the famous Go Farther Gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. Whistler, 
and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now, for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler brings you a most unusual story. One of the most heartwarming stories of our times, especially appealing this Christmas Eve. Three Wise Guys. T'was the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Even Broadway, that glamorous avenue of make-believe in faraway New York, seemed empty, deserted. Most cafes and eating places were closed. But the doors of an occasional refuge for those hardy souls who prefer to walk alone were still open. Such a place was Good Time Charlie's Bar on 49th Street, where on another Christmas Eve, a series of unusual events began, ending in one of the most unusual stories Good Time Charlie had ever listened to. At the moment, Charlie is listening to the voice of a man named Al. As is well known to one and all, Charlie, I am not one to complain. But it strikes me that Broadway would bring very little tonight on the open market. I know you ten, maybe fifteen years, Al. Until now, I don't know you know there is an open market. Oh, for the past twelve months that I know of, I am 100% legitimate. Honest, legitimate Al. Want another rock candy and rye? Without the rock candy? I uh, very seldom indulge in alcoholic beverages. But in answer to your question, yes. Haven't seen you for a year, Al. Want to run over that part again where you tell me you're playing it straight for the past 12 months? As of last Christmas Eve, I am a 100% honest ticket scalper. I do not make a killing, but I get that good warm feeling that comes with being 100% legit. It feels good to play it straight? Cozy. You want to tell me about it, Al? I do not mind if I do, good time, Charlie. It all begins a year ago tonight right here in your strictly high-class drum. Blondie Swanson was here with me, remember? Yeah, I think I do remember, Al. Now, Blondie Swanson is one of the gentry which operates on that side of the law as very few call right. Though Blondie himself always feels this is a matter of opinion. But Blondie is not concerned with his racket a year ago tonight. You are busy chauffeuring the bar, good time, Charlie, so maybe you do not notice the sad scene. Yep, it is last year, just about this same time, when Blondie comes in here. His big frame pretzels with grief. Hello, Al. Well, hiya, Blundy. I see you are not so happy tonight. Why not join me in a medicinal rock candy and rye? Uh, without the rock candy. I am fighting off a touch of grip. Okay, Al. I got a bad case of memories tonight. If rye can pack away the grip, maybe it can take a load off my memories. Hey, Charlie, two more rock candies and rye's, uh, without the rock candy. I'll slide them down. Are these uh, conversational memories, Blondie, or shall we give them to Clint? You recall a doll named Clarabelle Cobb, Al? Miss Clarabelle Cobb? Of course I do. She is well known to one and all on Broadway as a leading light with George White scandal some years back. Yeah. Well, Christmas Eve is an anniversary for me. It was on Christmas Eve that Clarabelle left me to marry an honest guy in Akron, Ohio. Here you are. Oh, freak up, Blondie. Up to now, I remember Miss Clarabelle Cobb as a doll with Class A judgment. Why did she put distance between her and you? Well, Clarabelle was a gal that didn't care as much about how much money you had as she did where you got it. She felt that my role was ample but tainted. And this is why she puts on the exit? Right. I can see now that she was right, but now it's too late. But there must be other dolls as beautiful and desirable, and not such quiz masters as to where the scratch comes from. I'll never look at another da- ga- doll again, Al. They're there for other guys. Hey, Blondie! Huh? Blondie Swanson! Well, if it ain't the Dutchman! Oh, look, Al! Uh, Al, Blondie, you tides all around. Oh, I cannot believe my eyes, Dutchman. I have not seen you in East Plants for maybe a full calendar or so. I've been detained in the West. Oh, it's a sad story. And I can see that all you two guys need is one more sad story. But you're not going to hear none. I got good news for you. And you have come to the right place, Dutchman. I always get kind of down on Christmas Eve. What I'm going to tell you will give you a big lift. Blondie... You and me have pulled a few fast deals together, but I got one tonight that's the softest touch of all. 
Oh, you can listen, Al. We'll cut you in two. <laughs> I have turned down soft touches before. But not wishing to be rude, I will hear you out. Well, some months back, three other guys and me knocked off a tin safe in a factory over in Pennsylvania. It was a cinch haul on account of we received a dead center tip. The tip was on the level. So we stash 50 G's in our grip sack and get set to hit the open road. Something detained you? The cops. After hot blasting from both sides, I find myself alone on the lamb with 50 G's in the grip sack. But it's not a clean getaway, and I figure it's better to find a hiding place for the dough. Not wanting to be caught with the goods. I am beginning to get the idea. You're suggesting that the three of us go for this dough tonight and cut it three ways. That's the idea. It's in an unpopulated barn, under the floorboards. When I decide to go get it, the first guy I think of is you, Blondie. How about it? I must admit, I got no other plans, Dutchman. Nice of you to think of me. Count me in. How about you, Al? Uh, I am not generally known as a spoil sport, but uh, this prospect frankly holds no appeal for me. I do not wish to join the party. This your final answer? Yes, Dutchman, you may quote me. I will not go with you. Charlie, that's the way it went. I am certain I will not leave your bistro that night. I am negative to the whole scheme, and I'm nixing it loud and clear to one and all. So imagine my surprise at some later point to find myself warm and cozy in the back seat of the Dutchman's ancient philosophy, dogging it through the snow-covered countryside. The whole setting is so peaceful, I am catching small doses of snooze. But in between times, I cannot help but overhear the upfront conversation of Blondie and the Dutchman. You sure this is the right road, Dutchman? Certainly I'm sure. I can fly this road blind if necessary. You are not flying blind now, so you must have noticed that the radiator is percolating again. I think we better stop and take on another load of snow. Uh, I guess we'll have to. But I sure hate these delays. Uh. Hey, Dutchman. Listen. Must be coming from that little church. Yeah, yeah. Come on, help with the snow and the radiator. Sounds real pretty, that kind of singing. You think that's pretty? Well, you hear real music. The kind money makes when it's crisp. Hey, hey, Blondie, Dutchman, where, where are we? In Pennsylvania, Al. Not far from that barn where I stashed the factory payroll. How can you tell? I, for one, see very little but darkness around and about. I got to agree with Al, Dutchman. I got a feeling we're lost. Maybe we better give the whole scheme up. Uh, you two give up easy. I tell you, I know for certain we're close to that barn. I can tell by that big fat star I've been following for the last few miles. Oh, yeah. I am seeing a small light ahead. But I observe if this is a star, it is hanging very low to the ground. Uh, I still got a feeling we are lost. Why don't we go back to good time Charlie's, which is a lot easier to find. I don't care how low this star is hanging. I know it's leading me straight. I'm running this show, so you two better seal up. There, look. I'm right as rain. This is a barn. I do not wish to start an exchange of words. But that star you follow turns out to be nothing more than a light from the window of said barn. Ah, okay. So somebody's living in the barn. I'll take care of them if they're too hard to get along with. Uh, I vote for getting out of here. I am not dressed to call on strangers myself. Come on, and cut the gab. Besides, maybe there's only animals in the barn. I don't see no human footprints in the snow, except ours. I'll be doggone. Look through that window, Blondie. Is that a doll in there? Let me see. Yeah... Yeah, she's a doll. Not only that, I don't think she's feeling in the pink either. Well, now that we are here, let us go inside and see if there's anything we can do for her. I don't care nothing about a sick doll. I want to lay my mitts on that grip sack with a 50 G's in it. Come on. Who, who's that? Who are you? We mean no harm. We... We, well, for, if it ain't Miss Clarabelle Cobb, in person.
friends, to all of you who have opened your homes to the Whistler, not only throughout the year, but even tonight on Christmas Eve, the Signal Oil Company has asked me to express their sincere appreciation for this privilege and pleasure. And we of the cast want to add our thank you, too. During the eight consecutive years that the Whistler has been broadcast by Signal Oil Company, many of us have celebrated Christmas with many of you a number of times. And believe me, we're mighty proud that you consider us part of your entertainment family. Tonight, on behalf of Signal Oil Company and the independent signal dealers who serve you in the states of California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Nevada, Arizona, and Utah, I want to convey warmest season's greetings. May the many blessings of living in these United States of America enrich your holiday season and the new year. That isolated barn in the snow-swept Pennsylvania countryside. So far removed from good time Charlie's Bar, where you're now enjoying Charlie's rock candy and rye without the rock candy. Held a surprising development for you, Blondie Swanson and the Dutchman, didn't it? The three of you had driven there that Christmas Eve a year ago to claim the $50,000 payroll the Dutchman had hidden there. The presence of Miss Clarabelle Cobb in the barn at your arrival was something not even her ex-boyfriend, Blondie Swanson, could fathom immediately. And you were even more puzzled than Blondie, weren't you, Al? Only the Dutchman seemed to have the faintest understanding of what it's all about. So, you turned to the Dutchman. Dutchman, I am not understanding all this. Why do you not inform us? Listen, Al, you and Blondie better clear out of here for a while. Take a walk in the snow. I guess I'll have to take care of this doll. Huh? Uh, look, Dutchman... I haven't seen Clarabel for a long time. If you think I'm going to leave her now and go for a walk with her, you are nuts. Besides which, Dutchman, this doll is clearly at grips with some strange malady. I do not think it is polite the three of us should visit in this manner at this time. Listen, I came here to get 50 G's, not a sick doll, and a lot of lip from you two. This won't take long, so blow. But, Dutchman... I'm getting fed up with you, Blondie. I know what I'm doing. I've delivered seven of the eight kids my wife's had, and I never needed no doctor. This one will be a cinch. Now, will you get out of here? <sighs> I cannot help but say this is quite a night for surprises, Grundy. Yeah. I, for one, can take winter sports or leave them to someone else. Al. Yeah, Blondie. We could take the Dutchman's car there. You think Clarabelle will be better off if we get her a dock? Well, I am new in this racket, Blondie. But if you want an inexperienced opinion, I will say... What was that? What? Cat! Well, Blondie, I am new in this racket. But if you want an inexperienced opinion, I will say... Miss Clarabelle Cobb is a cinch mother. Come on, let's get back to the barn. You wouldn't cry, Clarabelle. No sense crying. Oh, Blondie. I know if all of a sudden I found myself with a brand new kid, I wouldn't be crying. Special since it's such a such a beautiful kid. You, you really think he's beautiful, Blondie? Oh, I sure do. He, he's sleeping, huh? Uh-huh. Bless his heart. <laughs> if he only gets a break. <laughs> oh, don't worry about him, Clarabelle. A, a, a beautiful kid like that, they love him in Akron. Oh, Blondie, there's so much I want to tell you. Yeah, but maybe you ought to straighten out yourself, huh? Not till I tell you, Blondie. You've got to know about everything. Why I'm staying here in Dr. Kelton's barn. About Joe, my husband... He's in such trouble, Blondie. He's in jail. Come on, Al. Let's go find the grip sack. I know right where it is. Hey, look, 
Look, Al, this is more like it. Yeah, it's all there. Fifty thousand bucks. A very likely sight. Oh, this is all that counts. A fat swatch of cash. Especially if it's mine. Come on, let's get Blondie and clean out of this barn. You ain't going anywhere with that dough, Dutchman. You want to play that again, Blondie? Same song. I said you ain't going anywhere with that dough. Now, you tell me what he said, Al. I don't like what I'm hearing. Hmm. Blondie has mouthed the same identical words two times around, Dutchman. And I, for one, get the impression he means it. I do. You didn't tell us the whole story of this dough and how you came by it, Dutchman. Now, listen, Blondie. No, I've been listening. I heard everything you said about this factory payroll job you pulled. And you never did say anything about trussing up the bookkeeper at the factory that night. So what? Not only that, you make it look like it's the inside job and leave the bookkeeper to take the rap. So they got to nail somebody for it. Why are you building such a case for this cluck bookkeeper? This cluck bookkeeper, Joseph Hatcher, happens to be Clara Bell's husband. That's his kid you delivered, Dutchman. No kidding. No kidding. Did, did Miss Clara Bell Cobb tell you all this, Blondie? She told me plenty. This Joseph Hatch has been cooling in the quink ever since. He was doing a special bookkeeping job for his factory. Came here from Akron to do it. He's a right guy, an honest guy. Or can you understand that, Dutchman? Here, Blondie, here's something honest I understand. Hey. Yeah, yeah, a gun. Easy, Dutchman. Shut up, Al. Now, look, Blondie, I've been patient with you. I know you're soft for this, doll, and that's your business. But you're interfering with mine, Blondie, and I don't like that. Now, let's get out of here with the dough and quick. I said, come on, let's get going. Dutchman, please put the iron away. It is not in keeping with the season to pull a heater on, Blondie. In addition to which, the shouting is apt to wake that kid, who is a pretty tired character like his mama. Well, now you're going soft, Al. What's with you two? Listen, Dutchman. Clarabelle's husband don't know she's living in this barn. When she heard they'd sorted him away on a bum rap, she came here to try to help him. And she found out she was going to have a kid, and she looked up a doc here, a guy named Kelton. Clarabelle's got no dough. But Doc Kelton gives her first-rate care all up to now. Even fixes it so she can stay in his barn. It is not great, but it beats living in a snowbank. Uh, stow it, will you? The heater, Dutchman. Hide it, huh? Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. But I'm still running the show, wise guys. And this is what we do. Blondie, here's the grip sack. Take my crate out there and find this Doc Kelton character. Pay him off for what he's already done for the doll. Give him some more for taking care of her and a kid from here on in. Then bring the grip sack back here, and we'll blow. Yeah. Are you bet, Dutchman? And you can tell this doctor a couple of things for me. Tell him to get Clara Bell and the kid to a hospital where they belong. Sure, Dutchman. Sure. And tell him that till now we didn't need no doc. That the Dutchman took care of things perfect. And that Mama and Kid are doing nice. Real nice. For all of you who play Canasta or have been thinking of taking up the game, there's a little Christmas gift for you at your nearest signal service station. It's a 12-page booklet on that exciting new version of Canasta, Hollywood Three-Deck Canasta, which is replacing the old two-deck game practically everywhere it's been tried. In fact, Robert Lee Johnson, the only Pacific Coast member of the National Canasta Laws Commission, says of this game, you'll never know how much fun cards can be until you've played this exciting new three-deck game. It has completely replaced two-deck Canasta with all my friends in Hollywood. And friends, the booklet I mentioned is written by the man who devised this new game. So the rules are both complete and authentic. Right now, in fact, this booklet is being sold by leading department stores in 32 states. But you needn't buy a copy. One is waiting for you free while the supply lasts at any signal service station. It is the hope of your signal dealer that this fun-packed new version of Canasta will add to the card-playing pleasure of your holidays. It was almost midnight on Christmas Eve at Good Time Charlie's Bar on West 49th Street. As Al continued his amazing account of the story of that other Christmas Eve, 
that crossed the lives of Blondie Swanson, Miss Clarabelle Cobb and her newborn son, the Dutchman, and his grip sack containing $50,000. As Al continued talking to Good Time Charlie, a faraway look came into his eyes. So you see, Good Time Charlie... <laughs> It is no more than small wonder that since all this takes place a year ago this very night, me, Blondie, and the Dutchman have settled down to 100% legitimate and depth. Yeah, sure, and why not? A three-way split on almost 50 stolen G's is a cinch beginning to this straight and narrow. <laughs> you are laboring, as they say, under a misapprehension, good time, Charlie. I see now where it is only fair I tell you the rest of this story. Blondie makes the deal with Doc Shelton to get Miss Clarabelle Cobb and her brand new kid out of that barn and into a Class A hospital arrangement, the three of us are once again the Dutchman's hot rod, beating it along the streets of some pint-sized burg in Pennsylvania, thinking to leave this territory for them as wants it. You know, maybe age is catching up with me. I ought to feel great right now. We still got nearly 50,000 clams in that grip sack, and somehow I don't feel great at all. You did bring the grip sack back from Doc Kelton's, Blondie. Yeah, yeah, sure I did, Dutchman. The, the grip sack's in the back seat with Al. Uh, funny. It don't feel good. And it should. Perhaps a touch of rock candy and rye, uh, without the rock candy, would warm your heart, Dutchman. Oh, uh, maybe so. Pass up the bottle. I am willing to do this, but the bottle will be of small comfort, as it is empty. Oh, well, thanks for nothing. Oh, well... Just nudge the motor and we'll blow this burg. Get back to native territory. New York ought to look pretty good. Hey, better slow down, Dutchman. The law is gaining on you. Oh, great. Never saw such a night in my life. That red light back there was no Christmas tree ornament. You should have stopped. Uh, sorry, officer. And you're in a church zone, clearly marked for 20 miles an hour. 40 is too much. Was hurrying home for Christmas, officer. Carrying toys yeah. for the kiddies in this tub, huh? I'll bet. I better have a look around. Uh-huh. Oh, well, what's in this grip sack? Oh, why, uh, nothing, officer. As empty a grip sack as you'll ever run into. Yeah. No need to open it. It's empty. Well... You're right about that, mister. There's nothing there. Yeah. That... Huh? Easy, Dutchman. But you sure? It's empty? Sure, I'm sure. Weren't you? It... Oh, yeah. Sure, sure. Sure, I was sure. I just wanted you to be sure. Yeah. Carry nothing but empties, huh? You guys empty this bottle all by yourselves? Uh, this bottle is once full of medicine, officer. I myself have been more than over touch of the grip. I am now um, in the pink, as the saying goes. Oh, wise guys, huh? Three wise guys. You know, if it weren't practically Christmas, I'd haul you in. Come on, now, get out of our town. Oh, yeah, and Merry Christmas, three wise guys. Uh, yeah, yeah, same to you. Uh, Dutchman, I... You know, Blondie, a while back you accused me of not telling you the whole story of that factory payroll job. Seems to me you forgot to tell me something pretty important, too. What is it about that grip sack being empty of nearly 50 G's that I ought to know? Well, I figured to fill you in, Dutchman. You, you see... See, look, Blondie. Dutchman, it's that same little church. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know something? It's a miracle. I don't know yet what happened to that nearly 50 G's in the grip sack... But if that copper had caught us with that dough, we'd be on our way to the clink right now. An astute observation. Yeah. Well, you see, Dutchman, when I called on Doc Kelton tonight, I left all the dough with him. The whole 50 G's. I told him to give it back where it belongs. I told him enough more that the doc is sure he can spring Clarabelle's husband out of jail. So him and Clarabelle and the new kid can be together. Say this, uh, this Doc Kelton is the right guy. Oh, I'll say he is. Well, he even agreed to give us a head start for the Pennsylvania border before he notifies the law. This is a right guy. Yeah. And we better oblige the doc and ourselves by making a border ahead of the cops. Hey, you know, that copper was right. Three wise guys, he called us. 
If we wasn't pretty wise, we'd have had all that cash on us when he pulled us over to the curb. I think it's a good idea we stay right on being three wise guys. I'm through stretching my luck. From here on in, I'm going to play it straight. And I'm still running the show. So you two wise guys are going straight with me. Okay? Okay. Agreed. Uh, wonder how far it is to the border. They got a lot of funny little birds here in Pennsylvania. What was that one we just left, Blondie? Oh, I saw a signboard back there, Wade. Uh, that bird is known as uh, uh, Bethlehem. Before Christmas, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, three wise guys were strangely touched by the spirit of the season. A spirit born in another Bethlehem nearly 2,000 years ago. And tonight, on the eve of another Christmas, may we hope that this same eternal spirit will someday bring to wise guys throughout the world the understanding that the future of the peoples of Earth rests in... Goodwill toward all men. That whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you, this week it's especially important to drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations, so some avoidable accident doesn't mar the holiday season for you. Remember what I said at the beginning of the program, friends? That you'd find tonight's story unusual and heartwarming? Now, wasn't I right? I'm sure many of you recognized it as one of the late and great Damon Runyon's most famous tales. The radio adaptation was by Kathleen Height. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, John Brown, Marvin Miller, and Jack Moyle. The Whistler was transcribed and directed by George W. Allen with music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny. How's the weather in Palm Springs? A blonde in a bikini just melted past my poolside window. Goodbye now. Oh, don't hang up. Uh, Johnny, this job's just a few miles north of where you are. It'll take maybe a day to clear it up. Yeah, you said that last Christmas, Pat, and I got trapped in a blizzard. This season, I soak in the sun. Happy New Year. John, boy, we have a bonus list in this office. Your name could be on it. Uh, near where I am, huh? <laughs> It's a ghost town named Calico. An old prospector named Kringle is breathing his last up there. I thought old prospectors never died. He wants to change the beneficiary on a $50,000 policy, but a nephew, Ned Kringle, threatens suit if we let him. So you contact our agent, Gene Craig, in Barstow. Who's the new beneficiary? Uh, Carmen Kringle. Carmen? A burrow. A burrow? Yeah. Uh, if I don't hear from you, Johnny, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. 
to the Home Office, Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Carmen Kringle matter. Expense account item one, $1.40. Telegram to Gene Craig and Barstow telling him where and when to meet me. Item two, $50 even to Al Sterner for his charter plane to the ghost town of Calico. The guidebook says there's something about desert country that's good for the soul. And in spite of the air bumps, I got a panoramic view of the great Mojave that took my breath away. The sun-setting rays hit the weird mineral straighters of the Calico Range and turned them into a patchwork of beauty. Night comes quickly in this country, and I turned to well when a Christmas tree cluster of blinking lights appeared under our wings. By way of answer, he put the plane into a glide and set us down on the smooth surface of a dry lake bed. You want me to wait around until your friend shows up? No, no, thanks. Well, there seems to be plenty of company. That's just an old coyote. Don't stand too long or you'll freeze to the spot. Okay. Good luck. Call me when you want to be picked up. I watched Al's plane until it was swallowed by the darkness. Then suddenly I got that feeling in the hair on the back of my neck that I wasn't alone. The moon was up enough to make out shadows, and silhouetted in a circle around me was a strange collection of figures. One of the pack moved toward me, and for a crazy second, I thought I bumped into Santa Claus's reindeer. Then a car without lights came rushing at me. The headlights slammed on, and I got a glimpse of a donkey herd scattering into the night. All right, mister. Walk toward me. Slow, with your hands high. I've learned never to argue with a Winchester 94, so I followed orders. I spotted the weaving headlamps of another car approaching and prayed it was the agent, Gene Craig. Close enough, Sonny. I can pop the rattlers off a sidewinder at 60 yards. So don't you make no sudden move. He was maybe 60 with gray sideburns and a frosty goatee. A marshal's badge was pinned to his leather jacket. All right, now, mister. Marshal, Marshal, that's all right. That's Mr. Dollar. Huh? I was supposed to meet him earlier. I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Dollar. I'm Gene Craig. Huh? I you... couldn't get here until I drove Doc Spangler up to Chris. He's had another setback, Marshal. Yeah, some darn fool let down the rail on his corral, and Chris Kringle's whole herd got loose. He don't give a chuck for most of them, though, except Carmen. Now he's fretting because she's running wild. Almost had him tracked down when this year fella showed up. If you vouch for him, huh, Gene? Well, you are Johnny Dollar, aren't you? Well, a frozen facsimile. Come on, I'll drive you into Calico. You tell Chris that I'll have his Carmen back in the corral before the moon's full. And, uh, Gene. Yeah, my Tell the old sourdough to stay alive, will you? We need him around here. Sorry about mistaking you, Mr. Dollar. Gene Craig, with a J, knew her way around. She was strictly business and filled me in fast on the old prospector with the odd name and his desire to change the beneficiary of his policy. Everybody calls him Chris because every year he loads up his burrows with toys and presents for the miners and their families back in the hills. Uh-huh. The kids really think he is Santa Claus. I'm afraid it won't be a very merry one for them this year. Well, what makes everyone so sure Chris Kringle is giving up the ghost? Dr. Bangler says there's nothing apparently wrong with him. It's more like he's given up. Oh, what's with this Scrooge character, the nephew? Ned Kringle seems all right. It's the man with him, Willie D'Agostino. He does the talking for Ned. You think he was going to inherit the money? Well, maybe he's expecting to. You know, you're making a good case for Carmen. Can a burrow be a beneficiary, Johnny? <laughs> Chris can leave it to a three-masted schooner if he wants, providing a trust is set up. Could the people of Calico be that trust if they promise to take care of Carmen? Yeah, I guess so. Why? That's the way Chris wants it. That way, there'll always be a Christmas in Calico. <laughs> what happens when Carmen goes to donkey heaven? Or is it burrows that never die? There'll always be burrows in Calico, Johnny. And one of them could always be named Carmen. two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Carmen Kringle Matter. Well, here we are, 
Johnny? Calico. Once the richest silver city in the West. It was unbelievable. Like seeing a page from the past. Walter Knott, famed creator of Knott's Berry Farm and Western historian, had bought the old ghost town's battered remnants and restored it to the way it must have appeared in the wild and fevered days of the Silver Lord. I could make out signs nailed to weathered batten boards that told of a flourishing and colorful past. Joe's Saloon, The Last Chance, Hyena House Hotel, Lane's Mercantile, The Calico Prince. High on a hill at the edge of town... People were gathered at the entrance to a cave that was illuminated by hundreds of miners' lamps. Can it get you, huh? Almost like it was planned. They were rehearsing for the Christmas Eve pageant. Maybe you can spend Christmas Eve with us, Johnny. If you don't have other plans. I have a day with a steam-heated swimming pool. What? Come on. Let's meet the old man. Expense account item three, a hundred bucks for a quart of perfume or a mink scarf, anything to wipe the hurt look off of Jean Craig's face. She led me up the steps to the rickety porch of Chris Kringle's wooden shack. A tall figure carrying a black bag stepped toward us out of the shadows. Jeannie, I'm glad to see you. Will you drive me back to town? Why, certainly, Doc. Oh, this is Mr. Dollar. Hi, son. Hi. Chris, is he still all right? I couldn't say. Been sitting out here waiting for you. You haven't seen the patient? The medical man owes a duty and all that, but I'm too old to talk back to a gun. They wouldn't let you in? Tired of it. Well, I'm not a medical man. Well, please be careful, Johnny. I told you, Starbone, stay away and leave the old man to... <laughs> well, if it ain't little genie, the policy fixes. And who are you, mister? Willie D'Agostino. This is Johnny Dollar. He's from the insurance company to see about changing the policy. Who is it, Willie? Who are you talking to? Relax, will you, and let him give us some tourist directions back to Barstow. There'll be no policy changing at this late date, mister. Ned Kringle is very bereaved at the imminence of his uncle's demise. Just family admitted at this sad hour. So mosey along, folks. I'll leave the young man to his grave. <laughs> your foot is in the door, mister. I don't like your foot. And I don't like you. His hand moved to his shoulder holster, but Jean was standing right beside me. It was Doc who suddenly shouldered past Agostino and fled up the stairs that gave him my chance. I kicked the door wide. Threw him off balance. I shoved Jeannie aside and that was a mistake. Because a million Christmas tree lights blazed up in my skull. Then slowly the tree lights faded away and I saw Jeannie fussing over me and looking worried. A young, nice-looking fellow was seated next to a marble top table. D'Agostino leaned against the stone fireplace and dangled his gun, smiling like he had a stacked deck. He's all right, Doc? A nasty cut, but no fracture. I know how to pull my punches, Doc. The old man. How is he? No better, no worse. Just lying up there staring at the ceiling. I want to see Chris. I have a right to, Ned. I'm an old friend. Willie. Wouldn't it be okay if Gene just went no, up? Oh, let him die in peace. He's past care and hose season. Oh, Willie, these people have I a said right. No. I'll get a hero boy on his feet and shove off. Go on. Come on, Johnny. Help me, Doc. How's it gonna feel, Ned? Sharing blood money with a hoodlum. Your uncle paid for that policy with a pick and a shovel. It took a lot of years, a lot of sweat. And he's had your name on that policy ever since you were born. Oh, man, Kringle never saw pay dirt in his life. Ned had given him money to live on, paid the premiums on his policy. Chris was always tapping the kid, claiming he had a new find. He was going to mine a million. Boy, shut up! The old man's dying. Tell him, Ned. Tell him how the old phony was always taking the bars, making like Santa Claus with the money you give him. Willie, haven't you got a... Tell him who owed you the money! I know he's been waiting a long time for this. Me. Willie D'Agostino, that's who... Is that true, Ned? Yeah. I thought my uncle would make a strike someday. I I honestly thought he'd strike it rich. I know he tried. He did strike it rich, Ned. When he dies, every man, woman, and child in this town will mourn him. He'll live in their hearts. What will people remember about you, Mr. D'Agostino? All right, I'll get out. Get out and stay out before I... Really? This rifle will make a hole in your belly big enough to pass a borax steam through. So you just drop that gun. Well, 
I don't know what to shout him about, but you're guilty of carrying sidearms, and you're threatening and violence, Mr. D'Agostino. And ain't nobody does that in Calico, as long as I'm the marshal. Now, you better get. Ed Dollar, I love you. I'm so glad, glad to hear that. <laughs> well, I'll see how Chris is. Uh, Doc, eh. tell the old buzzard that I got his Carmen back in the corral. Jingle bells and all. Yeah, nice work, Ed. Now, what's holding you, mister? Okay. Okay. All right, let's go, Ned. Uh, let the squares have a round, huh? I'm going to stay here, Willie. I want to be here when Chris... Hey, that's a good idea. That way, no fooling around with the will, huh? Smart kid, that Ned. Uh, see you at the funeral, huh? I'll go up now. You were wonderful, Marshal. You too, Johnny. Oh, yeah, sure. I take a nice sock on the head. Say, you folks better come up too. Chris wants to say something. Oh, wait, wait a second. I figured on this. The corral. Come on. Agostino must have had another gun in his car. One of the bullets had found the mark he intended. Willie Boy wasn't taking any chances that Carmen Kringle would inherit $50,000. We found the burro lying on her side, quite dead. Jingle bells and all. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Oh, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the Carmen Kringle matter. Oh, Marshal. Johnny, how could he have been so cruel? Carmen dead. It's just not right. Yeah. I figured Decastino might be mean enough to try killing Chris's pet bull. We can't tell him about it. It would kill him for sure. You'll have to know the truth, Gene. You'll have to decide about the will. Yeah. Truth is always the best. And easy this time. Easy? Huh? Yeah. I'll just take these bells off and miss poor little feller, and I'll put them where they belong. Carmen? What? Carmen? Oh. Mosey over here now. Oh. Well, you pull the switch. You put these bells on another book. Yeah. I didn't trust that greasy character, and I was right. A nice girl, Carmen. Oh, I'll be. Now, now, you folks go on up and see old Chris. I'll keep an eye on this year $50,000 jackass. That's uh, the way it's going to be, ain't it, Johnny? Yes, sir. That's the way it's going to be. But I was wrong. The roly-poly little old man in the four-poster bed with his white whiskers resting on the quilt changed his mind again. Even after hearing about how the marshal saved Carmen. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to scratch Ned's name off of that insurance, Mr. Dollar. I tried to shake that Dagostino, figuring he'd take his hooks off of Ned. If he thought my Carmen was going to get the money. Oh, I was scared for a while that I just might have to up and die to square my nephew's gambling debts. I, uh, I'm sorry, Chris. I'll work my fingers raw paying every cent I owe, but I'll pay him back with interest. I want you around. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, Chris. Hey, lift the lid on that footlocker and fetch me one of them bags in there. They're, they're pretty heavy, but you look strong. Well, they're <laughs> sure heavy enough. You got them stuffed with silver? <laughs> it's better than silver. Open it up. Open it up. There. Yeah, that's it, that's it. Yes, I recognize that. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you'd better have a good sleep, Chris. This here's plain old gravel. Oh, plain yes, gravel. It's uranium, Doc. Huh? The last batch assayed at $900 a ton. Well, and I got a mountain of it staked out. In both our names, Ned. You don't care. Why, Chris? Uh, Mr. Dollar, if you and Jeannie check with the Barstow Bank... You'll find that they'll extend credit on the strength of that assay. <laughs> uh, you reckon you can spend two days buying enough presents so as we won't disappoint the folks hereabouts? Expect 
Expense account item four, $68 even. Telephone calls to five principal cities where I thought Willie D'Agostino might be remembered. The police departments had a long list of reasons why they remembered Willie. That was my Christmas present to them. Expense account item five, another 50. Truck rental to haul the presents we bought for Ned to give away come Christmas morning. And then it was Christmas Eve. We sat on the Kringle's porch and watched the procession up to the Maggie Mine. The flickering lights from the miners' lamps reflecting on the faces of the happy children. Old Chris was bundled up in blankets, his little eyes twinkling, chuckling to himself like he knew all the answers of the universe. Jean was there, too. Kind of nice, isn't it, Johnny? Kind of nice. Marshal Ed Noller was one of the wise men in the procession. I recognized the sideburns. And Doc Spangler couldn't hide his height. Oh, he wore an awful beard. Ned Kringle led the burro that carried the Blessed Mother. Yeah, you guessed it. The burro was Carmen Kringle. Expense account total, including return to Palm Springs and incidentals, $229.75. But forget it, Pat. This is the best holiday I ever had. And I was only cold at the start. From all of us to all of you, may this be your very merriest Christmas ever. Yours truly, Johnny Duff. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Who that? George Reed. Well, Merry Christmas, George. Is it? Oh, what's the matter? You ever hear of Jediah Gillis? Uh, eccentric? Owns about half of Rhode Island? That's the boy. A couple of weeks ago, he wrote a special policy on an item he wanted insured. And it's up and disappeared, huh? How'd you know? Oh, just a wild guess. What did he lose? I hope you're sitting down, Johnny. Yeah? Why? Because the insured item is a mouse. House? Mouse. What? Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of a man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, American Branch Office, 443 North 15th Street, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the missing mouse matter. Expense account item one, 85 cents. Taxi from my apartment to George Reed's office. He was on his feet waiting for me. His Ivy League suit looked as though it had been slept in and he needed to shave. Close the door, Johnny. Yeah, sure. Johnny, I'm well level with you. This thing has me going. Well, it serves you right. Anybody who'd insure a mouse deserves what he gets. Yeah, but it isn't an ordinary mouse, Johnny. No. Not according to Mr. Gillis's original application. Yeah, take a look. Uh, item to be insured. One unusually talented grayish-brown mouse. Unusually talented? Like how? I don't know. What? I tried to find out, but Gillis wouldn't tell me. And still you issued the policy. Well, you know our company, Johnny. We have a reputation for insuring almost anything, but we have to draw the line occasionally, and we would have here, except for one thing. What's that? And believe me, it better be good. It is. Gillis carries all of his insurance with us. Yeah, but even so. Just one of his several policies is a straight life for 350000 Wow, Wow, hey. king-size premiums, huh? Exactly. So when he called asking us to insure this fellow's mouse for a few weeks... Well, wait a minute. Gillis doesn't own it? No. Well, who does? It belongs to a friend of his, a man named Glazer. He's spending the holidays with Gillis. Gillis didn't want to be responsible if something happened to Glazer's mouse while he's there, so he asked us to write the policy. How much did you insure it for? All the company would allow, 5000 
Oh, now, George, you think I want to get all worked up over a lousy five grand loss? What kind of a commission can I possibly make on that? Look, give me a chance to finish, will you? All right, but only because it's Christmas. All right. Late last night, I received a call from Gillis. He wanted to know whom we considered the best investigator in this part of the country. When I told him, he told me about the mouse and insisted I send you up to help look for it. No, no, George, I'm sorry, but I'm going to pass. I've handled some screwy cases in my time, but this is... Please, wait till I finish, will you? I told Gillis you wouldn't be interested. That's when he started putting on the squeeze. Squeeze? How do you mean? He said if I didn't get you, he'd cancel his policy. Oh, come on. You don't believe that, do you? I don't know what to believe. Gillis is a screwball of the first water. We've known that for a long time, and frankly, I'd rather not take a chance. Well, you've got to. Maybe not. Hmm? I've received an okay from upstairs. On this one, you can write your own ticket. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? You didn't give me a chance. Look, there's a train for Providence at 3.30. Here's Gillis' address. He wants you to stay with him. That'll cost more, Georgie. It figures. Merry Christmas, Johnny. Same to you, Santa Claus. <laughs> Expense account item 285 cents. Cab fare. Back to my apartment. I was intrigued by what George had told me and by what his company was going to add to my bank account. So I didn't really mind changing my plans for the holidays. Expense account item three eighteen dollars and ninety cents. Transportation, including a round trip ticket, Hartford to Providence, and cab fare out to the Gillis residence. Palace would be a better word for it. It stood in the middle of a large wooded park. It must have been half a dozen acres. All of it surrounded by an old fashioned iron fence. I dismissed the cab and had started toward the front door when it opened. And standing against the light, watching me, was a tall, beautiful girl. Careful the steps. Why? The steps. They're icy. Oh. Oh. Thanks. We've been expecting you, Mr. Dollar. Hi. Well, hi. Mr. Glazer and Father are in the library. Would you like to meet them now or wait till after you're settled? No, I'm I'm afraid I'd better see them right away, Miss Gillis. Marion. Johnny. Well, come along. You know, for the first time, I'm glad I came home for the holidays. Home from where? New York. Here we are. You'll have to come visit me, Johnny. Maybe I'll do something drastic, like losing a mouse to guarantee it. Marion, I told you to keep that door closed. Oh, Mr. Doll is here, Father. Oh, oh, well, have him come in. <laughs> yes, by all means, have him come in. Yeah. See you later, Johnny. Yeah. Well, Dollar, glad you finally got here. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, this is my friend and associate, Bert Glazer. Mr. Glazer? Uh, Bertie and his pals, Mr. Dollar. Beg pardon? My dog act. You investigators are supposed to have good memories. I hoped you might have caught us at some time. Probably not. Oh, would you like to have a drink, Mr. Dollar? Uh, no, thanks. Now, suppose I got get... anything you want to drink. I got an eggnog, hot buttered rum. Well, uh, maybe later. Right now, I'd like to hear the details of your loss. You mean that insurance agent didn't give you all the information? He didn't know it all, Mr. Gillis. All he did know was that a so-called talented mouse so-called. has disappeared. So-called. And he hasn't disappeared either. Not at all. He's been kidnapped, that's what. Kidnapped, yes, sir, and we know who did it, too. And why, we know why, too. And it's your job to get him back, Dollar. Oh, now, wait a minute. And I'm not going to pay one red cent for ransom. Not one cent. Not one cent. Okay, okay. But what makes you so sure the mouse was kidnapped? Kidnapped. I can tell you that without Bert's permission. Well, Mr. Glazer... Well, if we tell you, we must have your solemn promise you won't repeat it to anybody uh, until Christmas Day. Well, I... I'm not sure I can do that. If you can't, we don't open our mouths. Right. Well? Okay. Till Christmas Day. Good, good. Uh, Dollar, suppose I told you Gulliver was worth at least $50,000. Gulliver? The missing mouse. Oh. You'd be surprised if I said he was worth that much? Depends. You claim he's talented. Does that have something to do with this uh, valuation you put on him? Something. Something. It has everything to do with it. Yes, sir. Well, what does Gulliver do that other mice can't? Nothing. But it's how he does it that counts. How he does what? Sings. What? Can't you hear the man, Miss Della? Can't you hear him? Gulliver sings. He carries a tune. You know. With the clarity of a clarion, the fervor of a female opera star, and the tone of a tenor. It, that's how we plan to bill him. I, um... <clears throat> I see, um... Well, uh... But he doesn't believe us. 
Oh, now, wait. I, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> There's no need to. We can tell by your face. Can't we, Bert? But a mouse. Mr. Dollar, it is a scientific fact that mice sing. Mice sing. Well-known magazines have published articles proving it. Unfortunately, most of them sing in a scale too high for human hearing. Ah, uh, but not Gulliver. But not Gulliver. Yeah, that's right. He's a basso. A basso. Uh, by mousy standards, that is. Oh, no. <laughs> no, Bert, he still doesn't believe us. Very well, Jediah, there is only one thing to do. There's only one thing to do. You follow us, Dollar. We'll erase the doubt in your mind forever. I took a good look at Bert Blazer, then reluctantly followed the two of them out of the library and down a long hall. At the moment, this thing had all the earmarks of a good old-fashioned con game. Or better still, a benefit on behalf of Bert Glazer with Jodiah Gillis and Floyds of England as the sole cash contributors. We wandered for what seemed like blocks through the old mansion and finally reached a large playroom. On top of one of the billiard tables was a small brass cage. In it were two small grayish-brown mice. Blazer opened the cage and let them out. Mr. Dollar, allow me to present Hecuba and Esmeralda. Oh, how do you do? I mean, uh, I suppose they sing too. Oh, they certainly do. But not nearly as well as Gulliver. Just don't have the instrument, you know. Instrument? The voice, the voice, Dollar, the voice, the vocal cords. Oh, oh, yeah, I I see. But, uh, now, uh, where did you keep Gulliver? Uh, In here with the others. Bert didn't want to separate them. Uh, that's right. I originally started to make the three of them into a singing, uh, you know, trio, like the Andrews sisters. But Gulliver advanced so rapidly, I decided he should be a soloist. Oh, sure. You aren't afraid of mice, Mr. Danner? No. No, well, that's fine. Mice sensitive, you are, you know. It upsets them. It upsets them. It, all right, now, Hecuba, move over a bit. Give Esmeralda some room. That's it. Now, up on your haunches. Up, 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 Esmeralda. There we are. <laughs> now, what would you like to hear, Mr. Dollar? Oh, anything at all. <laughs> oh, Bert, how about my favorite? Uh, over the way. Good, good, good. Yeah, da, 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 da. Hey, you got it, Esmeralda? Over the waves. That's it, heck you All ready, then? Hmm. Good, that'll be fine. Ready now? One, two, three. One, two, three. Oh, that's it. Oh, beautiful, Esmeralda. Beautiful. Well, I won't say I was convinced. But I won't say I wasn't. But I will say those mice were singing something. Or giving a mighty good imitation of it. We returned to the library, and this time I sampled the eggnog liberally. <laughs> Is that all right, Dollar? Oh. <sighs> oh, fine. Thanks. Well, Dollar, you know now why we believe Gulliver was kidnapped? Well, I'm not sure. To exploit him. What else? Exactly. You have any idea who did it? Harry McQueen, that's who. McQueen. Who is McQueen? Used to be my agent. Theatrical agent? Uh-huh. He's been snooping around here lately, Johnny. We figure he's gotten wind of our mice. Well, what do you mean by snooping around, Mr. Gillis? No, you know, he's been out here twice this week wanting to see me. Had to kick him out of here yesterday morning. How'd he get in? Well, my daughter answered the door. Uh, yes, I uh, did. She didn't know McQueen from Adam. So when he asked for me, she figured he belonged in here, rehearsing the show with the rest of us. Rehearsing what show, Mr. Gillis? What show? What? The show for the children's hospital. <laughs> Jodiah puts one on for the sick kids every Christmas Eve. Of course. You know, Dollar, Variety Acts of Santa Claus. Uh, this year, though, we got a radio hookup. Uh, go all over the state. And Gulliver, well, he was going to headline. And that's why I sent for you, Dollar. I figured you can get him back by tomorrow afternoon if anybody can. How long was McQueen in here before you noticed him? Long enough to lift Gulliver. This was our dress rehearsal, Dollar. We'd asked some of the kids from around the neighborhood in to watch, so it was pretty crowded. Where were the mice during the rehearsal? Well, that's where I made my mistake. What do you mean? We were keeping them a secret till the real show. Oh, where were they? In their cage, over there on the mantel. Now, we were using this part of the room for the stage, so McQueen could have just reached in and taken Gulliver without us seeing him. Now, what makes you so sure McQueen did it? We told you. Besides, who else would want him? Uh, who else? And it was right after I kicked him out of here that I discovered Gulliver was missing. What'd you do then? Why, well, I called off the rehearsal and started searching for him. McQueen? Big Gulliver. And I put in a telephone call to the Providence House where McQueen was staying. Did you talk to him? Nope. They said he checked out. After questioning them for a while, I finally had a nightcap with Jediah and then went to the phone in the hall and made some calls. Including one to George Reed. Well, how's it going, Johnny? It's not. That's why I'm calling. Look, 
They think a theatrical agent named Harry McQueen stole the mouse. He has offices in Boston and New York. Now, I've placed a person-to-person call to both offices, but with tomorrow Christmas Eve, he might not get the message. So, well, what do you want me to do? Find out his home number. Ask him to call me here. Okay. Anything else? Hello? Johnny? Johnny, you there? Yeah. And so is a cat. What? A big yellow cat. What's so unusual about that? Oh, nothing. Except he's got a grayish-brown mouse between his two front paws. Act two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. You can't buy happiness by the pound or the yard, but you can have it by the hour with no strings attached every Monday through Friday evening and each Saturday in the daytime when the Robert Q. Lewis Show is on the air. Join him and his fun-loving gang five nights a week and Saturdays in the daytime on most of these same stations. Now, act two of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Missing Mouse Matter. <laughs> I was standing in the hall of Jediah Gillis's home looking at a big yellow cat that had a mouse between its two front paws. As far as I was concerned, a mouse is a mouse, and this one could be Gulliver. I cut short my phone conversation with George Reed, then started toward the cat. Here, kitty. Here, kitty, kitty. Nice, kitty. Pretty kitty. Mama, Here, kitty. Mama, where are you? Here, kitty, kitty. That's a good kitty. Ah, kitty, let me have the little mouse. Mama, you naughty cat. Where? Oh, This cannibal belonged to you, Marion? Yes, I promised Father I'd... What do you mean, cannibal? Take a look. Oh, no. Oh, yes. And he's very, very dead. Oh. You don't think it's Gulliver, do you? Well, Mr. Glazer will have to identify him. And if he is... Well, that's that. Oh, no. No, Johnny. What do you mean? Oh, Johnny, please. You don't have to tell him, do you? Well, sure. If it's Gulliver, this thing's cleared up. If it's not, your Rama gets a reward for being a good mouser. Oh, Johnny, please. Dad almost had a fit when I arrived here with Rama. He made me promise to keep him in my room. This the only time he's been out? Well, no. Oh. He was out for a little while yesterday while they were rehearsing. I didn't notice he was gone till after lunch. Then the corpse could be Gulliver's. Oh, Johnny, if it is, there's nothing we can do about it now. And if you tell my father besides making him angry, it'll break his heart. All right. I won't say anything until tomorrow night. Oh, thanks, Johnny. Christmas Eve morning came cold, crisp, and clear. The Gillis grounds were covered with new-fallen snow, and the trees were heavy with icicles, giving the whole place the look of a winter wonderland. I dressed and went down to join Gillis and Bert Glazer at breakfast. I was on my third strawberry when the phone started to ring. Yeah. You expecting a cold, Alan? Hmm. Yeah, matter of fact, I am. Uh, and you'd better answer it. If it's somebody at the broadcast station for me, tell them I'll be at the children's hospital at noon. They can call me there. Right. I at Gillis's place? Yeah, that's right. What do you know about it? <laughs> well, I've done a lot of pilfering in my time. I've taken towels from hotels from Maine to Miami and Seattle to Bridgeport. But I never had to stoop so low as to steal a mouse from any hotel, garbage dump, trap, or field. Do I make myself clear? Perfectly. Except for one thing. Yeah? This particular mouse was a performer. Was a what? He was trained, did tricks. Still doesn't interest me. Well, then why were you trying to see Mr. Gillis? To get some of my people on his Christmas show. Anything wrong with that? No. That would be a lot of publicity about it. Would have done him a lot of good. And you're sure you weren't interested in the mouse? Look, Dollar, when I went into this business 18 years ago, I swore then I'd never handle kids, belly dances, or animal acts. What you handle Bert Glazer's dog act. His what? Dog act. Bertie and his pal. Oh, somebody's feeding you a line, Dollar. That act was Bill Bertie and his pal. And the pal is a dummy. Glazer's a top-notch ventriloquist. He's a master. You hear me, Dollar? Yeah, Harry. I hear you fine. I had to do some thinking, so I put on my coat and went outside for a walk around that wooded park. What I had just learned about Glazer confirmed what my instinct, my common sense, had been telling me all along. Except for one thing. The performance given by Hecuba and Esmeralda the night before. If Glazer had been doing the singing for those two mice, he was a master ventriloquist. Which was exactly what Harry McQueen said he was. 
I'd started back toward the house, wondering if I should get Jediah aside now and tell him or wait until after the show when something soft and cold hit me on the back of the head. Hey! <laughs> Sorry, Johnny, I couldn't oh. resist such a serious target. Anything new? Uh, well, if you mean have I found Gulliver, the singing mouse, no. Dad told me to tell you, if Gulliver does turn up before 1.15, rush him off to the hospital. Yeah, sure. But I think that's extremely unlikely. You think Rama got him, don't you? If he did, he got a very ordinary mouse. He didn't get one that sings. I'm afraid I lost you. Doesn't matter. Oh, now, I wonder what he wants. Hmm. That boy on the porch. Oh, well, if this was Hartford, I'd say he was the paper boy coming around to collect. Well, it's not Hartford, and he's not a paper boy because Dad doesn't subscribe to anything but fortune. Oh, well, then he's selling something. Well, if he is, he's not going to give us a chance to buy any. Johnny, looks looks like we scared him off. Oh, that's fine. Hey! Hey, come back! He sure tore out of here when he saw us. I wonder what he wanted. Do you suppose he was one of the kids they invited in to see the dress rehearsal? Well, if he was, what would he be doing back here today? I don't know. Let's take a look around. We found it in the playroom, near where Gulliver's cage had been. It was a roundish metal clamp, the kind of boy wraps around his trouser leg when he's riding a bike. I was about to call the hospital and ask Judiah for a list of all the kids they'd invited to the rehearsal when the front doorbell rang. Johnny, it's that boy again. Better let me get in. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was over here to see the show the other day. Oh? Yeah. You see it? No, I, uh, I wasn't here then. Oh. Jeez. Sure is calling. Yeah, sure is. Oh, why don't you come in and get warm? Oh, no, that's okay. No, come on, come on. Nobody's here. No? Well, okay. Yeah, sure, come on. I don't want to bother nobody, you know. I was just riding by and I thought I'd stop and tell old man Yellis what a swell show they put on. You really liked it, huh? Yeah. All except for that Santa Claus. Oh? What was wrong with him? Nothing. Just that, well... Googlies and all that smushy kid stuff. Hmm? Kids, I guess. How old are you, uh... Bobby. Uh, Bobby me. How old are you, Bobby? Almost 11. Well, being that old, I can understand why you weren't impressed with the Santa Claus. All that other stuff, too. You know, like giving presents and singing those hymns and junk like that. You gotta cut it out when you, when you start growing up. You sure do, boy. Yeah. You know, you and my mom, you, you get along just fine. Oh? Yeah. She feels about Christmas. She feels about Christmas just like you and me do. All right. Yeah. Boy, this, this log fire sure makes your eyes smart, don't it? Yeah, it sure does. Where do you live, Bobby? Cross town, Scully Avenue. Well, how'd you happen to be over here the other day? Well, I, I was riding my bike when I, when I saw this dog. What well, he was a, anyhow, when I, when I tried to catch him, he ran from me. I followed the silly muck clear over here. Uh -huh. Did you ever catch him? No. I was about to when this man hollered and asked me if I wanted to see a free show. So I, I came in. I see. Well, you, you must like dogs a lot, huh? Sure. You got one? Used to have one. When my pop was with us, but we can't have no pets where we're living now. Oh, that's rough. Yeah. You know that poem? Which one? You know, about all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not, not even a mouse. Yeah? Well, that fits our place. Especially now. How do you mean? Well, I didn't think he'd miss it, you know. Man with a house as big as this one and also when I saw this cute little fellow up in that cake. Well, I, I didn't really mean to take him on hold, but me, but when he got under my sweat and was real quiet and like he liked me. Well you know what I mean. Yeah, Bobby. I know. But I got to thinking decided to bring him back. 
soldier, give me the old man. Is you must be jealous for me, please. No. I think you'd better do that yourself. Oh, no, no, please. He might be awful mad at me by now. No, Bobby. In fact, you're going to get a reward. Yeah? <laughs> Word of honor. Now, what do you say we go down where Mr. Gillis is putting on that Christmas show and see it? Okay? Oh, sure. Bobby. Yeah? Did you notice anything unusual about this mouse? Yeah, I sure did. What was it? He got some white on his right hind foot. Expense account item four, one dollar and sixty cents. Cab fare from the Gillis residence to the children's hospital for Mary and Bobby and myself. Inside, we followed the sound of children laughing and reached the auditorium. Marion found a seat among the nurses, and I took Bobby backstage. When Jediah saw Gulliver, his face lit up like, well, like one of the trees he'd had delivered to the wall. Oh, ah, Gulliver! By golly, by golly! I knew if anybody could do it, you could, Dollar. I didn't do a thing, Mr. Gillis. All the credit goes to Bobby. Oh, to Bobby Whale. I'll speak to you after the show, young man. Yes, sir. <laughs> Bert, Bert, look, look, he's back. Oh, 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 Gulliver, oh, I do declare I have never been so glad to see a person before. Yeah, you better hurry, Bert. He's scheduled to go on in just a minute. Oh, he will, he will. Now, I'll go check on the microphone when everything be just so. <laughs> don't go away, Dollar. No, he won't. Bobby, why don't you sit over there where you can see the stage? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, Bert, you think Gulliver will sing today? I think? I know he will. Oh, get ready, Bobby. But that boy had Gulliver all day and all night, and he didn't sing once. <laughs> Did the boy ask him to? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, for the first time in the world, one of the wonders of the world, Gulliver the Sea Mouse. Hey, Mr. Dollar, can that mouse be his thing? That is what we're going to find out, Bobby. Uh, exciting, isn't it, Dollar? Sure is, Mr. Gillis. What, that Gulliver? <laughs> oh, I, I see. Uh-huh. Uh, he's going to sing Jingle Bells, but he wants me to get off stage so everybody will know it's really him doing it and not me. Uh, thank you. <laughs> is he all right, Bert? Oh, time, time, just feeling his out. Well, why doesn't he start? He's going to listen. <laughs> well, darling. Now I have seen everything. You She. Bert Glazer had a logical answer for having lied about his old vaudeville act. He knew I wouldn't believe the mice could really sing if I'd known he was a ventriloquist. And you know, well, after all, yet sometimes... Ah... Expense account total, including camp fare, Hartford Station, to my apartment, $38.20. As for my separate and additional fee, as agreed upon before I took this matter, well, there's a boy named Bobby Neves who lives on Scully Avenue over in Providence. See that he gets it, huh? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will tell you about next week's story in just a moment. Meantime... Yeah, I'll make a deal with you. Oh? Let me have the mic for a second, then you can tell them about next week's story. By all means, be my guest. I do. I just don't want to pass up a chance to do two things. First, well, Pam and Eric and Fran, Mr. and Mrs. Froelich, Helen, Will, Scotty, oh, all the rest of you nice people who've written in to tell us how much you like the program. Thanks. I really appreciate hearing from you, and believe me, I'll answer your letters just as quickly as I can. Second, well, I'm sure you know what this is, and I want you to know it comes from the heart. Merry Christmas to you. God bless you. Now, next week... Next week, the case of a prize fighter who could win only by losing, because his life depended on it. Right. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is written by Charles B. Smith and produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. 
Heard in our cast were Mary Jane Croft, Howard McNear, Harley Bear, G. Stanley Jones, Bill James, Lawrence Dobkin, and Richard Beals. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dan Coverley speaking. It was a week before Christmas, and all through the house, a creature was stirring. And boy, what a rat. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar, starring Charles Russell. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Industrial Insurers Incorporated, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Mr. Eben Stevens, General Manager. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of small-time swindles of big-time department stores. Uh, Or how I played Santa Claus and almost got left holding a sack. Or going for a sleigh ride without benefit of snow can be tough sledding. Expense account, item one. One dollar. Tip to messenger who delivered this assignment writing by hand to my apartment. Thanks, Mr. Dollar. You have never been known as a fast man with a buck, Mr. Stevens, and I must say your note to me also marked you in my mind as an economist with words. Dear Dollar, our client, the Association of Department Stores of Greater Manhattan, has requested help on the following problem. A young man has been making the rounds of New York department stores during the current Christmas rush. Using his equipment and official-looking sales book, he goes to a business department, makes a quick sale on some large item, writes it up in his furious sales book, takes the customer's cash, and disappears. Enclosed find varying descriptions as furnished by victims to date, and uh, check for your usual retainer fee. Please put a stop to this nefarious practice at once. Signed, Eben Stevens, General Manager. Expense account, item two, $6.21. Train fair, Hartford to New York. Next morning at 7.03 on the Banker's Special. A train uh, very cleverly named that because 75% of its load is made up of bankers. I sat among them in a parlor car, watching them limbering up for the day's chores, slowly shaking their heads from side to side and softly whispering, No. We arrived at Grand Central at 9.20. The bankers got off and headed for their granite vaults. I got off and headed to face my stone wall. Expense account, item three. Four bits, cab pair to offices of the Association of Department Stores of Greater Manhattan. There, things got brighter right away. Her name was Judy Whitehall. Boy, how she'd been missed by the scouts for the Copacabana, I'll never know. I have been assigned to help you all I can, Mr. Dollar. What would you like to know first? Your home phone number. Oh, well, maybe we'd better wait until later for that. Uh, how many stores are there in your association, Miss Whitehall? We have 120 member stores, Mr. Dollar. Mm, great. You know, in one department store, I'm the kind of a guy that can't find a glove department. And now I've got 120 stores in which to find someone I don't even know. Well, we do have the man's description. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we have a lot of descriptions, all slightly different. And the regular store detectives are all on the lookout. Mm, it's like looking for a noodle and a spaghetti stack. And all the sales personnel have been warned. Mm, it's beautiful. What's beautiful? Your face. Well, really, Mr. Dollar. Hmm? After all. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, I know. Business. Well, before I start, maybe you'd better give me a letter of, ident- of identification. If I spent all day moseying around department stores without buying anything, I can stand a good chance of getting picked up as a shoplifter. Well, right away. Follow me. All right. Oh, just a minute. Hello, this is Miss Whitehall. Oh, yes, Mr. Sander. Oh, my, that's terrible. My goodness, that's awful. Good gracious, that's, that's worse. Well, well, the insurance investigator is here right now, Mr. Sanders. We'll, we'll be right over. 
What's so terrible? Well, that man, the one we're looking for, he was in the Miller store making a phony sale in the camera department. Oh, you also said it was awful. It was. A little girl picked up a camera and snapped his picture, and the man tried to take it away from her, and the girl yelled, and then her mother screamed. And what made it worse? Well, a store detective came running, and the man shot him. Then he grabbed the little girl, camera and all, and ran off. They called the police. Really? I can't imagine why. <laughs> The mob scene in the Miller store would have made the Notre Dame backfield hotter uncle. Christmas neckties were selling like hotcakes. Only compared to most of the ties, a hotcake would look better on you. The camera department was on the mezzanine, and the store manager, Mr. Sander, was on a rampage. Why doesn't somebody do something? Why can't they find him? I've got men posted on every door. He's in this store somewhere, and... Oh, Miss Whitehall, it's about time. Uh, who's this? Oh, this is Mr. Dollar, Mr. Sandler, from the insurance company. Well, I tell you what you can do, Dollar. I've already got 20 policemen running all over the store. It's absolutely ridiculous, preposterous, and fantastic. That's what it is. Also amazing. Now, tell me, Mr. Sandler, about that little girl who picked up the camera and snapped the culprit's picture. Did they find her yet? Uh, they certainly did, in the rug department. She'd been shoved in the middle of a pile of 9 by 12 Orientals on sale at 123 50 She was scared, but not hurt. Now, the girl was found without the camera, I suppose. Oh, naturally, but the camera wouldn't do us any, any good. After all, I'm sure the camera didn't have any film in it. They never do when on display. Well, how about the store detective, the one who got shot? In the hospital, Miss Hall. They'll call me here as soon as they find out how badly he's been hurt. Well, look, getting back to that kid, was she able to give you a good description of the guy who grabbed her? She hasn't stopped crying long enough. Well, how about her mother? Neither is she. Well, where are they now? They're in my office. That's why I'm staying right here. Where is your office? On the eighth floor, right next to the credit office. Well, this may be the first time I ever got past the credit office. Come on, Judy. Oh, Bobby, come on. Blow your nose. There. Now, be a brave little girl. Let me have another try, Mrs. Jenkins. Uh, all right, Mr. Dollar, if you think it'll do any good. All right. Uh, oh, come on now, Bobby. All you have to do is tell us what that bad man looked like. We'll get him, and then we'll fix him. Come on now. Huh? I don't want to. He'll kill me. I'm beginning to think he's got a point. Okay, Bobby. Okay, okay. Just a minute now. Oh, Judy. Here. Yes, Johnny? Looks like as a child psychologist, I'm nothing. At this point, I feel like telling little Bobby to go out and play with some old razor blades. Got any suggestions? Well, uh, it is almost Christmas. Yeah. And one thing little girls don't want to do at Christmas is get in wrong with Santa Claus. Ah, gotcha. Good gal. Uh, Where do we find Santa Claus? In the toy department on, on the fifth floor. Well, give me about five minutes to explain things to Santa and then bring Bobby down. All right. Oh, Bobby. <laughs> what? Do you know what happens to little girls who make Santa Claus mad at them? Yes. What happens? They don't get to look at television before they go to bed. I mean, at Christmas, what happens? They don't get any toys. All they get is old sweaters and underwear. Well, listen, Bobby. This guy Santa happens to be a good friend of mine. What do you think of that? Tell him I want an air rifle. You would. Okay, okay. I'll even fix it so you can tell him yourself. How's that? Just fine. Ah, good girl. Hey, where'd you get that blood on your coat? You got a cut? No, sir. That's from that bad man. I bit him on the hand. <laughs> hmm. Okay, Judy. Here I go. Oh, and uh, on the way down, maybe you better stop by the dog supply department and buy little Bobby a muzzle. If the kid doesn't like his looks, old St. Nick may get hicked. <laughs> Department stores should have some kind of a congressional medal for salespeople who work in the toy department just before Christmas. I took the elevator down to five, and when that door slid open... It was like stepping into Dottie's Inferno, junior grade. First, I got on the house phone and called Santa, who was still in the camera department. He had word from the hospital. The store detective had died without regaining consciousness. 
I was no longer trying to catch a cheap swindler. I was now out to swap blood with a dirty murderer. A line of fidgety kids led me to Santa Claus, sitting benignly on his throne. I had a short talk with him and a short wait for Judy and little Bobby. Okay, Santa. Now, we've got to make her talk. That, that is, you've got to. All right, Dollar. All right now, kiddies. You'll have to wait for a moment. We have a special little visitor coming to see me. Hello, Johnny. All set? Yeah, all set. Okay, Bobby, my girl. Now, just let me give you a hoist up into Santa's lap. He wants to ask you a few questions. I want an air rifle. Now, you'll be a good little girl and answer all Santa's nice questions, and you'll get it. But not where I'd like to give it to you. Up you go. Uh, yes, yes, well, there we are, honey. Now, tell me, what do you want for Christmas? I want an air rifle. Well, we'll see what we can do about that. Tell me, have you been a good little girl? Yes, sir. Hmm. Well, first we'll just have to look up your name in my little black book and make sure. Hmm, pretty good. All but one little thing. What I do? I didn't do nothing. Well, that's just it. You you see, Bobby, I have a note here that today some people asked you what a certain man looked like and you wouldn't tell them. Is that right? I'm afraid. I don't want to tell. They can't make me. Mm -hmm. Well, Bobby, maybe you and I had better talk this over. If you won't do something for us, now, how do you expect it to happen? Little Bobby's description of the murderer wasn't the greatest by any means, but it was better than none at all, with which we had been furnished by the personnel in the camera department and the kid's mother. We took the girl to the advertising department, where an artist made a sketch. Armed with a drawing, we made a tour of the store exits, showing it to the police posted on every door, giving them a rough idea what to look for. A medium build, pudgy man with black hair. And when they came across such a character, he was to be issued an invitation to show his hands. If he was sporting Bobby's teeth marks, then they'd really know. Well, this chore out of the way, Miss Whitehall and I sink our teeth in a pair of sandwiches in the tea room. The Shopper's Delight Sandwich, to be exact. Cream cheese, walnuts, watercress, and pineapple on whole wheat bread. Mmm. We found the store manager, Sandler, back in his office. He, too, was eating, but he was on a diet of straight fingernails. Oh, terrible, terrible, terrible. That's what it is. Now, don't worry, Mr. Sandler. He'll be caught. As a swindler, he might have gone on for years. But as a murderer, it won't be long, believe me. Oh, what to do, what to do, what to do? Well, I've got several ideas. And the first is to get out of your office and start at the top of the store and work my way down. They're already doing that, and not a sign of him. Well, I once found a mouse in a hayloft, so be not discouraged. And a pretty little mouse she was. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, please, try to relax, Mr. Sandler. Everybody's doing your best. Yes, I'm sure they are. It's just that I... Oh. Hello? Yes, this is Mr. Sandler. Oh, no. Where? How long has he been there? Hello? I'll be right down. What's the matter now? About an hour and a half ago, our store, Santa Claus, kept out in the employee's restroom for a smoke. He was slugged from behind. When he came to, he was all tied up in a broom closet, and somebody has stolen his Santa Claus suit. They just found him. About an hour and a half ago. Judy, you know what that means? Oh, no. Oh, yes. Forty-five minutes ago, when little Bobby was giving Santa Claus the murderer's description, he was giving it to the murderer himself. Oh, good gracious. Instead of a kid's air rifle, it could have gotten us a revolver, size 38. <laughs> In just a moment, we will return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, CBS is going to bring you one of the biggest presents you ever received from show business tomorrow afternoon, Christmas Day. For a full hour on the entire CBS network, you're going to get all the comedy, all the laughs, and one of the greatest Broadway and Hollywood hits of recent years, The Man Who Came to Dinner. And The Man Who Came will be played by none other than Jack Benny, plus Charles Boyer, Gene Kelly, Dorothy McGuire, Gregory Peck, and Rosalind Russell. Plus, Henry Fonda and John Garfield as narrators. 
You'll hear them all on CBS's special holiday hour tomorrow afternoon. Jack Benny, playing the man who came to dinner and breaking a leg, had to stay on and on and on. Now with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of your truly Johnny Dollar. There's no place like a crowded department store for a fresh-made murderer to be on the loose. Especially one that's playing Santa Claus for a lot of rosy-cheeked little nippers. I headed back to the toy department. But when I got there, the cupboard was bare. Our lethal St. Nick had decided to give up his red flannel and white whisker hiding place. We found the empty suit in a storeroom, tossed high on a stack of baby buggies. Oh, Johnny, this is terrible. That man's a murderer. What are you going to do? What am I going to do? Now, listen, Judy. By now, there must be 87 cops sifting through this store looking for that guy. They've got two cops on every door. Now, all I'm going to do is help them look. This is one of those everybody's problems. You're right. I guess I'm just getting excited. Well, uh, that you have a right to do. Come on, let's get out of here. I've got an idea. All right, Johnny. I'll, I'll oh, do... Mr. Dollar, thank goodness I found you. Mr. Sandler wants you right away, down on three... An old lady has just been shot in junior Mrs. Lingerie. Oh, serves her right for not acting her age. Let's go, Judy. Oh. Right over here, Dollar. All right. Let him through, please. Let him through. Lady, please stand back now. Well, Dollar, yeah. congratulations. Before, this store was only going to sue that company of yours for one million dollars. Considering what this shooting will do to our reputation, I'm going to make that five million. Uh, Mr. Sandler, keep your powder dry. First of all, it's not my company. And second, you can't sue them for something they didn't do. And third, you'd better get this poor old gal to a hospital. How badly is she hurt? And how did it happen? The doctor's on his way, and we've sent for an ambulance. This woman was lost out on the back stairway looking for the ladies' room. That maniac saw her coming toward him and ran down the stairs, firing over his shoulder. The bullet just seemed to have grazed her left side. Uh, pretty lucky. Where are the police? They're searching all over the store. Dollar, what are we going to do? This is terrible for business. Well, I suspect that any minute now, the cops will be telling you to do something that's going to be even worse for business. Close the store. Well, but close the store? Yeah. Why, we're staying open late tonight. It's the last minute rush. I'm just telling you what I think. I think the cops will double the lookouts on all the doors and make you close the store. Then they can go to work. We lose thousands of dollars. They can't make me close the store. If you stay open, you might lose a few more customers. The hard way. Where's that doctor? He'll be here any minute. Oh, Mr. Sam. Well, yes, what is it? Well, they called up from the sporting goods in the basement. That man has been down there and held them up. And he took four guns and six boxes of ammunition. Six boxes of... Oh, my. Oh, what's this going to do to our store? If you're not careful, it's going to turn your store into the world's largest shooting gallery with live targets. You know what I suggest, Mr. Sandler? Uh, what? What? Tell me what. Don't wait for the police to tell you. Close the store. <laughs> Sandler didn't like it, and neither did the customers. As they filed out of the store, past the scrutiny of the police officers, still clutching their unfinished Christmas shopping list. The process was slow, and while the customers were leaving, the clerks finished up their business, put the white shrouds over their counters, and they too filed out into the early night. The boys in blue, watching the doors, came up with several men answering the general description of our friend with a loose trigger finger, but none of them had little Bobby's teeth marks on his hands. That made it a 50-50 chance that Mr. Killer was still in the building. There's nothing more eerie than a department store after closing. In its white sheets, the whole joint seemed to be playing ghost. I sent Judy over to a steakhouse, Pietres, on 3rd Avenue, told her to wait. Then I had Sandler get me a gun from the sporting goods department. For that lonely, scared feeling, there's no medicine that quite takes the place of a piece of cool steel in your little hot hand. The sergeant, in charge of the police detail, posted men outside all exits. The rest, he took up to the roof with them. 
They were going to run the whole store at their burly blue sieve, floor by floor, counter by counter, inch by inch. Sandler stayed with me down the first floor. Just for fun, I thought I would start working my way up. Dollar, hmm? don't you think we should get out of here and leave this to the police? Well, I have several goosebumps that agree with you, Mr. Sandler, but uh, I have a very dangerous habit of trying to earn my money. Oh, this is terrible. Now, well, look, every counter and post in this store is just the kind of hiding place a sniper would pray for. I get paid for this kind of work. You don't. Now, why don't you go out for a nice safe walk? It's my duty to stay here. I'm sticking with you. Okay. But remember, two of us gave him twice as much to shoot at. I had to go and open my big mouth. Get down. Getting down on that floor could have been committing suicide in itself. The killer's bullet had crashed into a showcase. A sea of broken glass is a risky place to practice diving. Having to swim out of it was twice as bad, but that's what I had to do. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Now, Sandler, keep your head down. Mm-hmm. Bury your face in that glass, but keep your head down. Yes, Dollar. Tell me what to do, anything, but get me out of here. I have a wife and three kids. Well, if you'll do what I tell you to do, your wife will go on having a husband and your kids will still have a father. Yes, yes, just just tell me. I don't know exactly where that shot came from, but from the looks of this glass, it must have been from behind us. Now, I'm going to leave you and crawl over near those elevators. While I'm on my way, you rattle around in this glass. Let him hear where you are. Give me about two minutes, and then do something to draw his fire. Two minutes? What can I do? Do anything but one thing. Don't stand up. Don't stand up. I'll think of something. You'd better. But don't take any chances. No, no. But what are you going to do? Take some chances. Once I was on my way, Sandler went to work with a vengeance. I could hear him thrashing around in that glass like he was trying to corner the Band-Aid market. I made it over to the elevators, scooting flat along the floor till I hit a car with an open door and slithered inside. Behind the protection of the elevator's front wall, I stood up, peered over at the edge of the door, and waited for Santa to make the move that would draw the murderer's fire. I must say Santa was dead game, and the way he made it move, he also stood a good chance of coming plain dead. First he stopped wiggling around on his bed of glass, and then he just stood straight up. The shot missed, but my eyesight didn't. The killer was shooting from high up, behind a pole. He was standing up on a glass showcase, hoping for a better view. And it didn't take me long to decide to give him a better view of the inside of that glass showcase. I started deliberately shooting his foothold out from under him. He was bleeding beautifully when I started to run, straight for the back of the store, firing as he ran. One last souvenir, he threw his empty gun over his shoulder at me. People who live in glass houses shouldn't throw guns. I decided to join the track team and won on the chase. Back out of the main floor, through the employee's entrance, out to the dimly lit shipping department, and its loading dock filled with packages ready for shipment. I could hear him moving around among them. Okay, get your hands up and come out. I'm giving you a chance, but it's not going to last long. Get moving. I don't need your chance. I've got something better. Okay, so you want to play. I think I'll give you a couple of Yuletide presents early, and I'm sure nobody will mind if I open your head before Christmas. My hot-headed friend was hiding behind a high pile of wooden boxes ready for shipping. I grabbed the heavy, empty dolly, gave it a flying start, sent it crashing into the bottom box of the bell. It was beautiful. The biggest crash since 29. It was a tough fight, but Mom, I don't think I won. At best, it was a draw. About the 15th time I belted him, he belted me right back. Oh, then he got his hands on a hammer and laid it across the side of my head. I got the hammer, did the same for him. I made a hole in one. He fell squarely into a man-sized packing case lying at the foot of the packing bench. I was getting weak, dizzy. I had to hold him 
one thing to do. Top a case lying right there. Already nails part way in. Put it on right right over from nail it on. Good tight. Good tight. Good tight. Everything is turning black. Then everything went white. Hey, corny as this may sound, where am I? You're in the hospital, Johnny, darling. Hmm? But don't worry. It's only a slight concussion. They brought you here last night. Oh, I suppose I have a hammer-shaped hole in my head. No, no, darling. It hardly shows. Uh, oh, how could it? The bandage is covering it up. Well, at least I got him. Hmm? You what, dear? I got him. The killer. Oh, no, dear. You couldn't have. They're still looking for him. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. What time is it? Eleven in the morning. I gotta get out of here. Why? Johnny. Johnny, please. Johnny, you're not supposed to get up. Oh, nurse. Nurse. If they let him get away after all my trouble, somebody was going to need a doctor. Judy and I hit the department store on 12 minutes flat. One minute later, I was in the shipping department talking to the head man. Now, now, Mr. Dollar, just calm down. Everything's going to be all right. <laughs> now, exactly what is it you want to know? That big packing case, the one that was lying right here in front of the bench last night. Where is it? Oh, uh, the great big one? Yes, the great big one. The one about eight feet long and three feet wide? Yes, the one about eight feet long and three feet wide. Well, there was something very peculiar about that case. You're telling me. Where is it? Well, this morning we came to work. The boys saw it all packed up, so they put it on the truck for upper New York State. Oh, no. Oh, indeed they did. But what was peculiar about it, even though they found it all ready to go... Later on, they found all the merchandise that was supposed to go in it lying around loose. It had never really been packed. Well, then quick. The least you can do is tell me where it went. Well, now that I can do. That box was the boss's big annual charity shipment of goods. That particular box is on its way to some of the unfortunates who'll be spending this Christmas away from home. All right, so where is it? By now, it should be at the New York State Prison up in Arsening. Expense account, item five, twelve dollars and eighty cents. Dinner check at Pietro's, where I had asked Miss Judy Whitehall to wait for me the night before, and where I inadvertently stood her up. Although how a gal can stand up after eating twelve dollars and eighty cents worth of food, more than I can figure out. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, expense account item six, ten dollars. Medical supplies for those poor CBS sound men, Burns Surrey and Billy Gould, who had to break all that glass during the show. Expense account total, uh, five hundred and eleven dollars and fifty six. You may think this amount is a little high, but uh, isn't everybody at this time of the year? Uh, signed, yours, mm, truly. Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Gordon C. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Gordon C. Hughes. Stars Charles Russell. Script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Jay Novello, Georgia Ellis, Marlene Ames, Parley Bear, Paul Duboff, and Connie Crowder. The special music is written and conducted by Leith Stevens. Your announcer is Bob Stevenson. Be sure to be with us at the same time next week. When another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The 
those two pleasant gentlemen of music, Vaughn Monroe and Gene Autry, will be around with special Christmas music tonight on CBS. On his caravan, Vaughn will feature a medley of Christmas carols. And you'll hear the maestro and his band featuring Vaughn's new song success, The Jolly Old Man in the Bright Red Suit. Gene Autry will bring you Christmas music and the Christmas Eve story, Western Tiles. Be sure to hear these two Saturday night CBS stars, Vaughn Monroe and Gene Autry, on most of these same CBS stations. Now stay tuned for Vaughn Monroe's Caravan, which follows on most of these same stations. This is CBS, where yours truly, Johnny Dollar, meets adventure every Saturday night. The Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's my beat. With Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway. On Christmas Eve, Broadway's natives dance their Christmas dance to the music of carols flowing out of tinseled loudspeakers. The kids mash their noses against plate glass, lick it, and watch the mechanical clown, the mechanized tour army, the tin man dancing a jig on the tin box, and their eyes are dark with desire and hunger. They make a wish on a neon star. That's how it is on Christmas Eve on Broadway. My beat. On the morning of the day before Christmas, creatures are stirring at police headquarters. There's the patter of tired feet and the sound of manly giggles as little gifts are hidden in desk drawers or poured into Dixie cups or slipped under the police blotter. And in my office, there's a kid I knew, name of Marty Wednick. Danny, I don't like to disturb you at this unmentionable hour. Ten o'clock in the morning, unmentionable? You kidding? Sleep has not yet fled from my starry eyes. What makes me bounce from my pillow at an hour which is for the squares is a problem. What's your problem, Marty? Am I or am I not the child president of your branch of the Police Athletic League? You are. So I promised my constituency of fellow former delinquents a Santa Claus for Christmas. That's the problem. When are you going to give with a Santa Claus? <laughs> Don't laugh, Danny. A former delinquent shouldn't be disillusioned. Could make him a neurotic. So I repeat, on behalf of my constituents, where is Santa Claus? <laughs> He'll be here in a minute, Marty. Sergeant Tataglia... Oh, here he is. Come on in, Sergeant. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what This fun. guy's a sergeant? Huh? Hey, Sir this is uh, Marty Wednick. He wants Santa Claus. Oh, he's coming, Danny. He's coming. Come on in, Sandy. Everybody, make way, everybody, for oh, Santa Claus. Oh, <laughs> and what's your alias li uh, uh, name, little boy? Ho, ho, ha. Hey. This guy's a Santa Claus. Who's the kid? The punk, Danny. Who is he? Marty Wednick, that's who I am. So you're Santa Claus, huh? <laughs> Audition me something. What? Why, you crummy Take little... your hands off me, Santa Claus. Is this the Christmas spirit? I'll give it to you in the mouth, fresh kid. You and how many rays? Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute, you two. Marty, this is Nick Norman. Nick Norman, the ex-con? How do you like this monster? For 15 years, I've been playing Sandy Claus at Sing Sing with no complaints, mind you. The first day I am a free civilian playing the old part, the squirt gives me the hook. I resign from Sandy Claus. I didn't get treatment like this even from the guards. Well, take it easy, Nick. Marty didn't mean it, did you, Marty? How was I to know that Sandy Claus here was the world-famous light-fingered safe-cracker? Ex-light-fingered, world-famous safe-cracker, you. Well, does he meet with your approval, Marty? Well, the costume is sloppy, the beard's moth-eaten, but... Yeah, he'll do. Don't do me no favors, punk. You want to know something, Nick? What's something? I like you. I think you are the best Sandy Claus that has ever been my privilege to present to my constituents of the PAL. This is from the heart, Nick. Oh, that's better. you got to show respect for Sandy Claus. What time's your party? Eight o'clock tonight. You'll be there? I'll be there. Well, so long, Danny. Sergeant, that's <laughs> Sandy Claus. See you at the party. Merry Christmas. That's a good kid. Appreciates the finer things. Feels good to be out, huh, Nick? Fifteen years is a long night without sleep, Danny. Yeah, feels good. And thanks for the job of Sandy Claus. 
I would miss it after all these years. And the deal we made. That feels good, too, huh? The deal. Oh, yeah, yeah, the deal. Sure, Danny. I'll keep my promise to you. That's good. You won't forget what happened 15 years ago on Christmas Eve. How oh, can I forget? It was like today. I was all dressed up like Sandy Claus. I had a few idle hours, and right in front of me, there just happened to be an idle safe. So I cracked it. So, so I got caught. Uh huh. Now, what are you going to do now, between now and 8 o'clock, the time the party starts? Walk the thoroughfares and wish everybody joyous tidings and pat kids on the head. And, and leave it... their mother's purses alone. Oh, Danny, how can you talk to Sandy Claus that way? I promised you oh, that... Oh, sure you did. Hey, to Taglia. Uh, yes, Danny. Tag along with Santa Claus. Fresh air will do you both good. Oh, gee, thanks, Danny, thanks. You know, the fresh air will do us both good. Yeah, but hold his hand to Taglia so he won't get lost. We don't want him to get lost, do we? Oh, no, Danny. No, because what's Christmas without Santa Claus? Have fun, boys. <laughs> So everybody was happy, and that was good, because it was a season for it. Sergeant Tartaglia was happy, because I had not only given him permission to leave the room, I told him to go out and take a walk with Santa Claus. And everyone knows that Santa Claus is always happy, even if once upon a time he had to spread his glad tidings around Sing Sing. I considered it a while, and then I decided to inhale the bloom of Christmas as it filtered through police headquarters. And it made me feel happy, too. It lasted for two inhales. Sign on the door says Lieutenant Danny Clover. I don't believe in signs. What's your name? Uh uh-uh. uh. What's yours? I came prepared for a question like that. Here's my card. Oh, thanks. Simon Larrabee. Real estate and rentals. You renting something, Mr. Larrabee? Ah, that would give you the upper hand. Two questions to my one. And you haven't answered it yet. Danny Clover, like the sign says. That's my name. You're quite right. I am running something. Go ahead. Run right away. I like to watch. I'm doing it now. Just looking at you. I'm renting that property known as the warehouse at 2290 East Grand Street. Well, if it makes you happy... Wait a minute. That's our clubhouse. That's where the kids are having our Christmas party. Are you? <laughs> What's the... <laughs> what else can it be? Where's the rent? Rent for what? Rent for that property known as the warehouse at 2290 East Grand Street. You mean it hasn't been paid? How much is it? It's sixty two fifty a month. Oh, that includes utilities. I'll pay it. The club's treasurer will reimburse me. You don't understand, Mr. Clever. When I rent something, I get a year's rent in advance. That comes to $750. And I want it before there's any party there. Are you kidding? Where are those kids going to get money like that? Oh, well, I'll give you until 8 o'clock to get the money, and I'll just sit right here until then. All right. Grab yourself a police gazette. Never touch the stuff. Suit yourself. Well, excuse me, Simon. Danny Clover speaking. Danny! Yeah, what is it? I can hardly hear you, Curcio. Yeah, yeah, well, no wonder. Listen, what I got to talk to. Listen, Danny. Hey, you see what I mean? Why the sirens? What's the trouble? Sergeant Tartaglia is up a tree. What? Sergeant Tartaglia is in a tree on the Avenue A playground, Danny. He flipped his list. He's telling anyone that'll listen that there ain't no Santa Claus. Hey, you better come on down, Danny. <laughs> When I got down to the Avenue A playground, it was having the Christmas party of its life. A 30-foot tree complete with tinsel, candy canes, colored popcorn balls, firemen, and a scared sergeant policeman, forlorn and lost, pinned to its top branch. The fire department finally convinced Artaglia that a ladder was a safe invention for getting down on a tall tree. At the bottom rung, he almost believed it. When his feet touched the ground, they gave him a blanket because he was suffering from shock. He was about to tell the newsreel boys his ordeal when I faced them. Oh, Danny, Danny, I, I was about to tell the newsreel boys my ordeal. Well, just tell me first, Attaglia, because I hardly ever get to the movies. I, I, I'll be with you in just a minute, sir. Oh, Danny, it was awful. It was something awful. I only ask this because there's so much about you I don't know, Tataglia. Why do you climb trees? Oh, I don't, Danny. The height scares me. When I was a child, a tree threw me on the ground. Still, you climbed this tree. Why? Oh, because I'm a policeman. That makes sense. But how? Well, sure it does, Danny. The kids see me. I am a policeman. They need to put a star on top of their Christmas tree. They ask me because I am a policeman and can do such things. I couldn't let the department down, Danny. So, so you leave Nick Norman alone all by himself because you don't want to let the department down. Oh, I knew you would say that. But I trusted Nick because he is Santa Claus. He told me I could trust him. Sure you can, Tartaglia. But what happened to Santa Claus? He's not around. That's right. There ain't no Santa Claus, like I've been saying. They told me you were saying that. What happened to him, Tartaglia? Well, Danny, whilst I was up in the tree pinning the star, below me I saw a big black bulletproof sedan. 
What kind? A big black bulletproof sedan. Now I know. Then what happened? Well, this big black bulletproof sedan stopped by Nick, our Santa Claus. Two men got out, talked him for a minute, then took him one by each arm, deposited him in the car, closed the door, and away they sped careening on two wheels. I yelled to them to stop Danny. Uh, but I guess they didn't hear me on account of the hustle and bustle. How uh, Santa Claus does I get? Where is he? Where'd he go? Well, if I was Santa Claus, I know where I'd go. Not that it matters, but where? Well, to my mother. On Christmas Eve, she deserves something like that. I'm sure she does. So we have you now, Sergeant Tartaglia? I'll make good in the newsreel, Tartaglia. This may be your big chance. <laughs> Yeah? Are you Mrs. Norman? Hi. I'm Danny Clover. Yeah? May I come in, Mrs. Norman? Hi. I want to talk to you. About what? About Nick, about your son. Come in. Thanks. In here, in the parlor. Sit down. Thank you. No, not on that seat, that one. What do you want to talk about, about Nick? Do you know where he is? Oh, don't tell me no more. One day when he was nine years old, Nick said to me, he said, Ma, don't ask me where I've been no more, because I'll lie to you. That's what he said. Then you don't know where he is. Don't make me go through that again, Sonny. Say, who are you to ask me questions? I told you I was... Yeah, yeah, you did. You said you Danny Clover. That don't mean nothing to me. Oh, you must be the guy come about, uh... Aha, uh-huh, I am. That's why I came. Aha. Uh-huh. Well, you tell me what you come here for. For, you know, just as you said. Oh, this I like. This lets me play cagey like in the old days. What are you talking about? You know your son, Nick. You got to squirm more than that, kiddo. What about Nick? We want him to be our Santa Claus. Bingo. That's good. Oh, it must be a good feeling, a young man like you. Big, strong, looking for Santa Claus. Me? I just sat here in my rocking chair. Mrs. Norman. Thinking about the times we had, me and Big Ed, my husband. The time... I have to go now, Mrs. Norman. Where's your son? Oh, you made me go through it again. One day, when he was nine years old, Nick said to me... Uh, Yeah, oh, thanks, Mrs. Norman. Ma, don't ask me where I've been. Hi, Danny. Uh, did you find Santa Claus? No, uh-uh, Tartaglia. What are you doing about it? Me? Nothing. That's good. Anyone to see me? Uh, yeah, in your office. Hey, uh, Danny, Danny, well, what are you angry at me for, huh, Danny? Hey, Danny, what's this I hear about Santa Claus taking a powder? Uh, you'll get your Santa Claus, Marty. You still here, Simon Larrabee? Yes, yes, yes. I'm waiting. Just as I told you, I'm waiting for my 750 rent. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine this kind of Danny? On Christmas Eve, he wants his rent. This is a Christmas, no Santa Claus, no party. What am I going to tell my constituents? Well, it'll work out, Marty. We'll get the money someplace. I eat the oh, Shut up, Simon. But, Danny, no Santa Claus. Hold it. Hold it, everybody. I've got the solution. Communications. This is Sergeant Cartagli in Danny Clover's office. An all points bulletin. Pick up man. Description as follows. Height, 5 feet 11. Weight, 235. When last seen, was wearing a red suit, a red hat with bells and black boots. Identifying marks. Has a long, snow-white beard. What's his name? Santa Claus! You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. $51,000 $51,000 in cash and wonderful prizes. Danny Seymour might play Santa Claus to you tonight, and he might fill up your stockings with that fifty-one grand if you can identify the phantom voice. Listen in just a little later tonight to Sing It Again.
Broadway brings you Christmas in a lot of ways. You get dribbled around by the opposing teams of last-minute shoppers. You ride backwards on up escalators so you can be in a good position for the down escalators. You get mauled and shoved and picked over. And finally, you get gift-wrapped and sent on your way. My way was out to lunch and back to police headquarters, holding my Christmas stocking in my hand. I had two things, no rent and no Santa Claus. Two nothings which made for an empty holiday. Sergeant Tataglia wasn't enjoying himself either, and he expressed himself with sentiment. Da, humbug. What did you say, Tataglia? Ba, humbug, Danny. Uh, that's a Christmas expression I picked up to be used when you wished it was the 4th of July instead. Yeah, me too. Yeah, uh, you uh, seen the afternoon papers, Danny? Yeah, take a look at it. Oh, uh, you look at it for me. What does it say? Well, first it has got a picture on the front page of a tree. In the tree is me. Mm -hmm. Then it says under it, it says, Officer Gino Tartaglia. Yeah, hey, Danny, they spelled it right. Well, Officer Tartaglia spent the afternoon cavorting in a tree to the delight and applause of all the little... Oh, it runs on like that. Oh, forget it. It wasn't your fault. Then that's what I tried to tell Mrs. Tartaglia. Doesn't she believe you? Danny, she called me on the phone. I said, Hello? She said, Signal Tarzan. Then she started laughing, hysterical. I can't get her to talk. Every time I pick up my phone, all I hear is Mrs. Tartaglia laughing. Oh, I got my problems, too. Yeah, this is probably the first time in the history of Santa Claus that he's ever heisted from his appointed rounds. Maybe. Hey, did you get in touch with Nick's mother again, like I told you? Oh, Danny, she ain't nowhere to be found. The old day must have skipped. And the 200 Santa Clauses that the boys investigated, not one of these is Nick Norman under the beard. I'll get it, Danny. Thanks. Sergeant Tartaglia. Huh? Yeah, he's here. It's for you, Danny. Thank you. Danny Cover speaking. Danny, this is Maxie. You know, Maxine Riddell. Yeah, how are you, Maxie? I'm in lingerie, Danny. Come on down. What? In the lingerie department at Fletcher's department store. Working. I got news for you. News about Nick Norman. You interested, Danny? Yeah, yeah, I am. Hold on to everything, Maxie. I'll be right down. <laughs> Here, mister. Take this black nightgown over to that girl over there. She'll gift wrap it up. Hi, Danny. How am I doing? Great, Maxie. Only great. How long have you been working here? Only for the Christmas season, Danny. But the way I've been operating, I think maybe they'll keep me on. No, no questions about your background? You mean about me being a shoplifter? Uh-huh. That's the reason I got the job. The way I was lifting things, I told them it'd be cheaper for them if they put me on the sales force. So they did. So for 22 bucks a week, I'm an honest mouth. Anyway, it's steady. Keep it that way, huh, Maxie? Anything you say, Danny. Well, now that we've had our tea, I guess you want to know about Nick. Yeah. Breaks my heart to be a stool. You know how it is, Danny. Me with my former alliances. But it's different now. Yeah, different. I want it to be different for Tussie, too. You remember how it was between me and Tussie? How was it? It was gorgeous. That's why I'm being a pigeon, Danny. If Nick made up his mind to be a kosher citizen, he should stick to it. Not fall back into the arms of a mob like a doll who says mama. Which mob, Maxie? Tussie Khan. Such a name for a gorilla. Tussie. How do you figure a name like that? I don't know him. Where do I find him? Tussie just got back from Chicago. He bought the Domino Club. I happened to be passing there on my lunch hour, and I saw Nick in a Santa Claus suit drinking grape juice with Tussie. Oh, excuse me, Danny, a customer. Yes, madam. Something for yourself. Thanks, Maxie. For what? We have some gorgeous outside girdles, madam, for everyday wear. They're right over here. The Domino Club in the West 50s is a bright and shiny joint plastered with black glass. It stands close to the ground between two peeling brown stones. When you walk into it, you have a feeling you're walking into the mouth of a beetle. Its walls are lined with black mirrors, but its ceiling is draped with folds of scarlet silk. And at six o'clock of a Christmas Eve, the boys, complete with Christmas-wrapped girls, are beginning to gather. You ask a busboy in white tie and tails, where's Tussie Carnes? And he lifts an eyebrow to a guy standing near the bandstand. A guy grinning like an alley cat while a girl pins a sprig of mistletoe to his lapel. You wait till she kisses Tussie. And Tussie kisses her. But his eyes are open and flicking around the joints, so he sees you and pushes the girl away. Beat it, Blitz, and I got company. 
Merry Christmas, stranger. You want something from Tussie Boy? Same to you. And I want Nick Norman. Oh, that's a big desire on a holiday. Why you want Nick? Tell Tussie Boy. I think I gotta explain. I'm Danny Clover, a cop. I want him. Don't everybody? Come with me, Sonny. Santa's right down at the end of this hall. Merry Christmas, Melvin. Ain't it, though, Tussie? Merry Christmas, George. Likewise, I'm sure. I brought you a present, boys. Goody. Likewise. Where's Nick Norman? This fella here, he says to Tussie boy, he wants Nick Norman. Our Santa Claus. Uh-oh. What big guys you have, mister? And do you know something else that's plain precious, boys? No. Do tell us, Tussie. The fella says he is a cop. Isn't that cute, huh? I could die. Yeah. So show the fella Santa Claus, huh, fellas? Merry Christmas, Danny Clover. Oh, Tussie boy said that, didn't he? Stay away from me. First, we want to wish you on a star. Like that. Are you too crazy? Stay away from me. I think that was not enough stars. I'll give him another package. You know that Tussie is good to us. He gave us the best Christmas present two fellas could ever have. Uh, don't be greedy, Melvin. Leave some for me. Oh, look at that. It's all gone. Come on, Danny, open your eyes. What? Yeah, open your eyes, Danny. It's getting late. Ain't you heard? Christmas is coming. Hey, it's you, Nick Norman. Oh, Danny, call me Sandy Claus. That's the nicest alias I got. Now, look, Nick, I'm going to... Oh, here, I'll help you up, Danny. Uh, sit on the edge of the sofa there. Yeah. Sandy Claus, Danny. Santa Claus, huh? Sure. So help me, Nick, where I'm going to put you. You'll spend the next 94 Christmases in solitary. Take it easy, Danny. Come on, let's get out of here. I'll be late for that kid's party. Come on. Oh, you mean let's get out of here just like that? I don't have to beat my way out of here? What for? What's all this about, Nick, uh, Santa Claus? You adult today, Danny. What's the matter with you? But you were kidnapped. Kidnapped? Me? Who would want to do a thing like that to jolly old me? A man in a tree said two guys pushed you into a car. He only had a bird's eye view, but he said kidnapped. You... Oh, you mean Melvin and George. <laughs> I mean Melvin and George. <laughs> two pals from Chicago, Daddy. They heard I was out and wanted I should be Sandy Claus to a private party they was given. That's all. Harmless guys. Pals. Buddies. We enjoy each other. Yeah, they enjoyed me, too. Now, before they left town for this party, they said to tell you... That... Oh, wait a minute. I wrote it down. Uh, it says, uh, Dear Danny Clover... Sorry we made a mistake and beat up your head. May the bells ring a joyous Noel for you. Signed, XX. That's Melvin and George. A yes. mistake, huh? Sure. They knew some mob or other might try to get me as Santa Claus. They figured you was a mob, so they protected me from you, like, like you was fibbing about being a cop. After they walloped you unconscious, they went through your pockets and saw you was really a cop. So they wrote this note. The running ink you see here on the note, Danny, are... that's tears. You'll forgive him, won't you, Danny? Yeah. How about your mother? Well, that was your error, Danny. You didn't tell Mom you was from the police, so she taught just like Melvin and George. You gave me the double talk. Yeah, that's my mom. A grand old dame. You know you know what I told her once when I was nine years yeah, old? Yeah, you know, I... my sleigh's outside. I'll give you a ride back to my office. Well, that means the whole thing was an error in identification and motive, as they say, huh, Danny? That's right. Isn't that right, Santa? Sure. I'll tell it to you again if you want. No, never it's... mind. What happened to Simon Larrabee? Oh, he went out for a feast of spud nuts and coffee. Hey, you don't look very happy, Tartaglia. Uh-uh. No, Danny. I ain't happy. Unhappy. Very. What's the matter? We've got Santa Claus? Come on, smile. It's going to be a fine Christmas. I can't, Danny. I just can't. It's Mrs. Tartaglia. Hmm? Yeah, now she ain't laughing anymore. The neighbors are laughing and Mrs. Tartaglia is crying. Why? Well, the later editions of the paper said that, that Santa Claus was heisted. It was because I was in a tree. 
Yeah, the papers say I, single-handed, messed up Christmas. I understand, huh? Mm. Well, I'll tell you, Tatanga. Hey, what about my Christmas party? Oh, 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 well, not yet, Sandy. Oh. Wait till you get to the party. Say, the press was saying that you were snatched, Sandy. What gives? It said that mobsters grabbed you. No, I was just a little misunderstood. Yeah, that's right, Marty. Nick was grabbed by mobsters. Huh? Yeah, well, then how'd you get away? Sergeant Tataglia. Yeah? Uh-huh. Sergeant Tataglia. The kind of policeman who tracks down criminals to the lair. I am, Danny? The kind that single-handed rescued Santa Claus from the jaws of disaster. This guy did that? Yep. I'm just about to call the press boys and tell them about it. Oh, Danny. I mean it, Tartaglia. Don't be so modest. I'm going to do just that. Danny. Put Marty in a cab, Tartaglia. I'll send Santa down the squad car in a little while. Yeah, sure. Well, come on, little tight. Uh, I mean, uh, Marty. Okay. Merry Christmas, Danny. Whatever you tell the press guys, Danny, I'll swear to it. Sure. Sure you will. Yeah, that's the fine Christmas you're giving everybody, Danny. How about yourself? Oh, I'll have fun at the party. I always do. Oh. Where is it? Where's my money? Oh, look, Mr. Larrabee, it's Christmas. Yeah, of course it's Christmas. That's why I want my rent, so I can have a Merry Christmas. Hey, Danny, who is this guy that needs rent to have a Merry Christmas? This is Simon Larrabee. He wants a year's rent in advance for that warehouse where the kids are having a party. Or else... No party. Yes, that's who I am. Oh, like <laughs> that, <laughs> huh? <laughs> so that's how you are, huh, Simon? Stop breathing in my face, Santa Claus. All them kids wanting to have a party, and a Simon like you wants to louse it up. I'll put him down, yeah, yes, I ain't doing nothing, Danny. Just holding Simon up so I can breathe in his face. <laughs> Please. I want you to think about something, Simon. Think about all those kids that are looking forward to that Christmas party, which ain't going to happen on account of you. Think about it. Right. I'm, th- I'm thinking, yes. I'm Maybe thinking. you could think better with a pen in your hand, Simon. Yes, a pen that will write out a receipt for a year's rent in advance, huh, Simon? Of course, of course, of course. Oh, Christmas spirit and all that. Yes, I'll get my receipt book. Uh. Ah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Well, I haven't felt so good in years. Yes, here you are, Mr. Glover. A receipt for a year's rent in advance. And tell the darlings, Merry Christmas with you. Yeah. Yeah, I will. Ain't he a nice fella, Danny? Come on, nice fella. I'll take you to a party. Merry Christmas, Danny. It's a merry, merry, merry Christmas, Danny. Merry Christmas. Yep. Merry Christmas. On Christmas Eve, Broadway is almost like any other place in the world. The bells ring out, the horns blow, there's laughter. The masters on the translux fell out slowly, word by word. Peace on earth. Goodwill to men. And you read it. You believe it. Because on Christmas Eve, you believe a miracle. Then a whirl of confetti is in your eyes, and you're pushed along with a crowd, and you never see the next news bulletin. You don't try to look back. It's Broadway. The merriest. The shiniest lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beach. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was composed by Alexander Courage and conducted by Wilbur Hatch, and the program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Charles Calvert, Gil Stratton, Jr., Howard McNear, Hal March, Bert Holland, Shep Menken, Estelle Dodge, and Peggy Weber. On Christmas afternoon, Jack Benny will be heard as guest star in a full one-hour version of the comedy The Man Who Came to Dinner. Charles Boyer, Gregory Peck, Rosalind Russell, Dorothy McGuire, Henry Fonda, John Garfield, and Gene Kelly will be starring alongside Jack in this special holiday hour. 
Then an hour later, Jack will be back with his own Sunday night gang for 30 more minutes of holiday hilarity. In fact, the best idea really is stay tuned to CBS all day Christmas Day. Now stay tuned for Sing It Again, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you'll find Broadway is my beat every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. On the days before Christmas, Broadway dances along to carols that flow from sequined loudspeakers. The kids mash their noses against the plate glass, lick it, and watch. And it's all there. The mechanical clown, the tin man dancing a jig on a tin box, the toy army precisely to scale with the latest equipment mechanized. And eyes are bright with desire and hope. It's the one time in the year when odds are better that dreams will come true. So make a wish on a neon star. And in the short time before Christmas, creatures were stirring at police headquarters. There's the patter of tired feet and the sound of manly giggles as little gifts are hidden in desk drawers or poured into Dixie cups or slipped under the police blotter. And in my office, my strong right arm, Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. <coughs> Yeah, it's get pretty late, you know. A couple more hours, you can go home and finish decorating your Christmas tree. Indeed, indeed. Getting a lot of nice things this year, you know? Oh, many's the things, Danny. I guess my old cockles should be warmed. Ah, but they're not. Oh, something wrong, Gino? What I want most for Christmas, Danny, I'm not going to get. I'm going to get nicks and knacks and an electric shaver and handkerchiefs and socks and ties and a curved K woody pipe to smoke my troubles away. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty full Christmas to me, Gino. Ah, humbug. Danny, what I want most is to go out and solve a crime. To meet face to face the sultry sirens, the hardened criminals, and to solve them the way you do. To go out on a case with you, my fondest wish for Christmas. Oh, police headquarters would fall apart without you, Gino. You just stick around here and do your job. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I just thought I'd let you know that's all. Oh, well. I'm going downstairs for some coffee. I'll be back, sir. Roger. Oh, face it, Gino. You're stuck on a desk. <laughs> Yeah? Oh, phone, Gino. Sergeant Gino Tataglia speaking. Yes. Yes. Yeah, right away. Danny. Hey, Danny. Yeah, what's the matter, Gino? I haven't gotten my coffee yet. Coffee? At a time like this? Buddy Malpar, the ne'er-do-well millionaire. What? What about him? What about him? He has been slugged. Let's go, Gino. Did you say let? Of course, on a case like this, I'll need you, Gino. Come on. This is his house, Danny. Let's go. It's locked? Yeah. Stand aside, Danny. Huh. We can go in now, Danny. Gino. Yeah? We could have rung the bell. Who's got time? You coming? For here, Gino. Back of the sofa. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Take a note, Danny. Yes, sir. Buddy Malpar, the unconscious ne'er-do-well millionaire, battered and bludgeoned on the supra-occipital region of the cranium, hmm? back of the skull, Danny. 
slugged on the supraoccipital by his assailant unknown. From the size of the lump on Buddy Malpas' heretofore refined head, conclude that said lump was administered by a blunt weapon three millimeters by five of the irregular contour and lead pipe consistency. You got that, Danny? Yes, Sergeant. Hold it. I got a P.S. To wit, luxurious apartment of said ne'er-do-well millionaire, one buddy Malpa, ransacked and left in disarray. P.P.S., the butler of said household will have his work cut out for him. Shall I phone it in now, Sergeant? Don't move. Huh? The drapes just moved. All right. You, behind those drapes. Out. With your hands clasped behind your neck. Out. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Danny, it can't be. It can't be what, Gino? This man, this hider behind drapes. It can't be. Are you? <laughs> it is he. Danny, may I present Mike Shrek, the bald-headed miracle detective from Philadelphia. Merry Christmas, gentlemen. Merry Christmas to you, Mike Shrek. I assume you gentlemen are of the police of this city? I present to you, sir, Lieutenant Danny Clover, and myself, Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. Tartaglia, eh? Uh, that, that name has a familiar ring. Oh, perhaps because I was an innocent abroad on the guided in the footsteps of Mike Shrek tour in Philadelphia last summer. I blew myself to it with my vacation money. Oh, it's not for that I remember you, sir. It's for the word that has come to me that you are indeed the brains behind the brains of the New York police force. Oh, oh come now, Mr. Shrek. You, you mustn't believe all Oh, I here. could have used you, sir, on my famed widow Chalcedony's case. When having trailed the desperado across the 1.83 miles of the Philadelphia Camden Bridge, I was caught in the seductive toils of... The machine gun <laughs> brain of the man, Danny. The memory for details. To have made a part of him the size of the Philadelphia Camden Bridge. Gentlemen, enough of nostalgia. To work. <clears throat> it was I who phoned this into you. Being now on the trail of Lance Lash, master criminal of them all, I was led to this place. Only to find Buddy Malpaw, the ne'er-do-well millionaire. Ah, oh, but hush. The man is coming around. What happened, man? Tell us what happened. You are... Gently, sir. You are among friends. We're from the police, Mr. Malpaw. Try to tell us what happened. Well, uh, I'll try, fellows. I had arranged such a pleasant evening. A date with Rima Nine. Oh, not the Rima Nine from Bolivia, but the Miss Rima Nine who is staying at the Stacy Arms. Go on, Mr. Malpaw. Rima was to meet me here at 9.30. However, at precisely at 9, the doorbell rang. I went to open it. There was no one there. No one? No one. A prank, I thought. I, I started back into the apartment. Suddenly, the, the pain, the awful pain screaming through my skull. It, it was no prank, I assure you. No, it... Where is it? Where is it? Where is what, Mr. Malpaw? It's gone. It was here in this case. It's gone. What's gone, Mr. Malpaw? I prized it more than... The jeweled scimitar of Genghis Khan. The jeweled scimitar of Genghis Khan. The jewel. What's going on here, Sergeant? Read your notes, man. Read your notes. And watch the sergeant as he considers the attitude of the distressed man, the desolation of him, the sergeant's compassion, understanding. The most precious thing of Malpaw's life, the jeweled scimitar of Genghis Khan, was gone now, vanished, lost. <laughs> Strayed, stolen, purloined. The sergeant's gentleness and the knowledge of it caught up with Malpaw. Took hold, displaced everything until it was only emptiness. Void, vacuum, space, nothing. And finally, the ne'er-do-well millionaire's rejection of it. And turn now, and Sergeant Tataglia nods sagely. Open the door for him. And leave. Going out of the Stacy Arms, and the clerk at the desk lifts a corner of his lip and an eyebrow when the sergeant mentions the name of a woman he wants to see. And the long ride up on the elevator. And walk down the carpeted corridor. And the sprig of Christmas holly above the brass door knocker. At this time, we'll knock, Danny. Hi, fellas. Please come in. You'll forgive the way I look. We're from the police, Miss Nine. 
Yeah, we got some questions to ask you. A piece of finery I picked up at Cote d'Azur. I always wear it at this hour. It's a wishing hour. You may call me Rima. I'm Gino. He's Danny. It's about Buddy Malpaw, Miss Nine. Yes. He was beaten and robbed this evening. You may sit here beside me, if you wish. None of this sultry siren stuff, Miss Nine. Didn't you have a date with Mr. Malpaw this evening? Yes, I did, at 9.30. That check, Sergeant. What time did you get to the Malpaw mansion? At 9.30. I rang the bell and rang it. No one answered. I was so disappointed. With an educational evening like that in sight. Educational? But he was going to show me the jewel scimitar of Genghis Khan. The real one, not the replica. Oh? There's a replica? At the Museum of Far Eastern Lore, I often go there in my idle moments and browse around the Far Eastern things. And you're a strange one, Rima. Yes. Uh, please go on. That's how I met Buddy at the museum. Fate plays strange tricks, doesn't it, Gino? Yeah. Now, if you'll pardon me, fellows, I must change. Well, go right ahead. We'll just make ourselves... Close. Let's go, Gino. We are sorry, Mr. Zoe, that we have made you open your museum to us at such a late hour. It is always a pleasure, Sergeant, to indulge the whims of the cultured, though they be policemen. Thank you, Mr. Zoe. But not at all. <clears throat> and here, gentlemen, looming above you is the statue of the fabulous terrorizer, Genghis Khan, clothed in the cap of Tibetan fur, the jeweled gown of brocaded picking silk, all of it donated to us most generously by... Buddy Malpaw, to complete our Far Eastern collection. And the sword in his hand? A replica only, I hear. A replica of the jeweled scimitar of Genghis Khan. And Mr. Malpaw's generosity dissolved when it reached Tell the... us about the scimitar, Mr. Zoyer. With the deepest of pleasure. Genghis tore it from the wounded hands of Jella Ledin. His arch and bitter enemy, Danny. Mm. Then for centuries it was lost. Three centuries, Danny. Vanished. To reappear again in the Renaissance as an ornament worn about the slim waist of oh, the Lucretia Borgia, then. If this scimitar were real, Mr. Zoic, how much would it be worth? Eh, uh, conservatively? Conservatively. Uh, half a million dollars. Give a little, take a little. Half a million, huh? That's all we need to know. Let's go, Danny. Yeah. And to you, Mr. Zoic, many thanks and merry, merry Christmas. And to you, sir. The faith. Half a million bucks, Danny. No wonder Mr. Malpar, the ne'er do well millionaire. Gino, hit the ground, hit the ground. Oh, oh. Gino, you're. you're... Yeah. yeah. Help me, Danny. I've been. I've been shot. Oh. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. It's so delightful, it's become a Christmas tradition with Amos and Andy. Tomorrow night, again, Amos will be heard explaining the meaning of the Christmas spirit to his little daughter, Arbadella. It wouldn't be Yuletide without this special bit Amos and Andy contribute to the season's atmosphere... So be sure to hear it again over most of these same CBS radio stations tomorrow night on Amos and Andy. As the winds move to the place of the year's dying, the Mazdas on Broadway's Translux arrange themselves in merry thoughts. Suitable for Christmas past, Christmas present, Christmas future... Broadway walks by, glances up, smiles, hurries to buy the last-minute gift for the last-minute friend. Crosby sings the tune that's in your heart. The corner Santa Claus winks, and the golden girl stops you, asks which way to Gimbel's, invites you to come along and show her. The budget term dreams are coming true, kid. So go live a little. Danny, Danny, I've been shot. Oh, oh, no. I must have been dreaming. Yeah, where was I? Oh, yeah, I, I was shot. Uh, 
There you are, Sergeant. As good as new. My thanks, Dr. Sinsky. Uh, may I say something, Gino? Indeed you may. I've been privileged to attend many courageous men. But you... You, Gino... No other way I can say it. I, I stand in humility before you. Ah, oh, Dr. Sinsky, you... You shouldn't say those things, I... He's right, did. Gino. Dr. Sinsky's only saying what all of us feel. We've already initiated proceedings for an award for bravery beyond the call of duty. Danny, Dr. Sinsky, dear true friends, I know not what to... May I? Uh, go right ahead, sir. Thank you. Sergeant Gino Tataglia speaking. Yes. 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 That was my trick. Evil has come to him. Get me a squad car. But Gino, Never you mind the hole in my head. Danny, a squad car. I can't move. I can't move. The door's locked, Gino. One side. After you, Danny. Huh? Mr. Shrek, what happened to you? Lance Lash. The master criminal of them all? I give the devil his due. You haven't told us what happened, Mr. Shrek. Please, gentlemen, please. You help me up. Oh, of course. Now, be gentle with him, Danny. Yeah. Uh, over here on the bed. Mm. Now, tell us about it. Oh, my friends, I feel I have failed you. Oh, don't talk like that. After all, how many people have come face to face with Lance Lash and lived to tell about it? <laughs> Give the devil his due. Yes. Now, would you mind telling us what happened? I, I came here to my rooms. Sparsely furnished, you'll admit, but the way I like it. No furbelows to distract my attention. I needed to think. I knew I was once again a hot on the trail of Lance Lash. Once again from the ends of the earth. Listen to the man, Danny. We had met. Lance Lash and I. The last time on the lonely Isle Mauritius, when we battled hand-to-hand on top of old Farfangan, the volcano. Yeah, I know, but but what happened tonight? As is my wont before I retired, I looked under my bed, gentlemen, and there he was, Lance Lash. So you got under two and started a fight with him, yes, huh? Yes, yes, it was nip and tuck under there, but if the devil has well, why did he come here, Mr. Shrek? He thought I had the jewel scimitar of Genghis Khan. And as you know, gentlemen, I have not. As you... <laughs> Would you mind, Sergeant? Oh, of course. Yes. 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 How do you like that, Danny? Like what? Rima 9. The South Korea Siren? Yeah, she was picked up on a disorderly conduct charge. And you know what she had with her? No, I don't. A scimitar. And it was smashed to pieces. Let's go, Danny. If I were you, I'd try a poultice, Mr. Shrek. Open it, Danny. Yeah. Well, Rima, what have you to say for yourself? This, you, uh, and this. Take it easy, Rima. Just relax. Kicking will get you nowhere. A wild cat. You, all of you. That for you. Easy, girl. Easy. That's it. That's a good girl. That's a baby. You have strong arms, Sergeant. Don't take them away. Hmm. The boys say they picked you up screaming on a street corner. Why were you doing that, Miss Nine? They tell you about me banging their empty heads together till they rang out the season's greetings. They mentioned it. Now you tell us why you did all that and right before Christmas. You know why. That piece of mail order carving knife masquerading as the... Jewel scimitar of Genghis Khan. Not the genuine article, huh? Not the genuine article, huh? He says. It was a fake! A dirty, rotten, and so tiny. Don't but... scream, Angel. We're all nearby. Okay, so it was a fake, Miss Nine. Where'd you get it? What's that got to do? Only this. You rang Buddy Malpo's bell at nine last night. You slugged him, stole the scimitar. Now you're hurt because it's a fake. Charges pile up, huh, Sergeant? Assault, theft? Indeed they do, Rima. Book me for anything you want, lover. Just so you bring in that woman-beating cab driver. Huh? The cab driver. I get in this cab. Tell him to get me to the airport in a hurry. 
Why should I stay in this lonesome town when what I had in my hands was worth half a million? <laughs> what I had in my hands. Go on. So Cabby tilts his cap to me. I see the union label. I figure he's friendly, trustworthy, loyal. I make chit-chat with him when, wham, bang, he turns onto a side street, grabs me by the throat, wrestles me for the scimitar. He looks at it and breaks it over my head. And you know who he was? Who he really was? Not, not... None other. Lance Lash, the master criminal of them all. Lover... Imagine poor little me in the clutches of Lance Lash. Oh, there, there. Don't think about it. You can let her go now, Gino. Read your notes, man. Just read your notes. And leave there. Go away. Find a place at police headquarters and close the door to the outside. Think about it, you and Sergeant Tataglia. Put it down and add it up. It doesn't come out. So Sergeant Tartaglia puts it down and adds it up, and it comes out. Go to a place now, back to the museum, and tell it all to a man you talked to before. I can't believe it. I just cannot believe it. You better believe it, Mr. Zoid, because that's the only way it makes sense. That's right. If the scimitar stolen from Buddy Malpah was a phony, then the one the statue of Genghis Khan is holding is the real one. The ingeniousness of the man Malpah. What better way to keep his treasure safe than to put it before the eyes of the world? We want to see again, Mr. Dawkins. Of Dork. course, of course you do. This way, this way. Ah, this is very gratifying to me, you know, this publicity. People from all walks of life now drop in to catch a peek of the statue of Genghis Khan holding the scimitar. And just ten minutes ago, I had to warn a cab driver to keep hands off. A cab on. driver? Yes. Interesting fellow, too. Interesting face. We better hurry, Danny. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Now, look, look. I don't understand Genghis Khan. He's dressed like a cab driver. He's holding a city guidebook in his hand. The scimitar is gone. It's impossible. Maybe, but it's happened. The cab driver changed clothes. With... Maybe we can catch him, Danny. Yeah. And maybe that man's sitting on the steps, so I'm... Let's ask him. Hey. Hey, mister. Hello. Did you see a man come out of here a few minutes ago? Well, I guess I did. I've been sitting here for the last hour. Did you notice anything strange about any of them, the way one of them was dressed? Mm, let me see now. Uh, this I... man had on a fur cap and a brocaded robe. He was carrying a scimitar. Oh, sure, I saw him. I didn't pay him no mind, though. I just figured he was from California. Let's go, Gino. Danny? Danny, I think I got it. Got what? Get in the car and I'll tell you all about it. Oh, where are we going? To see Mike Schreck, the bald-headed miracle detective from Philadelphia. I think we're at trail's end. <laughs> It's Lieutenant Clover, Mr. Shrek, and Sergeant Tartaglia. I'll be with you in a minute. We're still waiting, Mr. Shrek. Come in. Come in. I was just tidying up. Going someplace, Mr. Shrek? Back to Philadelphia. I'm afraid... Afraid Lance Lash has outwitted me again. Oh, has he now? Yes, but I'll get him. After the holidays. Sit down, Mr. Shrek. Tell us how you're going to get Lance Lash. Well, I'm going to the Congo after the holidays. Oh? And why are you going to do that, Mr. Shrek? Rumor has already drifted up from the veldt of the sudden appearance of the long-lost emerald eye of the goddess Osiris. If I know Lance Lash, that's where he'll be after the holidays. Yeah, he will, will he? Let me ask you a question, Mr. Shrek. At your service. How long did you say the Philadelphia Camden Bridge was? Uh, 1.83 miles. See? What did I tell you, Danny? Go ahead, Gino. Correct him. The length of the Philadelphia Camden Bridge is 1.81 miles. Did you hear me, Mr. Shrek? I heard you. Mike Shrek would never make an error like that. Oh? Lance Lash, the master criminal of them all, I presume. At your service, gentlemen. Look in the closet, Danny. Right. Uh, it's here, all right. 
The costume of Genghis Khan. And, of course, you left the disguise of the cab driver at the museum. <laughs> My compliments to you, sir. You came to the house of Buddy Malpa after the scimitar was stolen. You traced it to Rima 9. Disguised as a cab driver, you found her with it making her flight. You discovered it was a fake. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> of course, you know what happened then. I deduced the same thing you did, that the genuine scimitar was at the museum. Where is it now, Mr. Lash? Where is it? Why, it is here! Watch out, Gino. He'll cut you to pieces. I'll take him, Danny. Lance. Don't. Don't. Say uncle. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Look, Danny. See? I removed this bald-headed toupee, and what do we have? A full head of hair. What a phony you are, Lance Lash. <laughs> Gino Gino Come on, Gino, wake up Come on, come on Huh? You fell asleep, Gino Huh? Yeah Yeah, I must have dozed No calls, huh? Yeah, from... No. No calls. <laughs> What's the matter with you, Gino? Danny. Yeah? I had a dream, Danny. I was a big hero. I went out on a case with you. <laughs> a dream, huh? I want to tell you something, Gino. What? When something happens to you, something real, and then it's over, you know what you have left? Memory. Yeah, Danny. That's right. When a dream's over, and you can remember it, you have the same thing. A memory. That's all anything is, Gino. A memory. Then I got my Christmas wish, huh, Danny? Sure you did. Go on home now. Sure. Merry Christmas, Danny. Merry Christmas, Gino. ring out on Broadway, and the horns blow, and there's laughter. The translux spells out peace on earth, goodwill to men. You read it and believe it, because it's Christmas time, the time for believing in miracles. The crowd pushes you along, and you're part of it. It makes you happy. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Lamont Johnson was heard as Mike Schreck, Georgia Ellis as Rima Nine, Howard McNear as Mr. Zoik, and George Neese as Buddy Malpaw. Ships loaded with vital cargoes for our men at the fighting front are swinging at anchor for lack of radio officers. Men with six months merchant ship radio operating experience since 1935 or any kind of FCC license can get an emergency license to ship at once. Write, phone, wire, or go now to American Radio Association, 5 Beekman Street, New York City. Bill Anders speaking. And remember, the comedy treat that can't be beat is Jack Benny time, Sunday nights on the CBS Radio Network. Jingle 
Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle bells. Faraday. Huh? Faraday, just because we're going out to have Christmas dinner together, don't forget you're driving an automobile, not a sleigh. Now, okay. Blackie, don't tell me you object to Inspector Faraday's being full of Christmas spirit on Christmas no. Eve. No, Mary, I just object to his voice. <laughs> Very amusing. Blackie, I, I know now what I should have given you for Christmas. A sense of humor. If I didn't already have one... How can I tolerate you? Well, somebody should give you both a book of instructions on how to get along. Yeah, especially he. Him. <laughs> you know we're only kidding, Mary. We are. Stop that man! Stop that, that man! What? Hey. hey! Did you hear that, Blackie? Stop, Stop it! Oh, not only here, I see it. Stop it! He's chasing a man up the street. Step on it, Faraday. We can catch him. Don't tell me what to do. Pull up to the curb now, Inspector, and I can grab him. Now, take it easy. Take it easy. Okay, we just passed him. Wait, wait, don't jump till I've slowed down a little. Well, hurry up, or he'll pass us. Now, Blackie, be careful. You mean Blackie, be quick. Well, no, look out. Here goes. All right, you. <coughs> you hold it right here now. Let go of me, man. Let go of me. Sure, as soon as the shopkeeper, Get you just Rob gets here, and here he comes. Hold on to him. Hold on to him. He took four diamond rings out of my store. I... Now, give I me those rings. Give them to me. I don't have no rings at yours, Mac. Oh, yes, you do. Right in your pocket here. I've watched you since you ran out of the store. You couldn't have given them to anybody. I'll hold them while you say... Yeah, look. Okay. I... Yeah. Why, they're not here. No, because I didn't take nothing. See? Well, where are my rings? I want those rings. So go find them. Well, I got news for you. You ain't gonna find them on me. <laughs> Now on to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. He took the rings out of the tray on the counter here, Inspector Faraday. You said that. Yes, but he did. He took the rings and ran out that door. Oh, sorry, Mr. Stacy. Unless I find the stolen rings on this guy here... What can I do about it? Nothing, Faraday. Absolutely nothing. Well, Why have you? Look, Blackie, you and this copper pal of yours searched me twice. Out on the street and here in the store. The rings ain't on me. But they are. You took them. I saw you. If I took a Mac, where are they now? I have a pretty good idea. I hope it's better than pretty good, Blackie, because this guy's made four rings to a pretty good disappearing act. And I know how, too. Yeah. He threw them away when he saw he was being chased. That's a lie. Yes. Yes, he could have done that. He could have. I'd like to bet he didn't. Oh, go ahead, bet. Only let me alone. It's Christmas Eve. I got some place to go. I'll say you have. To headquarters, where I'm going to hold you until I find out who you are. And if you want it for anything else. The only thing I want it for is Christmas Eve dinner. Hey, Blackie. Yeah? You're supposed to be such a genius. What happened? Friend, before I'm through with you, for your Christmas dinner, I'm going to make you eat those words. <laughs> Visitors, back behind the ropes, please. The passengers are coming down the gangplank now. Hey, God. God. Yes, what is it? Uh, my name's Clark. I'm here to pick up a guy who don't speak English. Say not a word of it. Would you help me find him? You know what he looks like? Yeah, yeah, he's a big guy, about 6'6", six, six, maybe 250 pounds. His name's Zabby. Well, there's a big guy coming down the gangplank now with a sign on him. Maybe that's the guy. Oh, yeah, he looks like the guy I want. Hey, Abby. Abby. Yeah, he's coming over, so I guess he understands his name, even if he doesn't understand English. Yeah, I guess so. Thanks. No trouble at all. All visitors behind the ropes, please. He took you for a ride. Sanya Abbey. Polo Grino. Ratsum Clark. Ratsum Clark. Brag. Sitab Abbey, you big jerk. Brag. Ratsum Clark. All right, all right, all right. You don't know what I'm talking about, Abbey, because you don't know a word of English. But you use a gun good. Pretty good, they tell me. And if you do, we'll be speaking the same language, all right. Where are those rings, Martin? Where are they? Listen, Clark, I told you I don't have them. You're lying. I know you took them out of the store because I saw you run out of the place and beat it up the street. Well, if you'd hung around, you'd have seen me nabbed and hauled off the police headquarters. If you were caught by the police, you'd still be in jail. Not me. I ain't got no record, remember? Blackie and that cop Faraday took me down there, checked on me, and let me go. All right, you ran into trouble, but you got out of it. Now, where are those rings? I ain't got them. You took them out of the store, so why haven't you got them? Calm down and give me a chance to tell you. I'll give you just ten seconds to hand over those rings. Ah. I spotted a jewelry store and cased it for you, and I don't try to cross it. Hey, now, look, don't get tough, or maybe I'll just leave the rings lay right where they are. Oh, you will. <laughs> yeah, I will. Hey, let go of me. Sure. After I've taught you a little lesson. Huh? 
Hey, Abby, at Tonum. Brantazwi. Hey, who's that monster? He's a character wanted for murder in Europe. A friend of mine sent him to me for Christmas. Friend, huh? He don't understand no English, but he's tough. I'm going to prove that to you. Yeah? Abby. There's Bruno. Abby, lead a lock. Sena. Hey. Sena. Hey, call this guy off. Call him off. I'll tell you. Call him off. Sena. Almost broke my jaw, clock. Abby. Struf Gondolak. Yes, Ragana. You lay off now, Martin. That is, unless you still have the idea you're not telling me what you did with those rings. Sure, I'll tell you. When the jeweler was chasing me, I see a Santa Claus up the street, ringing his bell and collecting stuff. So? So when I passed him just before Blackie grabbed me, I threw the rings in the big iron pot the Santa Claus had. Nobody saw me, and I know how to get them back. You better. No, I thought for a minute there that you was going to be the only guy in history who gave Santa Claus a present. Okay. What's yeah. the matter with you and Inspector Faraday? Everybody else in this restaurant is having fun, but look at you two. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Mary. And I don't like what that guy Joe Martin did to us this evening. And I don't like the fact that we had nothing on him in the file at headquarters. No, well, eat your dinner, both of you. All right. Well, this is Christmas Eve, and we're supposed to be having a party. When we let Martin go, my appetite went with him. Well... Blackie, what did he do with those rings? Who knows? He took them according to the jeweler, but he got rid of them somehow without being seen. Apparently, he didn't throw them away because we searched the street. Well, when you two see Santa Claus tell him that what you want for Christmas is an explanation of how Martin got rid of those rings. Hey, wait a minute, Mary. That's not a bad thought. Hmm? Hmm? No. I know how those rings were hidden and why they haven't been found. Oh, now, wait a minute, Blackie. What's Santa Claus got to do with that? Martin gave the rings to Santa Claus. What? Blackie, haven't you heard? There ain't no Santa Claus. Um, there was one ringing a little bell on the corner near the jewelry store. Yes, and Martin passed him just a few seconds before I caught up with him. Yeah, mm-hmm. But how would Martin give those rings to Santa Claus without Santa Claus knowing it? By tossing them in his collection bucket, Faraday. Come on, we're getting out of here. Blackie, that Santa Claus won't still be there. No, but all those street corner St. Nick's are working for the Welfare Society. Yeah, so? I'll call them and they'll tell me where we can find the guy. You, you, you think Santa Claus still has the rings, huh? Yeah. If Martin hasn't found him by now and taken them back, in which case we'll find Santa Claus has been clipped. Who is it? Joe Martin, Clark. Come in. It's me. Never mind the introduction. Where are the rings? Well, keep two-ton Tony from the bed away from me. I got the rings right here. Well, where I want them is right here in my hand. Sure, sure. Here you are. Thanks. <laughs> Have any trouble with Santa Claus? Yeah, no, nah, the plan worked great. Good. <laughs> You'll never even be able to tell anybody I was there. Well, I'll be a good little boy. I take you in to see Santa Claus, Faraday, and uh, maybe he'll bring you a nice little promotion. Yeah. Uh, look, he's an off-duty Santa Claus right now. I know. According to the Welfare Society, his name is Henry James. How many more flights are there? Hey, Only this is a fine way to spend Christmas Eve. Uh, we may spend from now till New Year's working on a murder case, Faraday, if the welfare agency was right. Yeah. Uh, and another guy phoned for information about the same Santa Claus just before we did. I know. Oh, finally, here's the door. Yeah, if, he's, if he's in the kind of trouble you claim he is, he won't be in any condition to answer the door. Don't remind me. You and your theories. You had no right to think he's dead. I hope I'm wrong. But I'll guarantee you, if he's not dead, he's tied up or unconscious or... Both. Yeah, well, if you're so smart, you have that all figured out. You ought to be smart enough to know the only way we'll get in is to open the door ourselves. Brilliant deduction, Inspector. Yeah, that's all mine. I'll try the door to see if it's locked. Blackie, how do you think up such wonderful ideas? Uh-oh. Somebody's opened it for us. Oh, sorry to keep you gentlemen waiting so long. I was taking a nap. Are you Henry James? Yes. The Santa Claus on the corner near that jewelry store that was robbed earlier this evening? Yes, yes, I am. Well, I'm Boston Blackie, and this is Inspector Faraday of the police. Oh, how do you do? How are you? I saw you catch the thief, Blackie. You did? Yeah. Won't you come in? Thank you. 
Uh, James. Yeah? Did you have a visitor a little while ago? A visitor? Yeah. Oh, I had no visitor. No one came here and held you up to get back the four stolen rings he tossed in your collection? Why, why no, Inspector Faraday. No one's been here. And my collection bucket's right here on the table, untouched. This collection bucket of yours hasn't been touched, James? Certainly not. Blackie, according to you, Joe Martin tossed the rings in the Santa Claus collection bucket. This is it. I know. According to you, Martin called the Welfare Society and found out where this particular Santa Claus lived. Somebody asked about Mr. James before I called. You don't say. But Mr. James says nobody's been here. Well, he ought to know. And you ought to know how ridiculous you are. Hmm. I've looked through this collection back and there are no rings here. Nothing but coins. Santa Claus wasn't held up here. No rings were ever dropped in his bucket out on the street. Blackie, how wrong can a guy get? And now, back to Boston Blackie. Joe Martin steals four rings from a jewelry store. Just before he is caught by Boston Blackie, he runs down the street and tosses the rings into the collection box of a street corner Santa Claus. Later, at Santa's room, he apparently recovers the jewelry. But when Blackie and Inspector Faraday come to see Santa, Santa, whose real name is Henry James, insists that his collection box has not been touched. As we return to our story, Blackie continues his questioning. Look, Mr. James. Uh, yeah, Blackie. Faraday has gone back to headquarters because he thinks I'm wrong. Well, maybe he's right. But I still say that Martin tossed those rings into your collection bucket. Believe me, Blackie, the collection is right here. It's untouched. Yeah. Yeah, I was about to take it to the Welfare Society, and as I said before, no one's been here to see me. No one but you and the inspector. You're sure you're not playing Santa Claus to Joe Martin? Working with a thief? I should say not. I don't know why you should think so. Because when I called the Welfare Society to get your name and address, I was told there'd been another call inquiring about you just a half an hour before. Is that so? I think that was Joe Martin calling to find out where he could find you. Well, no Joe Martin came here, Blackie. In fact, nobody did. And you've been right here in your room ever since you came back to get out of your Santa Claus suit? Yeah, yeah, Blackie. Every minute, every... No, 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 wait, now, wait. I was out for just a minute on, on the telephone at the end of the hall. Who was on the phone and when was this? Oh, about, uh, about 20 minutes ago. It was a man at the Welfare Society asked me if I'd collected a lot of money tonight. Did the man say who he was? No, no, just that he was an officer of the Society. I, I wouldn't have known him if he had given his name. I work for the Society only at Christmas time. That's it, then. While you were on the phone talking to Martin or some friend of his, either Martin or an accomplice slipped in here and got back those stolen rings. Isn't that possible? Well, yes, yes, it is. My, my back was to the hall while I was on the phone, and... Uh, the door to this room was partially open. And thanks to what you've just told me, Mr. James, this case is practically closed. <laughs> now, Mary, don't stuff me so, so full of pillows that I can't stand oh, up. Blackie, you want to look like a big, fat, jolly Santa Claus, don't you? <laughs> yes, but not like an overstuffed chair. <laughs> You're well padded and your coat's buttoned up. <laughs> now, try on your beard and let's see how you look. Say, if I get clipped with this thing on my face, you might say my assailant is beating around the bush. Oh, Blackie. <laughs> well, <laughs> how do I look? With your cap on, I'd never know you, and that would be all right with me. <laughs> well, uh, you think that uh, Joe Martin will know me? Oh, I don't beard? think so. He doesn't know you as well as I do to begin with. I wish you wouldn't try this, though, Blackie. It's the only thing I can do, since Faraday wouldn't give me any help but Martin's address. Well, in a way, he can't be blamed for not offering you any help. This isn't a murder case. That's true. And besides, you've been wrong all along. According to him, that is. Well. Well, uh, young lady, hand me that sack of phony presents, and uh, I'll put this case in the bag. <laughs> Faraday, homicide. Hello, Inspector. This is Mary Wesley. All right. Let's have it, Miss Wesley. Uh, have what? Blackie's newest theory on how to make me waste my time. Blackie's newest plan isn't going to waste any of your time, Inspector. In That's fact, new. you may not have enough time to get down there and help him. 
Get down where? Well, after you gave him that fellow Martin's address, he got dressed in a Santa Claus suit and went down there alone. What's he bothering Martin for? Well, we haven't he... got anything on him. Well, Blackie is positive that Martin retrieved those stolen rings from Santa Claus's collection bucket. And I'm positive Blackie's positively out of his mind. Well, anyway, I think you ought to go over to Martin's right away. You know the way Blackie's little schemes sometimes get him into trouble. This time I hope he gets himself into plenty of trouble. Well, gee. If maybe it'll get him out of my hair. <laughs> I got to hand it to you, Clark. That yeah. was a slick trick calling that Santa Claus at his house and keeping him on the phone while I sneaked in and got the rings out of his collection. Uh, it was just luck that it worked. <laughs> <laughs> what would we have done, Martin, if he'd taken his collection right down from his corner to the Welfare Society? Yeah, that would have been just too bad, I guess. Yeah, too bad for you. Why? Well, because my boy Abby knows how to use a gun as well as his fist. Hey, look, you got the rings back, didn't you? Yeah, sure, over there on the table. I came to your room to be sure I got him back. Ah. But Abby's going to be my chief assistant from now on in charge of guys who make mistakes. Understand? Okay, I understand. But it's sure going to be tough working with a guy who can't speak English or understand it. I don't want him to be easy to work with. If you can't talk to him, you can't get friendly with him. Trigger men shouldn't have friends. They can... Hey, wait a minute. Who's there? <laughs> Santa Claus! Get rid of him, Martin. Okay. Merry Christmas, son. Merry Christmas. Hey, Satso, beat it. The same Santa, Martin? No. Beat it, Mac. You got the wrong house. <laughs> oh, Merry Christmas, my boy. Can you spare him? Beat a... it, I said. Now, wait a minute, Martin. He's collecting for the poor. Let him come in a minute. Okay. Come on, Santa. Come on in. <laughs> Thank you. And a Merry Christmas. Uh... What do you want from us, Santa? Oh, anything you care to give. Just anything to help make it a Merry Christmas for the poor. Uh, like those four diamond rings on the table there. How about letting me give that beer to you as a touch? Hey, no! Hey, it's Boston Blackie! I thought it was some kind of gag. Watch out, he's going to swing that sack he's carrying. You'll have to swing it faster than that! Yeah. Martin, you really flattened him. Oh. Now get him up on his feet. I've got a gun on him. Sure. Oh, come on, Blackie, get up. Uh, thanks. Hey, what are you going to do with him? You can't kill him here. I'm going to turn him over to Abby and let Abby take him for a little walk. Hey, Abby. This is pretty dangerous, Clark. It'd be a whole lot more dangerous if Blackie stays alive. Don't forget he's seen the rings and I'm wanted for murder out west and Blackie can describe me. I sure can. Hey, Abby. What's the matter with that big hulk? Sanya, Abby. You let Tag Jala Rokisada, Nugula. Sena. Okay, Martin, he knows. Where, <laughs> Sena? Just what kind of language is that? Quiet, Blackie. All you have to know is that Abby's taking you for a walk with a gun in your back. Oh, that's pleasant. Abby Uka. Sena. Come on, Clark. Have Abby get this guy out of here. The cops may not be far behind him. We'd better wait until those carol singers outside go away. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Now, they won't suspect anything. I'll have Abby take them out right now. But what about those carol singers? They're just outside the house. I'll tell Abby to keep a gun on Blackie and shoot him if he opens his mouth. Hey, I got a better idea. Make Blackie sing and keep him singing. Then it'll seem like he's happy going down the street with Abby. Yeah, uh, good idea. Uh, I'm really not in good voice this evening, gentlemen. And you won't be in good condition when Abby gets through with you. Quiet, Martin. Hey, Abby. Sura Retsum, Blacky Lingo, Finistuda, Bang Bang. <laughs> bang Bang. Thank you, Retsum Clark. All right, all right. Come on, get going. Start singing, Blacky. Oh, I start singing. A command performance, huh? Eh? Oh, I didn't know you had such an appreciation for my talent. Na, 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 so long, Blackie. So long. So long. I said keep singing, so well, Blackie. If you stop so once more, Abby will shoot. I won't stop then. So long. So long, sucker. To ride Merry the Christmas. One horse open <laughs> uh, Merry Christmas. Jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun is to ride in the one horse open sleigh. Give me help. I can't yelp, but I'm on a spot. Where we'll go, I don't know, but I know I'll be shot. Hey, hear what that guy said? When I passed, 
jump him fast. Oh, listen to my squawk. Hey, listen to those I have words. to yeah, sing listen, this silly talk. thing, because he'll kill me if I talk. Hey, I don't think that what guy What you shit. speak to him is Greek. He doesn't know a thing. Come on, let's jump the guy. So Watch out for gunning. I Target. just pass you by and let you hear me sing. All right, I'll get him. Get him. Get him. Get him. <laughs> here, here, let me out of the fellas. I can take care of myself now. Hey, nice punch, mister. <laughs> nice going yourself, fellas. For understanding those words I was singing. Okay, but at first we thought you were nuts. Hey, here comes a police car. Hey, Blackie, you all right? Well, Faraday, you decided to give me some help after yeah. all. Yeah, yeah. When Miss Wesley phoned me and said you were going through with your crazy plan, I thought I'd better get down here and keep you out of trouble. Who was the big guy on the sidewalk? The guy working for Martin and his buddy who was going to give me a one-way ride into the country. Oh, great. He's safe here. Let's go into the house and get Martin and his friend who wanted to go out west. Yeah, come on. Oh, look. There they go making a break for it. Yeah. Well, let's break up that break. Stop, you. Stop in the name of the law. Look out, Barney. They're trying to shoot their way out. This will stop him. Yeah, that made him suck. Come on, let's grab him. Watch out, Blackie. That guy's got a gun. You bet I have. You're not going to get a chance to use it, though, boy. I've got this one. Take care of the other one, Faraday. Don't tell me what to do. Okay. Okay, okay, lay off, copper. No more, Blackie, no more. Okay, Martin, no more. If you give me those rings. Clark's got them. Come on, you, Clark. Let's have them. Yeah. Okay, here they are. Here. One, two, three, four. They're all there, Faraday. Good. And Martin, Clark, and their pal Abby are all yours. Wow. You take these guys back to my squad car, will you, Blackie? You're after this chase, I'm tired. Oh, great, old man. Yeah. I go all out to catch these guys, and you're the one who's all in. <laughs> <laughs> Morning, Turkey. Uh, Inspector Faraday? Yeah, a little bit, Miss Worthing. Mm-hmm. And Blackie, how about you? Oh, I'll have more of everything, Mary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if, if turkey were brain food, I'd say you had plenty of room for it, Blackie. Now, Inspector, this is Christmas Day. You and Blackie <laughs> promise not to fight. <laughs> Mary, he's still upset because the case we just worked on didn't involve a murder. <laughs> you, you talk as if I like murder, Blackie. You, you must like it, Inspector. The way you've murdered that turkey. Mm. Very droll. Mm, you mean very droll, don't you? <laughs> now she's telling me what I mean. This thing must be contagious. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Inspector, I'm glad the stolen rings case wasn't more complicated than it turned out to be. Mm. Yeah, I'm glad we got it solved before Christmas was over. <laughs> me too. Well, Inspector, men generally put a ring on a finger. But because Clark and Martin stole some rings, we put the finger on them. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is Dick Calmer. Every week after we finish one of our Boston Blackie shows, I indicate what I hope we'll be doing the following week. Uh-huh. Look, Blackie. Now, just a second. This time, it's going to be a little different. Uh, Blackie, what's with you? What is going on here? Just a minute, Faraday, please. Mm-hmm. Friends, I said I'm not going to tell you what we will be doing next week. That's good. I'm going to tell you what we hope you will be doing. Very confusing. Isn't almost everything confusing to you, Inspector? Did... Uh, listen, everybody. What for? Now, patience, Faraday, patience. Next week, I hope you and everyone you know and love will be enjoying the best holiday season you ever had. Yeah, now... That the next year will be a great year for all of you. Could I say something, Blackie? You, Inspector, can say anything, and you probably will. Well, all I say is, Merry Christmas to our listeners, Blackie. Merry Christmas to them all. Well, genius, how about one of your usual taglines? <laughs> Not this time, Faraday. Mm-hmm. All I say to everybody from Mary Wesley and all our cast is, until our next meetings, season's greetings. Diamond, private detective. (laughs) 
Hello there, this is Diamond. Well, it's Christmas Eve. And every year about this time, my business takes a big nosedive. People usually pack up their troubles and start unpacking colored lights and Christmas tree ornaments. So tonight, instead of telling you about one of my hair-raising exploits, we're going to tell you a Christmas story. So with apologies to Mr. Charles Dickens, we'd like to bring you an adaptation of one of his most famous stories, The Christmas Carol. Now, I'd uh, better explain something first. This version isn't exactly the way you've heard it many times before, because the particular type of characters I usually get mixed up with, this story is written to fit their talents and characteristics. Different from the Dickens original, certainly, but we feel that this story could easily happen today, anywhere. Like maybe right here in New York, on a little side street just off the boundary. So now I'd like to introduce our characters. Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge will be played by my good friend and guiding hand of the 5th Precinct Homicide Division. Lieutenant Walter Levinson. Walter? Oh, this. <clears throat> the character of Jacob Marley will be played by one of my dearest friends and constant companions. Otis, that's you. Yeah. Oh, uh, Sergeant Otis Loveloon. Loveloon. <laughs> Walt. Oh, I'm sorry, Helen. Uh, Tiny Tim will be played by our corner newsboy. Johnny Wallace. Uh, Tiny Tim's mother will be played by my red-headed gal friend. Helen Asher. The rest of the characters will be played by members of the 5th Precinct Police Station. Officer O'Reilly. Officer Lund. Officer Lefkowitz. Sergeant Miller. <laughs> the music will be furnished by the 5th Precinct Police Band, directed by Patrolman Worth. And now, our version of the Christmas classic, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Once upon a time, there was a nasty old guy named Ebenezer Scrooge. He was nasty, all right. He didn't like anything except maybe all the dough he could get his hands on. Scrooge had a little business that he started with his partner, Jacob Marley. The outfit was known as Scrooge and Marley Loan Company. But one day, poor old Marley just up and keeled over. So the boys along the big street gave him a nice funeral, and old Scrooge took over the business. Well, Marley had been dead for seven years, and Scrooge lived alone in his little room over the office. And for a hobby, he hated everybody. He had a young guy working for him by the name of Bob Cratchit. Bob had a wife and four kids and made just enough to make ends meet. Scrooge used to ride him all the time. When it got so cold the polar bears complained, Cratchit would turn on the little heater. And Scrooge would say, Cratchit, what do you think you're doing? Turn on the heat, that's what I'm doing. My fingers look like popsicles. Well, I don't care if they come in six delicious flavors. Every time you turn on that heater, it costs me money. Business is not good, so get back to your work and turn off the heat. Oh, now look, Mr. Scrooge, I'm freezing. Now, this pen ain't guaranteed to write under ice. I tell you once more, get back to your work. Okay, Mr. Scrooge. I don't know why you worry about business. Why not just put up a sign, turn the joint into a skating rink? Now, this was no time for any decent guy to act like that. It was Christmas Eve. Along about five o'clock into the office came Scrooge's nephew, Fred. Well, Merry Christmas, Bob. Oh, Merry Christmas, Fred. You'll get back to your work, Cratchit. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Merry Christmas, Uncle. Oh, swell. Merry Christmas. Uh, humbug. Humbug? Yeah, humbug. My old man didn't like Christmas, and that's what he used to say. Humbug. Okay, humbug. But it's still Christmas, and I don't see where you get off not liking it. This is supposed to be the time everybody gets with it. Everything stops. It ain't much good, and you put your arm around the next guy, you tell him Merry Christmas. I'll put my arm around you with a hammer on the end of it if you don't lay off that goodwill stuff. Look, what's with you? What have you got against Christmas? You show me a way to make a hundred bucks every Christmas, and I'll fall in love with it. Every time the holidays roll around, nobody pays their bills, and they all run around like they own the Chrysler building. Look at you. Sixty bucks a week, and you're coming on like Rockefeller. Well, sure, I make a lousy sixty bucks, but it ain't easy. But once a year, something happens with everybody in this big world. Well, nearly everybody. Because this is a day that somebody else started to make things right for us. And he had a really tough time doing it. It's more than just remembering. It, it, it's feeling. It, it's all around you. Christmas has got to be merry. Don't you get it? You want me to be merry? Well, sure. Then go get some of these joyous clients of mine to pay off their loans. The missus asked me to invite you over for dinner tomorrow. Now, don't hold your breath. Okay. 
Merry Christmas, Bob. Merry Christmas, Fred. Merry Christmas, Uncle. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Uh, humbug. <laughs> Late that evening, Scrooge went upstairs to his room, the room where Jacob Marley used to stay. It was dark in the little hall, and when Scrooge reached for the door, he looked up at the big brass knocker and saw... (laughs) Holy cow! I could have sworn that was old Jake's face in the knocker. I must be working too hard. So in he went. A little shaky after seeing Jake Marley's face, but he just passed it off his nerves. He closed the door and locked it, then went over and sat down in front of the fireplace. He got a fire going and started to relax. But every tile around the fireplace started looking like Jake Marley's face. Oh, now, come on, Ed, old boy. You've got to get hold of yourself. This is ridiculous. And I haven't touched a drop in weeks. He got up and walked around the room a few times and went back and sat down again. He stretched, rested his head on the back of the chair. From somewhere, a bell started chiming and Scrooge sat straight up in his chair. He heard something else, too. Something from downstairs. What the... Oh, now, what is that? What's going on? Who's that? Come on, who's out there? Then all of a sudden, it came right through the wall. Marley! Jake Marley. Oh, no, no. I I got to stop eating lobster. Oh, it couldn't be. Hey, what's with you? Who are you? Jake Marley. Who else? You're dead. The deadest. But nevertheless, Jake Marley. His ghost. You are very sharp today, Scrooge, old boy. I don't believe it. You got eyes, ain't you? Yeah, and I got a bad stomach, too. That's who you are. Nothing but a bad case of indigestion. You don't think I'm a ghost, huh? Okay, maybe a good scare will change your mind. Oh, no, 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 no. Stay away from me. I believe you. You sold on the idea? Yeah, yeah, but why do you got to come to see me? Regulations. Every man is supposed to live his life and help his buddies. If he don't do it while he's alive, then he's got to do it after he kicks off. Oh! Now, stop that. Hey, what's with all those chains and things you got wrapped around you? All these? Well, this here chain is like my life. Each one of these links is something I did wrong. But why do you have to hold it around with you? Why don't you check it someplace? Screw Joe boy. When we was in business together, I never took time out to do any good. I just kept making a buck and figured that was enough. Well, now I got to pay for it. I got to haul this chain around and try to make up for all the things I didn't do when I was alive. But why come to me? Because you're going to end up just like me unless we do something in a hurry. Now, I haven't got much time, so you better listen. No, I don't want to be like you. I'll listen. Okay. You're going to have three visitors. You're going to be haunted by three spirits. Oh, no. It's the only way you can keep from being like me. When you hear that bell strike one, the first one will be here. Well, I got to be going. You won't see me again, but you remember what I told you. So long, Scrooge, old boy. Your goosebumps can relax now. After the ghost took off, Scrooge just refused to believe it. Ah, nuts. It's ridiculous. Humbug. Then he climbed into the sack and was soon snoring up a storm. When Scrooge awoke, it was still dark, and the bell from the church on 53rd Street was striking 12. He laid awake listening and thinking to himself. Just a dream. Ghost. Bah. Finally, he dropped off again and slept for about an hour. Then the big bell struck one. One o'clock and I don't see no ghost. I knew it was something I ate. All of a sudden, a big light flashed in the room. The first of the spirits stood before him. Oh, Jake was right. Are you the first spirit that Jake said would come to haunt me? Yeah, you know it. Well, who are you? Me? I'm the ghost of Christmas past. Yeah? How long past? Your past. Come on, we're going to take a walk. Well, where are we going? Just relax. I'm running this tour. Well, we'll let me get my pants. Uh, you got them. Hey, they're on me. With that, the ghost of Christmas past grabbed Scrooge with the hand and they both flew out of the window. 
Scrooge nearly lost his upper plate. But before he could yell for help, he was standing in front of a dirty, ramshackle old tenement building. You uh, know where you are? Sure, I know where I am. This is where I was brought up. Even the garbage cans are the same. You had a pretty tough time when you were a kid, didn't you? The toughest. I wasn't very big, and the rest of the kids in the neighborhood were. I had more black eyes than a crow. You want to go in? What for? To see your folks. My folks died a long time ago. They're in there now. Come on. Well, the ghost took old Scrooge into the building and showed him a Christmas years past when he was a child with his family. Sure, it was tough living in two little rooms like that, but Scrooge remembered how wonderful it really was. <laughs> What's the matter, Scrooge? Huh? Oh, I've got something in my eye. You were pretty lonely when your folks, uh, when they... Yeah. You know, there was a young kid that came around earlier this evening and sang some carols. I wish... Yeah, uh, what do you wish? Oh, nothing. Come on. I want to show you another Christmas. The spirit showed him another Christmas and still another... And you know, no matter how tough Scrooge remembered his childhood had been, it always seemed that Christmas was wonderful. Then the spirit took him to a building down to the river where Scrooge got his first job. They went inside and seated behind a desk, Scrooge spotted Fezziwig. Well, I'll be darned. It's old Fezziwig alive again. And there's Dick Wilkins. He was a good boy. We got along great. He liked me. Okay, everybody, it's Christmas Eve. You can knock off and have yourself a good time. You better lock up, Dick. Sure, right away, Mr. Fezziwig. Yeah, don't look so unhappy, Ebenezer. It's Christmas. Come on home with me and tear into a big turkey. All locked up, Dick. Yes, sir. Ready, Ebenezer? Yes, sir. Okay, let's go and have Merry Christmas, you two. Yeah, Merry Christmas, Mr. Fezziwig. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Then the spirit took Scrooge over to Fezziwig's house, and they saw the wonderful party that Mrs. Fez Fezziwig had gotten together. Scrooge watched and remembered, and the spirit said, Wasn't Fezziwig a stupid, sentimental old goat? Oh, yeah. Well, let me tell you something. He was a great guy, he was. You know... What, Scrooge? I was just thinking about Bob Cratchit, who works for me. I think I'd like to do something for him. You know he's got a wife and four kids? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Four kids. Come on, I've seen enough. Okay, but you've got to see these things if you want to get squared away. And believe me, brother, you need squaring away. Let's go home, Scrooge. Before he knew it, Scrooge was back in his little room and the spirit was gone. Scrooge was pretty beat and he climbed into bed and dropped into a heavy sleep. <laughs> What's that? It's two o'clock. Hey, that light in the other room. I got burglars. Hey, Scrooge. Scrooge, come on in. Who's that? What are you doing in the other room? Come on in. Take a look. It's pretty nifty. Hey, what is this? What have you done to the room? It looks like Macy's window. Where'd you get all the holly and the mistletoe? And how'd you get it in here? You like it? Oh, for Pete's sake, a Christmas tree. Who are you? The ghost of Christmas present. Now, don't tell me you don't like the way I fix things up. I work pretty hard. Oh, the second ghost. Okay, take me wherever you want to go. But believe me, the next time I try the train. Come on, let's go. Now, what do you see? Well, I see bright colored lights. People having a lot of fun. Kids on sleighs. See that building over there? The one with the big wreath on the front door? I got 2020. That's where Bob Cratchit lives. He works for me. Hey, look. There's Bob now. Yes, going into the house. Up all those stairs to the fifth floor. And he's got his little boy on his back. Tiny Tim. Yeah. Got polio last summer. Pretty sick little boy. I know. Bob said he'd need a lot of care if he was ever going to walk again. Let's take a peek. Hi. Hello, honey. You and Tim have a good time? Best. Didn't we, Tim? Yeah, Dad. 
We watched all the kids in the block on their sleds. Mom, will I ever be able to ride a sled? Of course, Tim. Won't he, dear? Sure thing, Roughneck. Next Christmas, you'll be out there doing belly whoppers with the rest of them. Dad, what's the matter? Your eyes are all wet. <laughs> Nothing, Tim. I just got some snow in them. Want some dinner, Tim? Oh, Mom, stew for Christmas? I'm sorry, Tim. Oh, that's okay, Mom. I like stew. Bob, will you please say grace? Can I say something first, Mom? Of course, Tim. What would you like to say? God bless us. Everyone. What's the matter, Scrooge, old boy? Got some snow in your eyes, too? Tell me something. Well, sure, if I can. What about Tiny Tim? Oh, can't say for sure. If his old man makes enough money next year to get the right doctors, little Tim will get along just fine. But times are tough, aren't they, Scrooge? Yeah. Now the spirit of Christmas present took Scrooge to many places and showed him a lot of happiness and a lot of misery. And finally, back to his little room, the spirit was gone. Oh, I don't know whether I can take much more of this. Then the new ghost drifted in. This was the worst yet. He was really done up for haunting. He was all dressed in black with one arm sticking out and pointing right at poor old Scrooge. This was the last one of the spirits. Scrooge's knees sounded like castanets on a reducing machine. Okay, okay, you don't have to tell me. You're the ghost of the Christmas that hasn't come yet. You I'm really scared of. The ghost took off of Scrooge right after him. The city disappeared and Scrooge found himself in the outskirts of town standing in the graveyard. The night was howling like it was mad. And as Scrooge looked down, he saw... Hey, what's this? What's this stone? The black spirit stood still and pointed. So Scrooge leaned down and pulled away the bushes and saw it was a tombstone. There's a name here. Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, no, no. Look, not this. Believe me, I don't want this. I know I've done wrong, but I'm not kidding. I really know what Christmas means. It doesn't mean just today or tomorrow. It's every day. Every day of your life. I swear I'll do better. Only take me away from this. Let me try. Let me try to make Christmas right for me and everybody else. Please, don't let this happen. Give me another chance. Well, don't just stand there. Put your arm back and you'll catch cold. Well, say something. Suddenly, Scrooge dropped to his knees and reached out for the spirit. But something happened. The spirit started to shrink. Then it collapsed. And when Scrooge looked up... What the hell? My bedpost. My own bedpost. I'm home. Oh, thank goodness. I lived the past and the present and the future, and now I'm home. Hallelujah. Spirits, wherever you are, believe me. From now on, things are going to be different. Oh, yeah. And thanks. Hey, boy. Yeah? What day is this? It's Christmas. What's with you? Christmas? Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. I haven't missed it. The spooks did it all in one night. Boy. Yeah? Oh, it's you, Mr. Scrooge. How many papers have you got? I don't know. One. Well, here's five bucks. Throw them away and go have yourself a Merry Christmas. Gee, thanks, Mr. Scrooge. And a Merry Christmas to you. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, boy, say that again. Thanks? No, 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 the other. You mean... Yeah, that's it. Merry Christmas. Okay, okay, I'm coming. What's the matter with you? Can't you see the store's closed? Look, mister, this is... Eb. Ebenezer Scrooge. Merry Christmas, Barney. Huh? Hey, you been drinking? Not a drop. Well, what's the matter with you? Ain't you going to wish me a Merry Christmas? Wish? Oh, oh sh- sure, sure. Come on in. Uh, wife's upstairs with her mother, but I got a bottle in the back. I think maybe you better have some, something, something strong. But look, your grocery store's closed, but you could still sell me a turkey, couldn't you? Well, I don't know. You got a couple? They'll just go to waste. Hey, what do you want a turkey for? You've been eating at the automat every Christmas for the last seven years. Oh, it's not for me. But nevertheless, I have been invited to my nephew Fred's house for a Christmas dinner. 
Well, then who's the bird for? Bob Cratchit. You know, the young guy that works for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. How much are you going to charge him? Here's 20 bucks. That ought to be enough for the bird. But, no, no, no. It ain't worth that much. Yeah. Are you sure you ain't been into something? Well, if it's too much, give the rest to your kid and have him deliver the turkey to Cratchit's house. Huh? Here's the address, and don't tell Cratchit who sent the thing. Okay? Okay. Merry Christmas, Barney. Yeah. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Well, old Scrooge went back to his rooms and took, an out, took out an old blue suit out of the mothball. He shook it out, put a few creases in it, and went out into the street. The old boy was really with it. Everybody he passed, he greeted them with, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Eh? Oh, oh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Scrooge went to church and gave a large donation, and Father McCarthy nearly forgot his sermon. And then Scrooge went out on the street again and down into the Bowery. God bless you, sir, and a Merry Christmas. Isn't it, though? He kept walking and having a great time. Later that afternoon, he arrived at his nephew's house. Well, what the... Merry Christmas, Fred. I've come to dinner. Oh, my gosh. Here, I brought you some presents. Oh, my gosh. Now, don't thank me. It's Christmas, remember? Oh, my gosh. Next morning, Scrooge was early at the office. If he could just catch Cratchit coming in late. And he did. Bob was a good 21 minutes late. Cratchit? Oh, no. You're 21 minutes late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Scrooge. I had a big evening last night. You did, huh? You know when I told you if I caught you fancy footing it in here late again. Okay, so I'm can. You think you got it coming? Oh, I'm too tired to argue, Mr. Scrooge. Jobs are tough enough, and I hate to lose this one, but... I'm just too tired. A uh, raise would help, huh? That's the silliest question of the year. Then you got it. It's in that envelope. Well, what? Yeah. And maybe after we see how the funds are, we can do something about Tiny Tim. Oh, I, I don't get it. A uh, raise? You want to do something about Tim? I don't get it. Sure you do, Bob. Haven't you heard? It's Christmas. Now, go on home. Take the day off. Uh, take the week off. Oh. Come back when you feel like it. Merry Christmas. Uh, Mr. Scrooge? Yeah? Merry Christmas. And Scrooge really did it. He was as good as his word, better even. He made it the merriest Christmas ever. And later, things got better, and he took care of Tiny Tim. And sure enough, Tim was out on his sled the next Christmas, doing belly whoppers with the best of them. Every Christmas thereafter, all along the big street, it was said, if anyone knew how to make Christmas merry... Old Ebenezer Scrooge was that one. And I hope that can really be said about all of us. Just like Tiny Tim said. God bless us. Everyone. That's right, Tim. God bless us. Everyone. That was wonderful. Not quite the way Dickens wrote it, but it meant the same thing. Oh, you really like it, baby? Oh, I loved it. No reason in the world why old Scrooge couldn't have been living right here today. You've got the spirit, and that's what counts. How did you like it, Walt? Rick, I gotta hand it to you. It was really great. Uh, Lieutenant? Yeah, what is it, Otis? Uh, how'd I do in the play? You were magnificent, Sergeant. Y you know... I bet if I studied for a couple of weeks, I'd get me a part on Broadway. To be or not to be? That's the question. Oh, no. Now, Walt, leave him alone. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, Monsieur Otis. Huh? Wouldst thou accompany me over to the punch bowl for a short flagon of nectar? Sure, I would. See you later, Helen, Rick. <laughs> yeah. Come on, Barrymore. Let's see if the punch bowl fits your head. <laughs> oh, I feel lovely. You want something to eat? Uh, wait a minute. What's the matter? Listen... They're out here by this window. Come on, let's go listen. Oh, 
<laughs> oh, wasn't that wonderful, Rick? Oh, it sure was. Rick, sing something with them. Oh, no, honey. I don't want to loss up the end. Please, Rick. Come on. All right, all right. I, I tell you what I'll do. Everybody usually sings Christmas songs about snow. I'm going to sing one about sunshine. It's called Melikaliki Maka. Melikaliki Maka? Well, it means Merry Christmas in Hawaiian. In Hawaiian? Sure. It's a brand new song. They love it over there, and we we'll love it here. Melikaliki Maka is the thing to say, and how holy Maka he that's our Christmas greeting in a Hawaii and a happy new year too. With the hope that Christmas may be green and bright, the sun to shine by day and all the stars that night. Meli Kaliki Maka is a wise way to say Merry Christmas to you. Pennsylvania, radio station WBRE today is celebrating its silver anniversary of serving the people of the coal country with better programming. From all of us in Hollywood, congratulations to NBC affiliate WBRE on 25 years of broadcasting and best wishes for another 25. Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective, will return to the air on a new day and time, Sunday, January 15th. Till then, this is Eddie King relaying our best wishes for the holiday season. Now hear Home for Christmas and Hop Along Cassidy on NBC. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... with the greetings of the season. I hope you like the tree. I put up a bit of holly, too. And mistletoe, of course, right there over the door. There are so many things to enjoy at this time of year. The warm, friendly spirit, that's most important. The time to be with family and friends. There'll be a lot of holiday traffic, too, as people make the rounds of visits or travelers are making their way back home. On a lonely road in Ohio, two such travelers are about to have the most harrowing experience of their lives. The snow is getting heavier, Skip. I wish you'd slow down. I hope we make it before dark. Oh, I sure don't want to get stranded in this tomb. Oh, no. Oh, oh, no. Skip, what's the matter? We're skidding. I can't control her. Skip, do something. We're sliding into that boat. I'm doing all I can.
mystery drama, A Holiday Visit, was written especially for Radio Mystery Theater by Bob Jorn and stars Lloyd Batista and Diana Kirkwood. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Saturday on CBS Television, one of the most star-studded television events of the year. Washington, D.C. sparkles with distinction as Lauren Bacall, Mikhail Beryshnikov, Art Buckwald, Joe Namath, Pat O'Brien, Beverly Sills, John Travolta, and many more perform to salute this year's honorees. Leonard Bernstein, James Cagney, Agnes DeMille, Lynn Fontaine, and William Team Price. The Kennedy Center Honors, a celebration of the performing arts. Saturday at 9, 8 Central and Mountain on CBS Television. Listen to this list of very different people. Ronald Reagan, Goldie Hawn, Mary Cunningham, Sugar Ray Leonard, Robert Redford, Baron St. Helens, Jerry Fowler, Pat Benatar, Lake Valesa, Richard Pryor, Beverly Sills, Dan Rather, and Brooke Shields. What they have in common is their People magazine's choices as the 25 most intriguing people of 1980 in the special year-end double issue of People magazine on sale right now. People's double edition, packed with news, celebrities, and the 25 most intriguing people of 1980, plus losers of the year, names to watch in 81, and other surprises. Don't miss a word or a picture in People's year-end double issue. It's something special. What if the world happened in December? Brought to you by your local Navy recruiter. In December 1775, the first flag unfurled aboard an American warship was hoisted by Lieutenant John Paul Jones on board the flagship Alfred at Philadelphia on the occasion of placing the Continental Navy in commission. George Washington resigned his military commission in December of 1783 and retired to his estate at Mount Vernon, Virginia. December 1851, over 30,000 volumes in the Library of Congress were destroyed in a fire. The highest bridge in the world was completed in December 1929. The Royal Gorge Bridge across the Arkansas River in Colorado suspends 1,053 feet over the gorge. In December 1941, Japanese aircraft attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Six ships were sunk, 12 damaged, 150 aircraft destroyed, and 2,334 were killed or missing. The surprise attack forced the United States into World War II. That's what happened in December. To find out what's happening in the Navy today, call toll-free 800-841-8000. In Georgia, call 800-342-5855. What are your plans for the Christmas holidays? Entertain friends or relatives? Going home to visit parents, perhaps? This is always get-together time. A time when people go home. Home to the families they've left behind as they've made their own way in the world. Joan Bartram made her way from a small town in Ohio to New York, where she worked for a while as a secretary, and then married Skip Bartram, an oil company executive. She hadn't been back to her home in Ohio in 12 years, so it was a particular thrill for Joan when Skip came home one night and said... How'd you like to go home for the holidays? See your folks. Oh, oh Skip, I- I'd love it. But can we afford it? Well, the company's sending me to Toledo for a new training program right after the holidays, so the trip is on them. Oh. We'll just leave a little early and be with your folks for Christmas. Oh, what a surprise. Oh, I'm going to call Mother this minute. You don't want to just drop in on them and make it a surprise? And have them fade away? No, no, I want to give them something to look forward to. Oh, yeah, well, maybe you're right. Oh, it's been 12 years since I've been home, and you've never... Hello? Hello, Mother? Oh, Joan! How are you? Just fine, dear. Mother, Mother, are you sitting down? No. Why? Listen, Mother, get Dad over to the phone. I want him to hear my news. Henry, come here. Joan, are you pregnant? Oh, no, Mother. All right, dear. Your father's listening. I'm coming home for Christmas. Coming home? Yes. Yes, Skip has to be in Toledo after the holidays, so we're leaving early. In time to be with you for Christmas. That's the best news I've had all day. Joan, I... Your mother's doing her thing. She's... She's starting to cry. And so am I. But I have to hang up now. I'll let you know when we'll arrive. Okay, darling. We'll be waiting. When can we leave? Well, I'd like to get away by Saturday. We'll have to drive. I'll need the car in Toledo. Let's see. We ought to get to Runyonville by, well, the 23rd. <laughs> Shows the end of the interstate. What do we do when we turn off? Well, let's see. Uh, 
We go north on 84, it looks like. Yes, yes, north on 84 to Hamilton, then 42A to Blue Mountain, and to keep on that to Redmondville. Oh, I don't know. It looks as though the interstate keeps on going. Well, look there. Yeah, according to the map, though, there's a proposed extension. Well, it's been finished since the map came out, I guess. What if we stayed on this? Well, we'd go straight to Ryanville. It looks as though we'd save about, uh, about 20 miles, too. <laughs> so we're in luck. We'll stay on it. It looks as though, well, maybe it's your folks a lot sooner than we thought. <laughs> starting to snow. Oh, we're going to have a white Christmas. Well, I hope it doesn't get too thick before we hit your folks' place. Skip, how far have we come on this highway? Oh, about 40 miles. Have, have you noticed anything strange? No, uh, you're thinking the same thing I am. Hmm. There hasn't been a sign or a turn off since we got on this road. Yeah, I noticed that. And come to think of it, I, I don't remember seeing any cars passing us in either direction. Doesn't Natural. <laughs> well, if this road's going anywhere, they're keeping it a secret. Well, I'm getting a little uneasy. Maybe we ought to turn back and take Route 84 like we planned. Oh, I hate to do that after we've come this far. Now, this road's got to come out someplace. I see we've got about an hour before dark. And the snow is getting heavier. I, I wish it'd slow down. I hope we make it before dark. I don't want to get stranded in this. Oh, 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 oh the skid, the skid, what's the matter? We're skidding, I can't control it. Oh, let's get do something. Oh, we're, we're sliding. I'm it's doing all I can. Oh. Oh. You put a little more tinsel on the tree, Harriet, and it's going to topple over. <laughs> I don't see how you can sit there so relaxed. Why are you so nervous? The children said they'd be here sometime today or tomorrow. They should have been here by now. Only because you think they should be. If anything was wrong, they'd call. You know that. Oh, no, you're right. I'm just so excited about having our Joan home for Christmas. <laughs> I can't relax. Well, I think I'll take a stroll in the snow. Need anything from downtown? No, dear. I've had everything in for days. I just wish they'd get here. They will, Harriet. They will. Now, you stop worrying. Worrying isn't going to get them here any sooner. Oh, oh my head. Joan. Joan, are you all right? Well, what happened? Oh, can, you, can you straighten up? Oh, here, here, let me see. Uh, try, try twisting it a little bit this way. Oh, oh. oh there. Oh. There, it's free. Oh. How do you feel, huh? Dizzy. Oh, we, we crashed into the boulders. Uh, can we, uh, will the car move? I'll pray. Oh. Oh, thank heaven. Well, if I can back her off. Yeah, I, be, I better get out and take a look. Um, oh, that does it. What's the matter? Uh, two flat tires. Oh, no. And only one spare, naturally. Oh, dear Lord, what are we going to do? We're miles from anywhere. Uh, at least the snow's letting up a bit. <clears throat> oh, we can't just sit here on this, this ghost road. Oh, well, where will we walk? Hey, Skip, look. A light. Oh, yeah. Oh, about... Half a mile away, I'd say. It must be a town. Hey, do you think you can make it on that leg? Oh, yes, yes. I'd hop on one foot to get out of here. Well, we can phone your folks. Tom will be a little delayed. We can probably get the car towed in. Well, it looks like we'll have to stay till morning. Well, maybe Dad can come pick us up. We can't be far from Lundinville. We can pick up the car tomorrow or the next day. Oh, that's Christmas Day. Oh, that's right. <laughs> What are we sitting here chatting for? Come on, come on, let's move. It's so quiet. No cars in the street at all. 
Store must have sent them all home, I guess. Oh, let's try that grocery store. They're sure to have a phone. Well, they can tell us where to find a garage, too. At least we can get the car off the road for the night. It's so still. Hello? Anybody here? It's so dim. One bare bulb. Well, pretty skimpy merchandise, too. Hello? Wow. Whew, place seems deserted. Yeah. I don't see any payphone. Or any phone, for that matter. Hello? Anybody here? Oh, well, we'll, we'll go someplace else. There's got to be a restaurant or a tavern in this town. Hey, come on. Well, I, I know this isn't Runyonville. Oh, I hope not. Looks like a quaint little place, but awfully deserted. Boy, they must pull the sidewalks in at five in the afternoon. Oh, look at those stars. Wow, I haven't seen them that bright in a long time. There, there don't seem to be many stores. <laughs> Mostly houses. Well, we're not on the main drag. Maybe we better go ask directions at that house there. No sense wandering around a strange town. I, I guess we should. I'm sure they'll let us use their phone. I'll, I'll call Dad Collect. Hey, listen. Hear that? Singing. Of course, it's a carol concert. That's where everyone must be. Well, come on. Let's see if we can find them. Oh, oh I give up. I don't know where that music's coming from. We've covered so many streets and nothing. Yeah, no one. Oh, hey, honey, you're shivering. No, I'm scared. Well, there's a hotel across the street. Let's go there and use the phone. There's got to be one there. This is a ghost town. There's no use wandering about anymore. It's a ghost town in the middle of Ohio. I wonder. You know, you might be right. It could be one of those, um, restorations. An antique village, and if it is one, then there's got to be somebody around. A caretaker or a watchman or someone. I mean, let's try the hotel. Oh, I was wrong, I guess. The hotel is just as deserted as everything else. And still no phone. Oh, I wish I had that CB radio Paul offered me. I always thought they were a nuisance, but that sure would have gotten us out of this mess. Hey, come on, come on. Let's look around upstairs. Every room's empty. Not a stick of furniture anywhere. Yeah, it's about what I expected. What was that? Well, it, it sounded like something hitting the roof. Oh, Skip, let's, let's go back to the car. I'm too frightened to stay here. This place is just too spooky. Yeah, come on, you don't believe in ghosts. It's not ghosts I'm afraid of. There's another one. Well, you something sailed past the window and landed on the ground. I I'm going down to take a look around. I'll come with you. I'm not staying in here alone. Can you see anything? Not yet. There's nothing out here uh, except a couple of green logs. Over there, see them? Green logs? Yeah. Moss covered. Looks like they've been laying there for years. But, Skip, there's no snow on them. If they've been laying there for years, they'd be covered with snow. You think that's what hit the hotel? Well, how many logs this big don't just fall out of the sky? Just take me back to the car. Now, now honey, there's no sense getting panicky. But we're alone in this town or amusement park or whatever it is. And at least there's shelter. We'll stay here for the night, and we'll just try to get to civilization in the morning. You want to stay here? We might be murdered in our sleep. As if I could sleep. Well, dear heart, there's nothing else we can do. We're sleeping in the car is foolish when we're... Uh-oh. The lights. Every light went out. Well, that settles it. We're not going anywhere now. But the whole town's out. There's no 
not a light anywhere. Yeah. It seems to be clouded over, too. Hey, the stars are gone. Yeah. Come on. Come on, let's go back inside. Mm. We'll be safe in there. <clears throat> we'll curl up in the lobby furniture and try to sleep. Uh, I won't mm. shut an eye. Wondering who or what turned off those lights. To paraphrase a popular joke, where were Skip and Joan when the lights went out? Not only in the dark, but in a strange Midwestern village. And just two days before Christmas, a time when they should have been enjoying the warmth of a friendly fireside, the pleasure of holiday decorations, the music of a Christmas carol, things that most of us are enjoying these days. But for them, isolation in a cold and darkened hotel. We'll learn what this curious town holds in store for them when I return shortly with Act Two. Person to person Heart to heart Together we can move the world If we each do our part By helping care For the children Nourish and to heal Those in need Care For the children of the world If we each help one needy child Tomorrow for children everywhere. Please send your check or money order to CARE, Box 576, New York 10156, or local CARE office. This is Delta Airlines. We're ready when you are, Chicago. Ready with Delta Nonstop to Tennessee and Carolina. Ready with five Delta Nonstops a day to Memphis. Ready with three Delta Nonstops to Nashville. The most going. And an early evening nonstop to Knoxville. Ready with nonstops and crew jets to Raleigh Durham and Greensboro High Point, Winston Salem. Chicago for flying with us. Delta is ready when you are. Joan and Skip Bartram faced the prospect of spending the night in a deserted hotel in a strange and darkened town. A town apparently without inhabitants. Could it be a restoration of some kind? A sort of Midwestern Williamsburg? Under normal circumstances, it might be a lovely place to spend the Christmas holiday. But Skip and Joan are anxious to get to her parents' home and friendly family warmth. They spent the night in the sparsely furnished lobby of the hotel. And now, it's morning. Skip! Skip! Huh? Wake up, honey. Oh. It's daylight. Oh, oh, my aching back. Oh, that's the hardest couch in the world. Uh, I didn't sleep all night. Come, come outside. I, I want to show you something. Oh, no, can't you bring it in here? Oh, stop being silly. There are footprints in the snow, and they're not ours. Footprints? Yeah, look out the side window there. Yeah. Yeah, they go around the back of the hotel. Well, that means somebody's around here. Come on. They're, they're small prints. It must be a child or a woman. They lead toward that barn. It's funny, I, I didn't hear or see anyone. I was awake all night. Well, there aren't any prints leading away from the barn. So whoever made them is still in there. Quiet. Not a sign of 
life anywhere. Well, let's go in. It's not like a private house. Anybody here? It's so dark and dingy, Skip. Skip, let's go back out. I don't like this. Well, somebody's got to be here. I mean, the footsteps stopped at the door. Then why won't they answer us? Hey, listen. Well, that was somebody's up in the loft. They're coming down those stairs. Oh, good, good morning, ma'am. Uh, we're looking for someone to help us. Mercy. Where did you come from? Well, we had an accident with our car last night. We skidded into an embankment. Oh, my word. We, we found the whole town deserted, so we spent the night in a hotel. Oh, how curious. There aren't any beds in that hotel, you know. We slept, or rather stayed, in the lobby. I'm Skip Bartram, and this is my wife, Joan. We were wondering... I'm pleased to meet you. I'm Mrs. McKinney. Oh, we were wondering if this is some sort of uh, a restoration. I mean, there were lights on last night. And, and we heard Christmas carols. Oh, yes. Isn't the music lovely? What do you mean by a restoration? This is Taylor Town. But there's no one living here. You're the only person we've seen since last night. Yes, they've all gone. Each season, a few more left. My husband went last year. I'm the last one here. You live here all alone? All alone in a deserted town? It's my home. Uh, well, uh, could we uh, use your phone, Mrs. McGinnis? Joan wants to call her dad to pick us up, and... Well, I've got to get a tow truck for the car. Oh, mercy me. There's no garage or tow truck. Oh, but there's a pay phone at the railroad station. We never had phones in any of the houses. Just wait till I finish upstairs, and I'll show you where it is. I don't know if it works, though. I think it's just there for a fact. I wonder what she meant by that. Well, who knows? I, I just feel better now that we've met another human being. She seems friendly enough. But a little strange, don't you think? Uh, naturally. A little living alone in a dead town. A ghost town. I wonder how long she'll be. But we could find that railroad station ourselves. Oh, let her be hospitable. A few minutes won't matter. Uh, Mrs. McGinnis? Mrs. McGinnis, are you almost finished? That's strange. Well, I'll see. H has something happened to her? Mrs. McGinnis? Skip, what's the matter? Well, she's not here. The loft's absolutely empty. <laughs> well, there's no way she could have gotten out of that barn. Oh, the... There are no windows in that loft. Well, she did. Unless we just imagined we saw and talked with her. No, no, she was there all right. She she just gave us the slip somehow. Oh, look, there's the railroad station. Oh, pray that that phone works. Well, I'm not counting on it, but, well, it's worth a try. <laughs> it looks like one of Bell's first pay phones. Uh, Skip, have you got a dime? Yeah, I think so. I uh, hear you are. Here goes. Well, huh? so far, so good. Oh, I got a dial tone. Yeah, at least something works in this town. Well, it's only ten after nine. One of them's bound to be home. Ah, it's ringing. Yeah, they're probably looking out the windows, wondering where we are. Hello? Is somebody on this line? Oh, Dad! Oh, Dad, thank you. Heaven, I reached you. Who is this? It's Joan, Dad. Joan? I can hardly hear you. Speak up. Dad, it's Joan. We've had an accident with the car. You'll have to pick us up. Where are you? Well, you'll have to talk louder. A place called Taylor Town. It's practically a ghost town. Do you know where it is? Taylor Town? Look, we'll wait for you in front of the hotel. How long will it take you? Uh, well, it's uh, 
ten after nine now. About one hour. Oh, you'll be here. Oh, I can't wait to see you, Dad. Dad? Dad? Oh, the line's dead. What's the matter? You look concerned. Dad sounded so funny. I, I expected more of a, a reaction. He was so matter-of-fact. He didn't ask for details or anything. Well, I'm sure he figured he'd find out the details when he picks us up. Mm, yes, I suppose. You know, dear, I have the strange feeling I know this village. Well, not the village so much, but, but the houses. The houses look so familiar. Well, a lot of small Midwestern towns have that turn-of-the-century look. I guess so. Oh, we used to go shopping in, in Fairmont, and it was full of the same big houses we had in Runyonville. You know, with porches around the whole front and little filigrees under the eaves. <laughs> like that place on the corner. Exactly. And look who's on the porch. <gasps> this is McKinnis. Hello, dear. Hello. Where did you come from? I don't get many visitors anymore. We wondered where you went. Where I went? I've been here all morning. Sweeping the snow, you know, got to get it off the porch before it freezes. Oh, what will you to Taylor Town? Skip, she doesn't remember us. Uh, uh, Mrs. McGinnis, we met you. Do you know my name? Mercy, who are you? Mrs. McGinnis, we... We met you at the barn this morning, and you said... The barn, you see? Oh, there's a nice one behind the hotel. Want to come in for some hot coffee? Takes the chill off. Yeah, thanks. We'd like that. Well, come along in, then. I'll pick up the pot. Yes, I don't know. Well, what harm can it do? Look, we, we've got at least an hour to wait for your dad. We might as well spend it in a cozy kitchen. Yeah, I guess you're right. Come out to the kitchen. Hot coffee in a minute with some fresh scones I made myself. She keeps a neat house. And so you know, old-fashioned. It's lovely. Yeah, oh. a pretty start. <sighs> Come in and sit down at the kitchen table. I don't have much, as you can see, but there's always something to share. You're planning on moving here, you said. Uh, no, Mrs. McGinnis. I, we told you we had an accident with our car. Oh, that's too bad. But I just called my father... He's coming to pick us up. You, you called your father? Yes, just now, on the phone at, at the railroad station. Oh, mercy, that is a miracle. I didn't know that phone ever worked. And we're happy to enjoy your hospitality while we're waiting. We still can't understand why there's no one else in town. You live here all alone? It's my home. Oh, it's not bad living alone. I get by. Well, we thought it was some sort of restoration. I don't know what a restoration is. A restoration is an old town or house that's been restored to look the way it did years ago. Oh, this town's looked like this from the beginning. Ever since it came from Scotland. The town came over from Scotland? It's an exact duplicate of Taylor Town in Scotland. The streets and the houses and all the furnishings came from Scotland. Oh, mercy, don't ask me how long ago when you were born here. I guess so. You guess so? Well, I've never been anywhere else. Oh, you're not eating the scones. Uh, I guess we'd better get over to the hotel and wait for Dad. Thank you so much for your hospitality, Mrs. McGinnis. Oh, well, come along. I'd like to see a modern automobile. I'll just get my shawl. I won't be a minute. She shouldn't be living alone like this. It's made her completely confused. Oh, I know. But, well, there's nothing we can do, though. And she kept offering us scones, and the plate was empty. Well, she's living in the past. Well, I wish she'd hurry. I, I don't want to miss Dad. Well, we've got lots of time. If he said an hour, well, we've only been here a few minutes. Oh, I, I wonder what's keeping Mrs. McGinnis. But why don't we just go on? She'll follow us. She knows where the hotel is. Well, Mrs. McGinnis, you about ready? 
Mrs. McGinnis. Oh, not again. Oh, talk about the Cheshire Cat. Come on. Let's get out of here. You want your eggs scrambled or fried this morning, Will? Well, fried is easy. Oh, I do hope we hear from the children soon. I'm getting awfully nervous. I thought they'd at least arrive last night. But not to go. It's not like Joan. Well, that just means there's nothing wrong, Harry. If they'd had trouble, we'd have been the first to know. Something's not right. I just feel it. Well, it's ten after nine. If they're not here by noon, maybe I'll call the police. Oh, oh. I'll get it. Hello? Hello? Is it Joan? Well, there seems to be a voice, but I can't make it out. Joan? Oh, it's a bad connection. I don't know if it's Joan or not. Oh, dear. Hello? 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 Uh, It's no use. Whoever it was will have to call back. We'll just have to wait. Be frightened. I wasn't before, but now, now I really am. There's something evil here. I mean, no people except that crazy Mrs. McGinnis. But your dad's on the way, huh? I wonder. It's been two hours now. Well, maybe he had trouble. At least he knows where we are. Doesn't he? How do I know? All we do is, is ask each other silly questions. I'm cold and I'm tired and I'm hungry. Oh, Joan, Joan. We may just die here. Don't you realize that? We may just die here. Joan. Stop it. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, hon. I had to stop you. I'll, I'll, I'll get control of myself. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, we just have to wait. Taylortown, expecting her father to pick them up any minute. But Joan's father, as we now know, didn't get the call. And he and his wife are waiting to hear from Joan. It looks as though Skip and Joan won't be with her folks for Christmas after all. Or at all, for that matter. We'll just have to wait to see how it turns out when I return shortly with Act Three. Monday, high-flying comedy and suspense on CBS television as Freebie and the Bean go after drug smugglers in the sky. I got plenty of sources over the border and a foolproof delivery system. When a pretty pilot bails out at 10,000 feet, it's time for Freebie to learn how to fly. Now, what's going on? What are you doing with my airplane? I'm going to get a citation for this, Bean. Trust me. Too bad. Pull it out. Give it some power. Freebie and the Bean, a special night, Monday at 8, 7 Central and Mountain on CBS television. Running a ski lodge is a family affair. It takes all of us working together to keep it going. So when the cold and flu season hits, it's good to know we've got our bear. Bear aspirin is the only pain reliever our family uses. We've never found anything we could buy that works one bit better to relieve the aches, fever, and sore throat pain. Believe me, in our family, when a cold or flu makes the rounds, it's rest, fluids, and all we need is Bayer. Use only as directed. Terry's Lincoln Mercury in Orland Park, the nation's largest volume Lincoln Mercury dealer, is now hosting a used car sellathon. There are more than 140 late model used cars to choose from. And every Terry's preferred used car purchase includes a 12 month, 12,000 mile national warranty. As a special bonus during Terry's sellathon, every used car sold will be Rusty Jones rust proofed absolutely free. A $175 value at no extra cost. Sound unbelievable? Take your choice of a few remaining 1980 Cougars, each with a range of options and each priced at only $5,999. Shop early for the best used car money can buy. That's Terry's Lincoln Mercury. Over 140 used cars, free Rusty Jones rust proofing, and the 12-month, 12,000-mile national warranty. No other quality used car dealer could offer more. Terry's Lincoln Mercury is on 143rd Street, 
just one block east of LaGrange Road in Orlin Park. This is WBBM Chicago. Mrs. McInnes for a second time, Skip and Joan have gone to the hotel to wait for Joan's father. It's a cold December afternoon, and it's been a long wait. What time is it? Uh, ten after two. I'm going to phone home again. Maybe there's a reason Dad was delayed. And after that, I'm going to call the state police. I, I should have thought of it before. We're in a real emergency here. They'll tow us out. Come on. Dad comes after we've gone. We'll ask Mrs. McGinnis to watch for him. Mrs. McGinnis? Mrs. Houdini, you mean. I wouldn't trust her to give Dad a message. Yeah, well, we're getting out of here as fast as we can. Your father or the police, whichever comes first. Okay. Okay, here, try your folks again. It's dead. No dial tone. Nothing makes sense in this place. Well, it's no use. It's just hands dead as... Hands up! Hands up! Stay right where you are! Skip! She's got a gun! You better be taken off! M- 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 Mrs. McGinnis, wh- why the gun? How do you know my name? Uh, uh, a lucky guess. Why are you pointing that gun at us? I want you out of here now. I don't trust strangers. Mrs. McGinnis, you were so hospitable to us before. Why are you... Before? I've never seen you before in my life. Now get out of here. Start walking. Where to? To wherever you come from. I don't allow strangers here. This is a nightmare. You don't scare us. Because I know in a couple of minutes you're going to disappear. What are you talking about? You've been popping up and vanishing all morning. In a few minutes you'll just disappear poof. So we are waiting right here. Oh, come on, Joan. She means it. But where can we go? Back to the car. She wouldn't really shoot us. She couldn't. Keep going. We're not taking chances with that crazy old woman. But we'll freeze out here, and Dad won't find us. You'll have to pass the car on the highway. (laughs) Nothing makes any sense here. Skip, look back. You were right. She's gone. Uh, We'll be okay here. The motor works. I'll just turn on the heater. Come on, hop in. Oh, there's there's more damage than I thought. The whole front end's caved in. What a Christmas this has turned out to be. Oh, honey, we'll get out of this. Let me get the heater going. We might as well get some holiday spirit if the radio still works. Oh, I'm so bush. Mm, Oh, you didn't sleep all night. And I didn't get much myself on that wooden couch. I hope Dad comes soon. Yeah. Yeah, we can't keep the motor running all day. Well, I hope Mrs. McGinnis doesn't show up again. No, she wouldn't follow us out here. But lock the doors anyway. spotted your car and called it. Oh, thank the Lord for that. How'd you get on this road? It's officially closed. Well, there weren't any signs about that. It connected with Interstate 40 and we just stayed on it. Had the bad luck to skid into boulders. This extension isn't due to open until next summer. Where are you heading? Romanville. My parents live there. We're going to home for the holidays. You wouldn't have gotten there on this route. 
It ends about 100 yards up ahead. I'll radio for a tow and get you folks to Runyonville. Now, when did you go off the road? Last night. You been here all night? Well, no, we went into Taylortown. Taylortown? Yeah, right up the road. But it's a ghost town, except for a crazy old woman who lives there. Uh, I better get you folks to the hospital first. Just a checkup. You know, possible concussion. Oh, no, no, no. We're all right. My wife's ankle was twisted, but once we got out of the car, she was okay. We do not need a hospital. You say you spent the night in a place called Taylortown? Yes. There is no Taylortown around here. I've lived here all my life. And there just isn't any place called Taylortown. But right up the road. Look for yourself. We were there all night. I'm sorry, ma'am. And maybe you'd better look. Oh! Oh. There's nothing there. There's no village at all. No, ma'am. Road ends at that vacant field. Not a town as far as you can see. How are they, Doctor? Well, no sign of concussion at all. No injuries except abrasions on the woman's ankle. Yeah, well, what about that story about spending the night in a village called Taylortown? Uh, hard to say. Huh, maybe they did. Uh, they must have imagined it. Yeah, they show no signs of exposure. They only think they were there through the night. They made it on the road only a couple of hours. The helicopter spotted them two hours ago. They went to a village named Taylortown. They were hallucinating. Well, hallucinations, quite common in extreme circumstances. Mirages in the desert. Anxiety can produce them. Then you think they spent the night, like they said, in a village that isn't there? Well, they had an emotional experience. Physically, they're fine. I see no reason to keep them here. They're better off going home to the woman's parents. Driving up. Joey, Mother! Oh, Are we glad to see you? Oh, Mother! We were just about to send the police out looking for you when you called from the hospital. Oh, I'm going to send that state trooper a whopping Christmas gift. I got his name and badge number. Skip, it's so good to see you. Oh, same here. Thank heaven you're both okay. Come on in, everybody. No use standing here in the cold. What happened, Dad? We thought you were coming to pick us up in that place called Taylortown. Uh, that's what puzzles me. We never heard from you. The phone rang early this morning, but no one was there. Oh, I know I had a bad connection, but I was sure I heard you say you'd meet us. You seemed to know where we were. You mentioned this Taylortown. There's no place like that around here. Where exactly were you? I've never heard of it either, but we were there. I know the trooper thought we were loony. Oh, I don't know what to say about all this. Why don't you both just relax? I've got a buffet all ready. We'll have cocktails and you can tell us all about it. That's a good idea. I'll get your suitcases up to the guest room. We had to leave all our gifts in the car, but they're towing it in tonight. So we'll have them in time for Christmas. Oh, they don't matter, dear. Having you here and safe is what's important. Now, you just relax and enjoy the tree while I get things ready. You must be famished. Oh, it's so good to be home again. And at Christmas time, everything's so pretty. Yeah. Ooh, that's some tree. I just love the decor. Skip. Look. What? Under the tree. Look, come closer. Oh. Village set out under the tree. Cardboard houses. And look, look at the hotel. It's Taylor Town. Mother and Dad got this set when I was a child. I'd forgotten it. Every house, every street is just the way it was. The railroad station, the little store, and oh, Mrs. McKinnis's house. Uh, J- John, wait a minute. We weren't. <laughs> we couldn't have been there. 
That's what the trooper said. What happened to us? Oh, hey, I'm getting the chills. Look at those pine needles from the tree. Those are the green logs that hit the roof. I wonder. What? Mrs. McKinnis. Could she be... Uh, I... I think she disappeared for the last time. Well, what should we tell Mother and Dad? I, I don't know. I, I think we've said enough. I don't know what happened to us last night, but... We better stop talking about it. I guess you're right. Well, here are the hors d'oeuvres. You can pour the wine, Will. A holiday toast, everybody. <laughs> oh, I see you admiring the village under the tree. Oh, we haven't set it up for years. <laughs> we used to put it up regularly when Joan was a child. Lately, we've just had a table tree. Ah, but this year, with you both coming, we went all out. Big tree, everything. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and it's lovely. <laughs> the detail in those houses is exquisite, isn't it? Yes, yes, very, uh, very realistic. It was imported from Scotland. It's been in my family for years. Well, here's to a wonderful holiday visit. Merry Christmas, everyone. If there were an explanation for everything... Where would the magic in life be? I think we'd all lose interest if everything were cut and dried, neatly packaged, just right. We need a bit of amazement now and then to soften the blow of reality. Skip and Joan left reality for a brief period, and it gave them something to remember all their lives. I'll be back shortly with a closing holiday thought. Winston Churchill, Albert Einstein, Nelson Rockefeller, Bruce Jenner... Thomas Edison, Leonardo da Vinci. These people, and many other brilliant, talented, creative people, overcame a form of learning disability. This is Pat Collins for the Foundation for Children with Learning Disabilities. There are over 10 million children in this country who are learning disabled, and they can be helped to overcome their learning differences. We owe it to them and to ourselves. Some of these children can be our country's future doctors, lawyers, artists, scientists, and politicians. You can help children with learning disabilities. Please send a contribution to SCLD, 99 Park Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. That's SCLD, 99 Park Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. are twinkling everywhere. Every city, town, and village sports its holiday decorations. Busy shoppers push through the stores, and children wait wide-eyed for that magical evening. It's Christmas time. We hope your holiday season will be merry and bright, and may all your wishes for the new year come true. Merry Christmas. Our cast included Lloyd Batista, Diana Kirkwood, Joan Shea, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I know you swore at me. What kind of a chump do you take me for? Well, oh, look, I'm sorry about the accident, but you know I didn't mean it. I, and besides, you know, you and me, well, we used to like each other. What are you talking about? Look, I was the best safe cracker in the city, and you was the smartest detective on the force. You was out to get me, and I was out to beat you. But there was nothing personal in it, eh? Each one of us was only doing his thing. Hey, man, that's why you got to get me out of this. Why should I? Because you know I didn't kill him. I don't know anything of the kind. Oh, look me in... Uh, I was going to say look me in the eye and say that, but I can't because you can't. Oh, you know I'm not a killer. And you know that I didn't kill him. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... welcome this special eve, of course. If you look in Webster's Dictionary under the word miracle, you can read the definition, an event or effect contrary to the established order of things. A wonder or a wonderful thing. This is the story of a miracle that took place at Christmas time. The very best of all possible times for miracles. And it begins with an ad which has appeared for ten years in the Dawson City Times and the Thomasville Courier. We'll begin the advertisement with, If the owner of a Santa Claus suit rented to Jennifer Swallow will present his copy of the receipt to me, Jasper Crown, he will be re- Oh, you'd have to include your address and your phone number, etc. Of course, Jenny, we'll include that. He will be remunerated to whatever degree he asks, up to a million dollars. Does that seem fair? Oh, it isn't fair. It's silly. The rental was less than a dollar. Why should it be worth any more than that? Maybe you'll never know, but I will. And everyone else who hears this story will know. Our mystery drama, A Very Private Miracle was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Howard Da Silva. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Sinus flares up. I'm clogged up, headaches, my whole face hurts. Help. Set for Sinoff. Sinoff helps relieve your pain, helps clear congestion, ease sinus pressure and post-nasal drip. Sinoff does it all. Set for Sign-off. And for the fastest known form of congestion relief, Sign Off Spray, S-I-N-E-O-F-F. Sign Off. The sinus medicines in the bright red box. Here. For occasional use, only as directed. In 1921, Dr. Banning and Dr. Best discovered that insulin prolongs life for diabetics. Their discovery has enabled countless millions of diabetics to lead almost normal, productive lives. But unfortunately, insulin does not cure diabetes. It's time to cure diabetes, and it's time we all help. If you can give help or need help, call your local American Diabetes Association. I'm Gerald Ford. I thank you. If you've decided this is the year to give a fabulous fur for Christmas, choose from one of the largest, most exciting collections in all America at York Furrier of Elmhurst. We all know there are vast differences in fur, differences in quality, styling, and price. So most people rely on the experience and reputation of the furrier for guidance in selecting the perfect gift. Perhaps that's why smart Santas have depended on York Furrier for almost half a century. York's master craftsmen have a love for their business that shows in every fur creation. York Furrier invites you to visit the wonderful world of fur and choose from over 2,000 beautiful designs, including one of the largest selections of men's furs in all America. And, of course, they offer full exchange privileges. York Furrier at 107 North York Road in Elmhurst. Now with special holiday hours. Weekdays 9 till 9, Saturday 9 till 5.30. York Furrier, the finest furrier in the world. This is a story of a very special time and a very special love affair between a bright and artless ten-year-old and a bitter, soured man who made himself old before his time. But however it ends, it begins with hate. What was that, Arthur? Uh, A rock through the window. That's an ugly mob outside. No goods and adequates ingrates. Because you've taken their livelihood away from them. My livelihood as well. I can't go on losing money with the mill. 
Since Robert walked out on me, I don't need any more. But Thomasville does. Good Lord, it's the only real industry we have left to keep the town alive. Are you my lawyer or theirs? You know whose lawyer I am. My friend or theirs? Well, that's a question which gets more and more difficult to answer. Jasper, it's Christmas. And Robert had good ideas for the mill. I don't want to hear any more about the mill or about Robert, my son, or my daughter. Most of all, I don't want to hear about Christmas. That cheap, tawdry, pagan celebration. There, at last. The riot squad. They'll break up that no-good rabble. That's my Christmas present to them. Finally, the police have dispersed them. Cowards all. A mob has no courage. Well, what are you going to do about the window? Close the room off. Heaven knows there are enough other rooms for me to wander through alone since I've been deserted by my family. Well, that's scarcely fair to Emily. Emily. Did I once really have a wife? Was there some warmth in this house? While my sister lived. Well, she's dead. Too many years ago for me to want to count. There's no one left but my housekeeper and me. At least Mrs. Murchison hasn't deserted me, as you want to. Go then, Arthur, go. It's safe now. The papers are all signed. Well, I won't execute these till after the holiday. The day after Christmas. The day after Christmas is Sunday, so I can't do anything till Monday. Very well, but the execution is signed, sealed, and delivered. When I sell the mill, I'll be not a millionaire, but a multi-millionaire. Or do you mean that crowd of hicks the police just chased away? You think I'm frightened of them? Oh, I didn't mean physically, and I didn't mean concerned either. I mean terrified for your immortal soul. Oh, don't trouble. I'll let myself out. Oh, Mrs. Murchison, if I don't see you again before the great day, Merry Christmas. And a Merry Christmas to you, Mr. Daly. Who was on the phone, Mrs. Murchison? Oh, such good news for you, sir. It's little Mary herself. What did she want? Sure, she's still on the phone waiting to tell you herself. I have no wish to talk to my daughter. Ah, but when you hear her news... What uh, news? Well, uh, um, she, she wanted to tell you herself. If she's leaving that damn foreigner and coming home alone, I'll talk to her. Otherwise, go and hang up. Without well, listening to what she has to say. There's only one thing I want to hear from her. An apology. Oh, you're not going to talk to Miss Mary? No. I wanted to save the news for her to give you. Oh, but now sure I have to say it myself. It's a baby she's going to have. She wanted you to know you're going to be a grandfather. No, some penniless foreigner. No, thank you. You can tell Mrs. Blumenthal it won't work. She's still as completely cut out of my will as her brother. When you hang up the phone, you can bring me a cup of tea. I'll be in the library. Oh, the good Lord favor me and put the words in my mouth. Uh, uh, Mary, sweetheart, forgive me for being gone this long. That's all right, Merch, honey. Is Dad there? Well, uh, my Vernon, to tell you the truth, he's off to having a little bit of a lie down, and, um... Well, it's all right. I know what he's lying down on. Any reconciliation with me. I thought maybe he's the time of year and the baby... Did you tell him about the baby? Well, I... I didn't want to. I, I wanted it to be your surprise, but, uh... Okay. Forget it. I get the whole picture. Maybe I knew before I tried again. Now I know it's hopeless. Merry Christmas to you, Merch, love, anyway. And a happy new year. Oh, Mary, my darling. Oh, what's the use? How long can you fight? If he just wasn't so stubborn. If only Mr. Crown could forget himself and accept someone else into his heart. Come in. It's your tea, Mr. Crown. Oh, thanks. Just put it on the table. Yes, sir. Well, was there something else? Yes, Mr. Crown. This next Christmas would be my 25th that I've served your family. Oh, in heaven's name, spare me the Christmas spirit. It's choking me. Well, it's choking some of the rest of us, too, Mr. Crown. Everyone has a limit. You're not alone in that. I've just been talking to Mary, and I've lived through a long, difficult time in your family. 
I'm given my notice. Before dinner? I honestly don't care if you ever eat again or live. I just have time to catch the next bus. I'll send someone else to clear out everything that's left of mine in this house. I want no part of it or you ever again. A little while later, the front doorbell rang. With Mrs. Murchison gone, Jasper was tempted not to answer it. But when it rang again, some secret urgency drew him down the long corridor. On the walk, he winced. His elbow pained him, and the arthritis in his right leg jumped and sent shivers. Every ache and pain he had ever known seemed to assail him, till the magic moment he opened the door and saw, standing on the stoop, her freckles burning bright in her snow-white face, her pigtails stiff in the icy wind, Jennifer. And even though he didn't realize it, magic was upon him. Yes? Who are you? Jennifer Swallow. What are you doing on my doorstep? If you please, Mr. Crown, I'm freezing to death. Oh, you came here of your own free will? What do you want? I have a business proposition to put to you. Not interested. How do you know if you haven't heard it yet? Don't be rude. You're talking to your elders. Excuse me. I didn't mean to be rude. I'm just anxious. Anxious about what? My proposition. What I want to talk to you about. All right, what is it? I'm too cold to tell you here. My father says that no gentleman keeps a lady waiting. You're no lady, you're just a child. And you're no gentleman. You're a... A what? You're a kind man who's going to offer me shelter. <laughs> Very well, before we both freeze to death. Come in, come in. Thank you. You shouldn't have let me in, you know. But you weren't. Get in. My father says you should never let a salesman get his foot in the door. Are you a salesman? Oh, no. It's just an expression, you see. In a manner of speaking, so to speak. What is it you want, young woman, young lady? My name's Jennifer. Jennifer? I'm not interested in names. All I want to know is what your business is here. Shouldn't we go into the parlor? No. You're kind of old. I thought you might want to sit down. Well, maybe I'd better. It would be much cozier. Very well, then. Follow me. Even though it is quite cold, it's very nice weather for this time of year. What? I'm just making conversation. My father said... I don't believe it. Believe what? I don't believe your father ever gets a word in edgewise with you around. All right. It's warm in here in the library. There's a fire. You can sit over there on the other side of the fireplace. Thank you. So many books. Ah, a lot of knowledge in the world. If you young folks would take time to pick up some of it. Now, Miss, uh, Miss Jennifer, just what is it you want? Well, it's at the church, you see. Nobody is working this year on account of you closed the factory down. You blame me for that? Oh, no. I mean, that's your business, of course. But it meant somebody had to do something special. About Christmas, I mean. I might have known it. <laughs> Sending a child here to blink her innocent eyes at me. Who put you up to this? Who sent you here to ask for money? No one. I just want to... Don't lie. For a moment, you almost fooled me, young lady. But I might have known there was something behind this. There is, isn't there? Well... What is it? Present for the church? Oh, no. I already won those. I'll win the booty. You... You what? I said I already got those. From win the booty. You know. No, I don't know. What is win the booty? It's on television. Don't you watch it? I don't have a television set. Oh, it's fun. The man asks you questions, you see. And then you have to answer them. And that's what you did? Of course. Why are you so surprised? I'm just amazed that you didn't ask him most of the questions. So you won some prizes, eh? Oh, scrumptious ones. So you see, we don't need you for that. You don't say. But what do you need me for? Well, see, the presents are to be handed out tomorrow night at Christmas Eve. And we have no Santa Claus to do it. I wanted you for that. 
Of course. Because I'm rich and you thought that I might bring some extra presents. That wasn't it at all. Somebody else had an idea you should come here and ask me? No, sir. This was my own idea. Really? Just what's the matter with the guy who knows all the answers? Who? Your all-wise father. Oh, he isn't here this year. What's keeping him so busy? A first-class son of a gun. A, a, a what? His superior officer. My father's in the Navy. Both of them are. Who? My father and the first-class son of a gun. That isn't exactly what he called him, but I promise not to repeat the other. <clears throat> I see. Well, if it can't be your father, what's the matter with your minister? Nothing. I mean as Santa Claus. Oh, <laughs> too skinny and too serious. He never understands a joke. He's really an old stick. But what on earth would make you think of me, child? You don't just want me to be Santa Claus. You have an ulterior motive. What's an ulterior motive? Uh, you, you want me to do something else, don't you? Oh, that, of course. You admit it. Oh, sure. We don't have a budget for the Santa Claus suit. So I thought if you'd be him, you could afford to rent it. Where are you going? I'm opening the door for you to leave, Jezebel. My name isn't Jezebel. Well, that's a matter of opinion. Just keep heading for the front door. Then you won't be a Santa Claus? I'm afraid I'm not the type. You could be just perfect if you'd let yourself go. I wish I could believe that. Oh, couldn't you? Only one way I could. Well, how is that? You get me the Santa Claus suit, and if you still want me, I'll be your Santa Claus. Honest to Pete? Honest to Pete. Well, I'll try, but it's going to take a miracle if I do. You know, I wouldn't put it past you. Jasper Crown remained with his hand on the door. One part of him congratulating himself for having resisted that elfin charm. The child was just trying to use him and his wealth, as people always were, egged on by her elders, no doubt. But another part of him, lonely and forgotten and rusty with disuse, cried out for her return, for a miracle. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Here's a tip from your Better Business Bureau. Are you in the market for a used car? If you are, it would be wise to shop around until you get a feel for the market. It's important for you to find out if the car is covered by a warranty. A used car warranty is limited. For example, it may cover the first thousand miles or 30 days. Remember, however, the warranty is as good as the dealer who backs it. And you check his reliability with your local Better Business Bureau. Also, remember that careful inspection is the key to enjoying a used car. Be sure and look for rust. Check the tires, the shock absorbers, and the operating controls. And incidentally, it's also a good idea to take a test drive. You see, by giving the car the once-over before you buy it, you're protecting yourself against a faulty purchase and a lot of headaches after you've bought it. This has been a tip from your Better Business Bureau. Something good is about to happen. It's Christmas time at South Lake Mall. For you. It's Christmas time at South Lake Mall, one of the largest malls anywhere. And not just because you'll find over 135 stores and 6,000 fully lit parking places. South Lake Mall is a giant when it comes to savings. You'll find Christmas specials galore. And wait till you see the way they've decorated the mall and the stores. A Christmas wonderland. So this year, do all your Christmas shopping at South Lake Mall. Your friends do. Something good is about to happen. It's Christmas time for you. Make your Christmas shopping fun and easy. Shop at South Lake Mall, I-65 and US-30, Miraville. Never underestimate the power of Jennifer. That night, Jennifer broke open her piggy bank and counted her capital. Two dollars and twenty-three cents. 
The following morning, she bought a return trip ticket on the bus to Dawson City, which cut into her budget to the tune of $1.62. Once she got there, she set her jaw and started to comb the city. It was well after lunch when suddenly the freckles were dancing across her nose and her pigtails vibrating with delight. For there, just as she told herself there had to be, was a sign saying, Santa Claus suits for rent, dirt cheap. The proprietor was a wonderful man with a jolly round face and bristling white eyebrows and a shock of snowy white hair. As Jenny said afterwards, she almost wished he might be persuaded to come and play Santa Claus. Hmm, but that's really a silly idea. He lives too far away. I beg your pardon, miss. Did I say something? Well, there are only two of us here, and I I didn't say anything, so I think it must have been you. There I go again, thinking out loud. You couldn't, could you? Or didn't I think that part out loud? Uh, what part? About wanting you to come and be Santa Claus in Thomasville at our church tomorrow evening. Oh, I'm afraid I couldn't. Some other people are expecting me. Oh. But I can rent you a suit, you know, a, a Santa Claus suit. Do you do you see one that you like? Well, there are so many. What's this one made of? Ah, red velvet with ermine trim. <laughs> you you like it? It is nice. How much would it cost to rent it? Well, now, that's a, a very handsome suit and quite cheap at the normal rental of a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars? Too much? Oh, much too much. Well, now, uh, uh, how much were you thinking of? Sixty-one cents. Sixty-one oh, <laughs> cents, eh? Now, now, isn't that a coincidence? As a matter of fact, right down beneath the counter here, I may have just the thing. Ah, oh, yes, uh, here we are. Well, let's see, boots, belt, hat, pants, and a uh, tunic. And, of course, the whiskers to go with it. And the price happens to be just right. On the nose, as the saying goes. Sixty-one cents. It is pretty old and tattered. Yes, it is. Seen a lot of use. I have to admit it isn't in the best of repair. But it's the genuine thing. Well, it is pretty ratty. But I'll take it. After all, the price is right. And the kids who are going to see it won't notice the condition. Because to tell you the truth, these days, our clothes are pretty ratty, too. Well, righty -o. I'll, I'll wrap it all up. And while I'm getting it ready, you can uh, uh, sign your name right here. What's that for? Well, I'd like to get this suit back. You you might be surprised, but sometimes I have a, a little trouble. <laughs> this way, if you shouldn't return it, any time I want to claim it, I'll have proof that it's mine. <laughs> Why doesn't Mrs. Murchison answer that bell? Oh, of course I forgot. She's gone. Oh, rotten tarnation. I have to answer it myself, I suppose. I'm coming, damn it. I'm coming. Oh. Well, you don't have to pull it out of its socket. It's please. It's so cold. I'm freezing. Oh, it's you again, is it? Well, what is it this time? Look, I got it. I got it. Got what? The Santa Claus suit. I thought you'd be happy. Why should I be happy? Because you said. You promised. You're not going to Welsh out. Aren't you even going to invite me in? So you tricked me into a promise I should never have given. I didn't either trick you. Oh, no? Well, we'll see. Well, what are you standing out there for, child? Want us both to freeze to death in this drafty hall? Go on in the living room. I've had the window fixed. Yes, sir, Mr. Brown. Well, in you go. There's a fire here, and it's warmer. It certainly is that. Thank you. So you got the suit, huh? Yes, sir. How? That's my business. <laughs> Didn't take you long to maneuver it once you found out I wouldn't fork out for it, huh? I... That's right, Mr. Crown. Well, sit down. Thank you. Is that all? Excuse me? I mean, can't catch your tongue, huh? 
You certainly had enough to say yesterday. Why so silent now? I'm disappointed. Why? Because you're not happy, too. About the suit, I mean. Why should I be? I don't know, Mr. Crown. But I was just sure, sure you would be. Well, you're wrong. I'm not. I made a bargain, and I'll stick to it. You don't have to, if you don't want to. I won't hold you to it. I mean, an unhappy Santa Claus wouldn't be much good. Do you want to? Want to what? Be unhappy? No, to get out of it. I don't even know if I can get into it yet. Close your mouth. You look silly with it open. Oh, come on. The suit, I mean. The suit. Come on, let's see it. I can't all but... Um, it is very difficult, not. Oh, give me that stupid parcel. Stop fiddling. Can't spend all night on this. Oh! Good Lord, and what ragtag did you find this flea-bitten outfit, huh? Huh? I didn't either find it. I rented it. Rented it? And just what did you pay for this threadbare collection of junk? It cost 61 cents. How much? More, when you count my bus fare from here to Dawson City. A dollar sixty-two plus sixty-one cents. Two dollars and twenty-three cents. My whole capital. And just where did you get two dollars and twenty-three cents? It was my tree money for Christmas. But I'd rather have a Santa Claus than a tree. So I broke my piggy bank and I hate you. <laughs> oh, stop it. Oh, stop it. All right, I'll be your Santa Claus. Oh, I'll even try the suit on now if you like. Oh, if you still want me, that is. I'll be a pretty gruff Santa Claus, but... Oh, shall I try the damn thing on? Yes, please. After all, I spent the money. And something is better than nothing, isn't it? Honesty, Jasper. The startling white honesty of a child. It's what you've been looking for, grasping for. Something to believe in again. And yet, too late. Too late. You're so conscious of the age in your body, the bile in your gut, your loneliness. That rheumatic elbow, that gnawing peptic ulcer, the tight place around your heart. Or is what you fear most, your mean and tiny soul. And while Jasper thought these private thoughts, he was slowly putting on the Santa Claus suit shaking his head at each tattered garment and worn accessory that went with it. But as he put each piece on, watching through Jenny's eyes, each separate piece seemed to shine suddenly as luxuriously rich and sumptuous as the velvet and ermine suit she had first seen. And the whiskers were pure white and thick and curly, and the boots were like the most expensive Moroccan leather. But the biggest miracle of all was in Jasper. Gone was the constriction from the heart. The nagging ache was no longer dragging at his stomach. The rheumatic arm was loose as a whip. And a magic sponge had wiped the lines from his face and the meanness from his heart. Oh, super! Gloriosa! It fits! It fits! Like a glove. You look so different. I feel so different. Do I look like Santa Claus? Not look. You are. You are Santa. It's just perfect. Only... Only what? Do you think you could... You know, just a little... Even smile? Not only could I smile, I even think I could laugh again. Oh, try, Mr. Crown, try. You could call me Jasper, Jennifer. And you can call me Jenny, Jasper. Hello, Jenny Jasper. (laughs) 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 Oh, oh, Jasper, this is going to be a good Christmas. (laughs) Oh, Jenny, this is going to be the best Christmas ever. Now, Mrs. Templeton, now do you think? Yes. I was just coming to tell you, my dear child, that my husband said we are just about to commence. Mr. Crown's all dressed and ready. The Reverend isn't teed off, is he? Teed off? 
I mean, his feathers aren't ruffled. The Reverend is a saint, my dear. A perfect saint. Why on earth should he be angry? Well, Grandmother said he always played Santa Claus. And if someone else wanted to be it, he'd be mad as a wet hen. And I said, why is a wet hen mad? And she said, because his feathers get ruffled. Your grandmother, I should say your family in general, Jenny, doesn't quite understand a man of God. The minister, my beloved George, is only too happy to welcome back a sinner and a backslider like Mr. Crown. He would sacrifice any of his little pleasures for that. Oh, uh, which reminds me. Yes, ma'am? For some reason or other, Mr. Crown says he has to see you before he comes in. Oh, dear. I hope nothing's gone wrong. Because if Jasper's feathers are ruffled, this whole party could lay an egg. <laughs> Never get rid of that old stork. I told you he was an old stick. <laughs> In the mud. <laughs> now, what I needed you for was to know if I look all right. Come over to the chair. He has the wig all wrong and the hat not not down over your nose, not sort of jaunty to one side. And he didn't put the rouge on your cheeks like this. Oh, and now you really look like something. Oh, Jasper, you look just beautiful. And so do you, Jenny. Oh, I don't matter. You're the star of this show. Now you go out there and twinkle. <laughs> Watch my stardust. Just call me Jasper, Jenny, and everything's all right. <laughs> <laughs> and you just call me Jenny Jasper, and I know it's going to be. <laughs> Here he comes, everybody, all the way from the North Pole. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. <laughs> been witness to the regeneration of Jasper Crown. A child's drive and belief has brought him back to the precious gift of present youth and laughter. But is it a true conversion or only a momentary aberration? Is the magic of this moment in the Christmas legend in the suit and in Jenny? What happens if he loses either or both? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. If you're a driver, if you're actually driving a car right now, consider this. 55 miles per hour saves you gasoline, and you know how much money that can cost you these days. 55 miles an hour saves you other troubles you don't need, like the worry about that car behind you with the flashing light on top. It's after somebody else. 55 also saves wear and tear on your car. But even more important than any of those things, 55 saves lives. Since 1974, when this national speed limit began, driving 55 miles an hour has been the single biggest factor in reducing highway deaths by more than 36,000 people. That's a lot of lives. So check your speedometer frequently. And remember, 55 saves lives. One of them could be you. A public service of this station, the U.S. Department of Transportation, and the Advertising Council. This is WBBM Chicago. You're invited to Northwest Federal's grand opening celebration. It's another new saving center in Elmhurst. Elk Grove. With free gifts for savers and a Hawaiian vacation sweepstakes. Stop by any Northwest Federal saving center, including Elmhurst. Elk Grove. And choose from over 20 terrific gifts. Free or for special low prices with a deposit of $250 or more. Our new Elmhurst Elk Grove saving center has the same convenient hours as all our Northwest Federal saving centers. 63 hours a week. Come celebrate our Elmhurst Elk Grove grand opening. You could win one of two free trips to Hawaii. No transaction is necessary. Void were prohibited. Entrance must be 18 years of age or older. Contest ends March 8, 1979. Register today at any Northwest Federal location, including our Elk new... Grove. <laughs> including both our new locations at Elmhurst and Elk Grove. <laughs> it's Northwest Federal Savings Time, 63 hours a week. One more time. It's Northwest Federal Savings Time, 63 hours a week. The 
search party was an exceptionally long one that year. And before it was over, Jasper Crown had indeed become Santa's alter ego. Many other gifts beyond those Jenny collected on Win the Booty were distributed. All of them from Jasper's generous purse. $50,000 to the church itself. Another 50000 to the community chest. And many smaller but not less welcome gifts. Then, with the party over, Jasper, after a long last hug with Jenny before she went home, returned to his own house. But however cold the empty old mansion might seem, Jasper, in his suit of red, was warm and glowing inside. And his first trip was to the telephone. Christmas greetings, hello? Happy Christmas, my darling daughter. Yes, Mary. Your miserable, old, wretched, stupid father. Uh, I can't believe it. I, I mean, you don't... Oh, well, oh, you never were stupid. And you certainly don't sound miserable, old, or wretched. <laughs> well, I'm none of those, but I was stupid. How can I make up for it to you and... and Leon? Make up? Oh, Daddy. I wish you could be with us for Christmas. It's a little late for that, but I have another idea. I want to buy plane tickets for you and Leon to come visit me and ring in the new year with me. Oh, A real good new year. Oh. I just called Robert, and he and his wife are coming home with the children. Oh. He's going to start up the mill again for me. It could be a real family reunion. Oh, Daddy, I, I don't know what to say. Oh, say yes. Please, just say yes. Of course it's yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Daddy, what happened? You said... Well, not only like yourself again, but like... Well, I don't know. Like the spirit of Christmas. Past and present. And future. You'll see, I hope, when you come home. <laughs> Mrs. Murchison. Come in, come in. God and his angels be with me. I thought, Mr. Crown, for a moment you were the real article. I can't claim that. I wish I could. Oh. But I feel as cheerful as him. What brings you here Christmas morning? Well, now, sir, I felt real bad. Particularly this time of year and I'll walking out on you. And here is Christmas Day and you even without a dinner. So I was after bringing a little basket here if you'd accept it. I accept it from the heart and with my thanks. But I'd like to to ask you something in return. What is that? Will you come back to work for me, Merch? I need you. Oh, oh, you called me Merch. Mary's name. She's coming home with her husband and her child-to-be for New Year's. And Robert and his family. Oh. They're moving back to open up the mill. I'll need you, Merch. Oh, the blessed Mary preserve us, so you will. I'm glad I'll be to come home. Good. But what is it that's come over you, Mr. Crown? A child brought me this suit, Merch. And putting it on, I went back to the man I was. I don't want to question either because I believe them both to be a miracle. And I thank God to have found happiness and peace again. Ah. And pray to him it will not be taken away from me. But every silver lining has a cloud sky a rift. The worm nestles even in the heart of a rose. Jasper could not buy his happiness this fast, if ever, again. As she has been his angel, Jenny now becomes his nemesis. Good morning, Jenny. Good morning, Jasper. I didn't expect... Me to answer the door? Well, I saw you coming up the walk. I didn't mean that. I meant I didn't expect to see... I hate to say it, but I've come for the Santa Claus suit. No. What do you want it for? You'll have to take it off now, Jasper. Why? Because I signed the paper. I only rented it, and I'm responsible. I have to take it back. you out of the Santa Claus suit again, Jasper. Oh, Jenny, I feel... I feel naked. 
Just the way I told you. But that's silly. You aren't the way you were at all. You're nice now. The way I always knew you were underneath. As long as I have the suit? As long as you have you. That's what counts. My father says... Oh, wait a minute. Tell the chauffeur. Here's the street. Oh, I was sure it was this one. Try the next. You watch one side, and I'll watch the other. You're not watching, Jenny. That's because I've already looked all the way down. It must be the next block. Why are you looking so sad again, Jasper? Because I feel that way. Not even sad. Frightened, Jenny. Why? I like the way I am. I didn't like the way I was. And I'm afraid that if I let go of the suit, I'll go back to being what I was. Never. Anyway, when we get to the shop, you can always buy it. Oh, tell the chauffeur to turn here. To the right. Take the next right, Edwards. You sure this is it? Yes, I know. Because there's the hat factory and the cigar store and the man who cooks spaghetti in the window of his shop. And right there next to it. What? What, Jenny? Mr. Edwards, stop and back up. See, Jasper? It's a dead-end street anyway. And there's that big school and the storage company and then the Chinese laundry. And right here between it and the man who cooks spaghetti in the window is... was... Stop the car, Edwards. But, Jenny, there's nothing here but an empty lot. But there can't be. Because otherwise, then it would have to be a miracle. Yes. That's what it would have to be. But that's impossible. Why? Because miracles have to be about holy things. And they have to be very old. Well, what's holier than Christmas? And it's pretty old. I... I must have made a mistake. We'll just have to keep... Little Jenny, listen to me. This is a funny thing to ask. But I ask it with all my heart. Don't let's go looking anymore. Because we just might find him. And that's the thing I'm most afraid of. Why? Because then I'd have to give the suit back. And I might stop believing again. Oh, is that the time? The right time? Yes, what's wrong? I've got to get back to Grandma's fast. I'm catching a plane today. Edwards, home. Step on it. A plane? Where to? Pacific. Japan. Back to my father. He's so lonely. I'm all he has. But Grandmother was getting old, and we were both going to spend Christmas with her. Only that first-class son of a... I almost said it. Anyway, the Admiral said he couldn't spare my father because of the general situation. Oh, what am I going to do? About your father? No, about the suit. Jenny, why don't you let me handle this? I'm here, and your father... And you are going to be on the other side of the world. How could you handle it? Well, let me tell you. And we'll write it down as soon as we get home. Now, here's the advertisement, Jenny. I'll read it. If the owner of the Santa Claus suit rented to Jennifer Swallow will present his copy of the receipt to me, Jasper Crown, my address, phone number, and so on, he will be remunerated to whatever degree he deems fair and equitable, up to, but not to exceed, the sum of $1 million. This ad will appear daily till the first of the new year, and for the month of December of each succeeding year, until the decease of the aforementioned Jasper Crown. Okay? But Jasper, a million dollars for that cruddy old suit? I told you, it's worth that to me. Do you have to go, Jenny? You shouldn't have to ask. You know how fathers feel about daughters. Now I do. Your own daughter is coming back to be with you. And your son, too. You'll never miss me. Oh, I will, that. Don't ever mistake it. But I'm finally realizing all this fuss about a suit I thought was a key that unlocked my heart. When it wasn't the suit at all, it was you. I... I... I hate goodbyes. They're always sad. Why can't they be laughing goodbyes? Couldn't you laugh? Just a little? You said that to me once before, remember? And you laughed. I don't think anything could make me laugh now. I bet I could. Try it, Mr. Crown. Try what? 
That's not what you're supposed to say. What am I supposed to say? You're supposed to say, you can call me... Jasper, Jenny. And you can call me Jenny, Jasper. Hello, Jenny Jasper. <laughs> Hello, Jasper, Jenny. <laughs> oh, Jasper, it's been such a good Christmas. <laughs> the best, the best ever. <laughs> she had to. And Jasper placed the ad in the paper. For ten years, it appeared every December as Jasper lived out a full and happy life. His family, grandchildren, and his mill workers filling every Christmas for him. Until early this December, when he died, peacefully and quietly in his sleep, grateful and joyful to go join his beloved wife. Hello, Mr. Crown. I've been proud of you these last ten years. I've... I've felt at peace with myself. The suit is in that rosewood box on my bureau. And here is a blank check signed. Fill in what you want. Oh, no. This is paid in full. I'm more than at my rental. <laughs> but I will take the suit back because it is Christmas again. And who knows? It may be very useful to someone else, eh? <laughs> now, excuse me. It's a busy season <laughs> for me. <laughs> now done, sir. Now done, sir. Now, friend, sir, and victim. I did. It's been most of it. Such a good life. And the best of it you made. But I'm tired, Jenny. I'm so tired. Say good night to me. and more as you brought me. I love you, Jasper. That's what Christmas is all about. Contrary to the established order of things, a wonder or a wonderful thing. Webster's definition of a miracle. I'll be back shortly. special night of the year, there remains nothing to say in closing but God rest you merry gentlemen and ladies, and a merry, merry Christmas to all. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, a special Christmas story. Nick Carter's Christmas Adventure. For the mystery, 
of the reluctant contributor. Well, Nick, we've been pretty lucky so far, haven't we? Yes, Cubby, we have. Which is another way of saying that folks are usually willing to contribute to your settlement house Christmas party every year, Nick. You know, Shelby, I was just thinking about this last name on our list. Yeah? Rasford. I don't know him personally. You? No, I don't, but somebody must have thought he was rich enough or interested enough in the work to make a substantial contribution. Oh, here's the... Hey, is this... Hey, Nick, what's that address again? 576 Milton Avenue. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And there's his name on the door plate. Well, let's take a look, Scubby. Well, gosh, this doesn't make sense, Dick. A guy with dough doesn't hide away in a place like this. Well, knock on the door anyhow. Sure. Doesn't seem to be anybody here, Nick. No, hold it, Scubby. I hear someone coming. Who is it? I'm Nicholas Carter. May I speak to Mr. Rasper, please? Nick Carter, eh? Yes, yes. And this is my assistant, Scubby Wilson. How do you do? Uh, you Mr. Rasper? Yes. Well, come in, come in. It's cold out there. You're letting all the heat out. Oh, beg your pardon. Come on, Scubby. Yeah. I'm in, Nick. I'm in. Well, what was it you wanted? Oh, Mr. Rasper, I've come to see if you would care to make a contribution to my Christmas party fund. I never make contributions. Oh, but you didn't let Nick finish, sir. The fund provides food and extra clothing for the needy and deserving the children. The charity department's still working, isn't it? Well, of course, Mr. Rasper, but my object is to provide an inspiration for the young people who are underprivileged. People who haven't got any money are always trying to get it from those who have. Then you aren't interested in seeing that the children of the Lincoln Hall District are helped to a little happiness on Christmas Day? No, I'm not. Christmas is old-fashioned. I don't believe in it. It's a waste of money and time. Good day. Oh, well, Mr. Rasper, it's always been a lot of fun for me personally. And I must say that I've always felt better for celebrating it. And I'm inclined to agree with Scotty, Mr. Rasper. Christmas has always been a bright spot in my life. And I feel sure that if you knew the good it has done throughout the world, it'd make you change your mind. Rubbish. Well, in any case, a Merry Christmas to you. Good day to you. Merry Christmas, indeed. A lot of nonsense... Come on, Nick. Let's get back to civilization. You know, Scubby, that man's wealthy. No doubt about that. And yet he's solid on Christmas. And everything it stands for. (laughs) You said a mouthful, Dick. You know, Scubby, there must be reason why he thinks that way. And I'd like to find out what it is. Yeah, but you haven't anything to work on, Nick. Oh, no, Scubby, I haven't. Not yet. But look here. I can finish up whatever has to be done this afternoon. Suppose you hop down to the newspaper office and go through the files there. There might just be something we could learn about, Rasper, that way. Okay, Nick, I'll be glad to. Then I'll have Riley check through the files at headquarters. It's a long shot, but something might turn up. Sure, maybe Patsy has run into something while she's been working down at the settlement house. She might know somebody who knows something about Rasper. Yeah, she might have that. I'll ask her about it. Okay. And maybe with all of us working together on it, we may learn why Rasper's so dead set against Christmas. I'd certainly like to find out. Is that you, Nick? Uh, Riley talking. I've been through my files here, and I can't find anything charged against a man named Ben Rasper. Oh, he, he was licensed to do business with a man named Howard Lowe, but Lowe died some years ago. Otherwise, Rasper is just a successful businessman. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I'll tell you what, though, Nick. There's an old fellow named Fred Anderson who used to be on the force who knows Rasper. Uh, sure, uh, you can find him at uh, Lincoln Hall where you're giving the party. Oh, he, he's the watchman there now. Okay, Nick, that's all right. Uh, see you tomorrow. Uh, hello, hello. Oh, yes, Scubby? Oh, you did, huh? Sports tomorrow, huh? Well, well. What was that name again? Chris Baum. Why, yes, yes, I recall. Oh, no, I'll be done in about an hour, so I want to call Patsy first. Right. And thanks, Scubby. Bye. Ah, jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a horse! Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Hey, Patsy, how's everything, huh? Oh, fine. I'm coming down to the hall. Is there anything you want me to bring along? Uh huh. Why, sure, I can do that. But will that be enough, though? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Scubby just called. Oh, he found out something about Rasper. What? You did too. How old is he? Name Jimmy, huh? And he's coming to our party? Oh, fine, fine, fancy. Okay, I'll see you in a little while. Bye. Oh, 
Oh, that's fine. We've collected enough to do this year's party up right. Now let's get organized. Riley, huh? your job will be to get the kids and the needy persons rounded up. Oh, sure, Nick. I'll take care of it. I got your list and the list from the social worker and from the church down there. And, and there are plenty of others who'll need a lift this year, believe me. I know it, Riley, and I'll depend on you. Scubby, it's your job to see that the tree and decorations and gifts are taken care of. Don't worry, Nick. Decorating is my middle name. I'll make Lincoln Hall look like a million dollars in cash. <laughs> <laughs> good boy, good boy. And Patsy, hmm? you'll see to it that there's plenty to eat and drink for the party, so I won't have to worry about that. I'll take care of the bills, and you have the letters the credit stores gave us. You know how to do that. Sure thing, Nick. Good. I've been through it with you often enough before. I ought to know what you want by this time. Uh, well, what are you going to be doing, Nick? Me? Well, Riley, I'm going to do a little detecting. I'm going to look into those tips you, Patsy, and Scarby gave me about those people who know Ben Rasper. And by the time I'm through, I hope to find out why it is that he hates Christmas the way he does. And then, well, then, maybe I'll be able to do something about it. This is Rasper talking. Yes? I sent you the bell, didn't I? Well, what if it is due on the 27th? No, just because it's a holiday, there's no terrible reason for a bill to be unpaid. Ah, goodbye. Darn fool nonsense, that's what it is. There's a lot of foolish... Still talking big, ain't you, Rasper? Well, who's there? What do you want? Don't you remember me, Rasper? No, I don't remember you. Who are you? They used to call me the kid. Chris the Kid. Chris, sometimes known as the human flesh. Chris, you. Oh. Well, it's been a long time, Rasper, hasn't it? Uh, how'd you find me? Who sent you here? A fellow named Nick Carter told me I'd find you here in your office, even if it is Christmas Eve. Nick Carter? Oh, yes. Wanted me to give him some money for some fool party. Oh, for the party at Lincoln Hall, I guess. Ace never asked me for anything. Just gave me what I needed. When I needed it. Yeah. So he hired you to come here and take up my no, time to no, get... No, he didn't send me here. Just said I'd find you here, that's all. I came here on my own accord. To... Just to wish you a Merry Christmas. Ha! Thought you'd say that. Well, I don't mind. Because it's on account of Nick Carter that I can stand on my own feet again. Not on account of you. Watch that. You mind if I uh, sit down? Yeah, it was on Christmas Eve that we won our first fight, wasn't it? Fight? Oh, yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. But I can remember the noise of the crowd, the glare of the lights and the smoke curling around and the brightness over the ring, and you leaning over me with that wet towel. You got him going, Chris. Another one like that last round and you'll have him in the ropes for the count. How do you feel now, kid? Come on, kid, Rasper. Just let me out. I don't have to wait anymore. It's my meat right now. now. You take your orders from me, kid. I'm the brains here. When you get the signal from me, you give it to him. Okay, that's right. You're the boss. bridges since then. I know. And the percentage you paid me didn't last long either. It went just like that water. But I didn't care much about things like that. Till the day a friend of mine came and gave me a warning tip. That started me thinking. Hello, kid. How do you feel? Oh, hello, Rasmus. Where you been? I wanted to talk to you. Oh, I've been around. What's up? I got a tip today. You're signing up Timmy O'Day. You're going to manage him. Who told you that? Never mind. Is it true? That depends. Depends on what? Look, kid, you're getting slow. O'Day's fresh. He'll be the next champ. If he wins this fight with you tonight, I'm taking him over. If I win tonight? I'm taking O'Day over anyhow. We've been together a long time, kid, and it don't pay to get into too much of a rut. So that's all it means to you, is it? Money. The payoff, huh? What about all the years we've known each other? What about the things we've been through? Why, you no, know. don't get yourself all in a sweat, kid. It isn't good for you. You'll get your cut anyway. Don't worry. You'll get your cut. I'll see you later. Rasper, what do I do? Tell me what to do. I can't 
can't see him. My eyes are all puffed up. He's cut me to ribbons. Tell me what to do, Rasper. <laughs> Don't bother me, kid. Use your own judgment. You're on your own, as of now. But Rasper, you always... You're on your own, kid. I can still see it sitting there in the ring corner, laughing at me. But that was the last thing I saw for a long time. Old day saw to that. You must have coached him pretty thorough about my style. And then you really cashed in. Well, I haven't got much myself, but I'm still able to wish you a Merry Christmas, Rasper. Although I don't think you'll ever have one. Chris, I... Well, I got some things to do, Rasper. Carter asked me to pick up some things for the party at Lincoln Hall tomorrow. We always have a swell time at Carter's Christmas parties. Too bad you can't enjoy anything like that anymore. Well, as I said before, Rasper, Merry Christmas. Uh, how can a man work with his mind whirling like a merry-go-round? Christmas Eve. God, it's a fine excuse for people to go around yelling at each other in the streets. Disturbing a man when he wants to get some work done. Oh, I might as well close the office and get some rest. I would have been home by now if the kid, if Chris, hadn't taken up so much time. What Chris does for a living now? Wonder if... Ah, that's none of my concern. Get home and get some sleep. That's what I need. Uh, who's that? I'm closing up. Come back tomorrow morning. Oh, I'm glad I got here before you left, Ben. Uh, who is it? It's Nina, Ben. Oh, Nina. I only stopped by to speak to you for a moment. It's getting quite late and uh, I... Uh... Well, sit down for a moment, Nina. Oh, thank here, you. Here, let me get your chair. I, uh, I suppose it's rather bold of me to come after all this time, but I... Why, no, Nina, no. I, I'm glad you did. Is there something you want? Oh, no. No, there's nothing you can do for me, Ben. Jimmy and I are doing very nicely. I just wanted to wish you a Merry Christmas. I was in the neighborhood doing some shopping for the party that Mr. Carter's giving at Lincoln Hall tomorrow, and How is I... he, Nina? Um, Jimmy, I mean. Oh, he's fine, Ben. He's full of life and interested in everything. He has a good head on his shoulders, and he's very handsome, too. Oh, that's fine. Just fine. Uh, you're looking a little tired, Ben. Are you feeling well? Oh, uh, yes, yes, of course. I'm, I've been working hard, that's all. I've... Spend much time at home. Uh, not much reason to. Hmm. That's the way you wanted it, Ben. Don't you remember? Nina! Nina, where are you? Oh, Jimmy, there's Daddy. You wait here for Mommy like a good boy, won't you? Um, I'm coming, Ben. I've been keeping your dinner warm for you. I, I hope you'll... What's the matter, Ben? You look as if... That's you... nothing, Nina, nothing. I'm in a hurry, that's all. Well, you're always in a hurry, aren't you? Never have time for... Where's my dinner? Sit down, Ben. I'll... I'll have it for you right away. <sighs> this plate is hot now. Be careful that you don't burn your I food. won't. Salt, please. Here you are, dear. Ben, when you finish, won't you take time enough out of your business to help me get the tree decorated? I know Jimmy's too young to know much about it, but... I'd love to have his Christmas all ready for him in the morning. Look, I'll, I'll put him to sleep right away, and then we can start. See, I have some holly and mistletoe for the fireplace, and, and, and some... I won't have time for that. that, Nina. But, Ben, it's Christmas Eve. Surely you I have I have not... to get back to the office. I'm putting on a championship match for O'Day in January, and the things have gone haywire. Something that can't wait till tomorrow. I have to get it organized right away, that's all. Ben, this is Christmas Eve. Tomorrow will be Jimmy's first Christmas. Doesn't that mean anything to you? You and Jimmy celebrate Christmas any way you want to, Nina. I have something more important to do. Business is more important than sentiment. You certainly can see that. Yes, Ben. I can see that. I've been seeing it more and more during the last few years. I thought that when Jimmy came, maybe you were... No, I was wrong, wasn't I, Ben? You'd even let your love for business break up our home. Break up our... Oh, don't be melodramatic, Nina. I'm not being melodramatic, Ben. I'm... 
I'm trying to be very calm and quiet about it. I've had a lot of time to think when I've sat alone here night after night. And those days on end when you've been away, attending to your business. And what has come out of all this thinking you've done? Just this, Ben. I'm not going on any longer. Either you belong to your family, or your family will get along without you. I have to rush, Nina. Uh, good night. Yeah, good night, Ben. It's good... Goodbye. Jimmy and I are leaving tonight. Look, I haven't time to talk about it with you now, Lena. Uh, oh, uh, by the way, this will probably take most of the night. Good night. Goodbye, Bennett. Merry Christmas. I never had much of a chance to make it up to you, Lena. You've had all the chance you wanted, Ben. But Nina, I... I just dropped by to say hello and to give you a wish for happiness during the holidays. It's hard not to share with you the joy I have with Jimmy. I I wish you could see his eyes dance at Mr. Carter's Christmas parties. Unfortunately, on what little I make, we can't very well afford to have our Christmas at home, but somehow we don't miss it. Everybody has such a grand time at Mr. Carter's party and... Jimmy does enjoy every minute that he's there. Goodness, I'll have to be on my way. Jimmy's waiting for me, and I have to make one more stop for Mr. Carter. Good night, Ben, and Merry Christmas. Carter, this stuff doesn't taste like anything. Nothing at all. Understand what's got into me. It's good food, fixed the same as it always is. It just doesn't taste right, that's all. What's that? Someone at the door this time of the night? I'm coming, I'm coming. Hello, Ben. It's Fred Anderson. Uh, glad I found you at home. I'm always at home this time of night. Yes, yes, I suppose you are, Ben. Uh, can I come in? Of course. I brought your package, Ben. Nick Carter sent me around with it. Said you'd probably be here alone tomorrow and he'd like you to have it. Carter? What's Carter sending me? <laughs> you might open it and see, Ben. I'm no mind reader. <laughs> mm. That's any reason why Carter would want to... Mm. What a port wine. Let's see a card. Merry Christmas from Nick Carter. What's the idea? You know anything about this, Fred? No, but uh, Nick Carter's a funny duck. There's lots of things people don't expect him to. Why, I don't even know the man. Only saw him once and then... Um, you want a glass of this wine, Fred? <laughs> don't mind if I do, Ben. Seems it's Christmas Eve. I don't mind at all. There's some glasses here somewhere. Say, how do you open this thing? Here, I'll do it for you, Ben. Yeah, that does it. Now, go ahead, you open it. Eh? Oh, yes, all right. Well, there, ain't you drinking with me, Ben? Huh? Oh. Yes, I will. That's a ticket. <laughs> well, here, here's Merry Christmas for you, Ben. Oh. Yes, uh, Merry Christmas. Well, how have you been keeping yourself, Fred? Oh, I've been sort of working around Lincoln Hall since I was retired from the force. I see. You know, while I was coming here tonight, I was thinking about those old days when I walked the beat. Funny, most folks call them the good old days, but I don't. You did all right in those times, didn't you? Oh, sure, I got along. I was just thinking about the different attitudes folks have nowadays toward being given a hand. They appreciate it more, it seems to me. Charity's still charity, Fred. That hasn't changed. I guess it's all in the point of view, Ben. I guess you haven't changed with the times. That night I met you near the bridge. I was sure you were going to see that you were headed in the wrong direction and wake up in time. Remember that night, Ben? Well, it's Christmas Eve. You'd just come from the arena. They'd handed you your walking papers because you'd let them down. Oh. Well, Merry Christmas, officer. Well, Merry Christmas to you, sir. Well, uh, uh, what are you doing out on a night like this, Ben? I thought you'd be up at the arena getting the New Year's fights lined up. What? Oh, it's you, Anderson. No, I'm not at the arena anymore. That's so. What happened? Uh, they decided tonight they'd rather have Davis take over my job. Fine Christmas present, that is. Well, uh, that's tough news, Ben. What's going to do now? I don't know. I can't seem to think straight. Oh, that's a crazy way for a man like you to talk. On a Christmas Eve, too? <laughs> Christmas Eve. 
Yeah, it's never been anything but a jinx to me. First I get stuck with that no-good fighter all day. Then Nina leaves me and takes my son with her. And now Irina throws me out. Well, uh, maybe you better stop and find out what it is you're doing wrong, Ben. Maybe you're the one that's to blame, not Christmas Eve. Uh, they all take advantage of me. I made all the money I could for them, but I'm not going to do it anymore. Take it easy, Ben. Take it easy. You better go home and think it over. I have thought it over, Fred, and I know what the answer is. I'm going to make money for myself and nobody else. I'll show these people. I'll make so much money they'll come crawling to me on their knees. I won't have to ask for anybody's sympathy. You don't pay to think like that, Ben. You'll regret it. Now, look. I know that Phil Boynton, who runs the shoe store down on Elm Street, is looking for a man to buy in with him. Why don't Me you... work in a shoe store? Not in your life, Fred. I'm going after the big money. Big money. That's the only thing people understand, and I'm going to get it. Well, now you got it, Ben. You're one of the richest men in town. And what's he got you? Why, I don't know. Ben, it's too bad you don't get around and see what nice people there are in the world. People like this Carter fellow, for instance. Uh, does a man good to know people like him? Makes you feel there really is a Santa Claus to see him bring the smiles to the kids' faces at those parties he gives down at Lincoln Hall. Oh, well, I'll be getting back there now, friend. I've got a big day tomorrow. I'm not as young as I used to be. <laughs> well, Merry Christmas to you, Ben. I'll tell Nina I saw you. She'll be at the party tomorrow with young Jimmy. Good night, Ben. Fancy, how's it going? Oh, Nick, it's wonderful. Oh. We're having a grand time. Oh, that's fine, Fancy. Hey, Fancy, look. Hmm? Over there by the door. What do you see? Where, Nick? Oh, well, who's that? That, Fancy, is Ben Raskin. Oh, I hope he's come to join the party. For heaven's sake, so that's the man I've heard so much about. Well, you look scared to death, Nick. Look, Fancy, will you go over and make him welcome? Oh, of course, Nick. Good. Merry Christmas. I'm Patsy Bowen. Oh. Won't you join us? How do you do? I hope I'm not... Do you mind if I just watch? Well, of course not. Come right in. I wanted to thank Mr. Carter for the gift he sent, and I... Nick's right over there near the tree. Come along. Uh, children seem to be enjoying themselves, don't they? They certainly do. There's Lieutenant Riley handing out the gifts there. And Scotty Wilson with him, standing next to this girl. Uh, yes, I met Mr. Wilson. This little Lieutenant Riley, he's having as much fun as the children. <laughs> so I see. Oh, there's a nice-looking boy there, Miss... Uh, who... I mean, what's his name? Where? Oh, that one over there. Oh, that's Jimmy. He's a nice boy. His mother was a big jump to me in getting her refreshments ready. There she is over there on the far side of the hall with the table, see? Oh, yes. Her son. Yes. Yes, yes. I see. Oh, Nick, we have a new guest. Oh, hello there, Mr. Rasper. Merry Christmas. I'm glad you could join us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carter. I, I came to express my appreciation for the gift you sent me. I, I hardly know how to... nothing of it, Mr. Rasper. Your being here is thanks enough for me. Mr. Carter, uh, that little boy coming along the line there, Jimmy, I think his name is, do you think I, I might give him... I mean, could I hand him his gift, do you think? Why, certainly. Riley! Oh, yeah. Mr. Rasper here wants to lend a hand. Can you use him? Well, sure thing, Nick. Come along, Mr. Rasper. Thank you, Mr. Rasper. Well, listen, you just handed me packages of the show along, Mr. Rasper. <laughs> and enjoy yourself, man. I will. Uh, there, little girl. Uh, Merry Christmas. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Say, she... She liked it, didn't she? Well, they all appreciate a little kindness, Mr. Rasper. Now, now here's a gift for that little boy, dear. Oh, Hello, Jimmy. Here you are. And a Merry Christmas, son. Oh, well, that was a day for you. 
Gosh, I haven't had so much fun since last year. Yeah, you played those games harder than any two kids in the French Scubby. <laughs> yeah, and lost practically every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no well, you really have to be in condition to keep up with these kids. Boy, they're wonders. Hey, where do they get all that energy? That will be one of the world's great mysteries forever, Scubby. Nick, what are you thinking so hard about? Hmm? Oh, I was uh, I was just thinking of the way Mr. Rasper took to the party. Oh? Hey, don't you mean the way the party took to Mr. Rasper, Nick? Yeah, I never saw a man open up the way he did. Well, it was wonderful. The children just flocked around him. And that's one of the greatest jobs that Nick Carter ever did. Well, what do you mean, Riley? Well, Patsy, you'll never believe it, but when Nick and I went to see Rasper to get a contribution to the party, he was the hardest case of unadulterated unpleasantness I ever saw. But somehow Nick managed to get under his skin and bring out, well, what she saw tonight. Well, for heaven's sake. How did you do it? Nick? Well, it wasn't difficult, Patsy. You see, I could see when we first spoke to Rasper that he was fighting something. But I didn't know what it was. But from what Riley, Scubby, and you told me, I found that three different times Christmas Eve had brought him bad luck. First, the fighter O'Day. Then Mrs. Rasper had left Rasper on a Christmas Eve, taking his son Jimmy with her. And third, he'd lost his promoter's connection at the arena, also on Christmas Eve. Well, the whole thing added up. Rasper associated Christmas Eve with a list of unfortunate incidents and fought anything that suggested the holidays to him. He made a lot of money, but it never brought him happiness. The big thing for me was to make him realize that people and Christmas meant good and not evil. And from what I saw this afternoon, the Rasper family and the whole neighborhood, for that matter... Is going to benefit by his awakening to that realization. Oh, Nick, that's wonderful. You deserve a kiss for that. Oh, thanks, Patsy. I'm glad you feel that way, too. You know, I'm happier this evening because of Mr. Rasper than I would be if I'd solved 20 murders. He's made this a really merry Christmas for all of us. the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly at this time by WOR Mutual. What's your story going to be about next time, Nick? It's a little different from the usual story, because it started out with Nick himself being the victim of a holdup. Yes, and the men who held me up turned out to be innocent after all. Sounds a trifle complicated to me. It was complicated, but interesting. And it gave me plenty of trouble before I found the solution. Including a sore throat that almost finished Nick Carter. A sore throat? Why should that be dangerous? Because it was the kind that you get from a rope around your neck. Hey, wait a minute. You mean... All the rest of the story you get two weeks from tonight. Not now. So long, everybody. So long. So long, both of you. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, and Scubby by John Kane. The story was written for Nick Carter by Humphrey Davis. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Yes? Uh, Yes, I know that in 48 hours it's going to be Christmas, but... Who is this? Who? Look, I'm a big boy now, so... Okay. Tonight at 8. Goodbye. What the devil was that? This may come as a shock to you, Mr. Wolf, but that was Santa Claus. You've been drinking? Uh Uh-huh. The usual. Milk. He's coming to see you at 8. He's got a problem. Indeed. It seems that some low, not to mention murderous character is going around slaughtering Santa Clauses. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chair-born genius, Nero Wolfe. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Earlier than eight, however, the case of the slaughtered Santas. 
It began to be precise on the corner of 34th Street and Carlisle. The hour was close to six, the weather cold, the sky dark. Uh, how you doing, Santa? Uh, I'm freezing to death, Harbor, sir. Well, it's a cold day. You packing up? Yeah, I guess so. Not many people around anymore. Oh, heading for home and dinner. How was the collection? Well, I, I don't need no armored car, but a few dozen kids are going to have something for their Christmas stockings. Your competition, the guy in the opposite corner, is already screaming. <laughs> Probably got low blood pressure. Yeah, give me a hand to get the collection part off the chains, eh? Sure, there you go. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'll just walk you down the block. Got a phone in. Okay, fine. One Santa still left. Wonder what he's waiting for. <laughs> Santa Claus. <laughs> Well, watch yourself going down those chimneys tonight, eh? Sure, sure. Well, I'll cut across the avenue here. Be seeing you. Hey, that car coming down the street. Got its lights out. Look out! Hey, Peg. Huh? Did I ever tell you I love you? Oh, it's not me you love. It's a hot soup. Ah, now, you're not the only woman who can cook a dish of soup. Huh? It helps, though. I'm just beginning to thaw out. Yeah, that's a cold corner you play Santa Claus on. Well, don't hurt to make a few bucks. I ain't done so good this past year. Well, maybe the next year it'll be... Oh, well. Besides, I kind of like it, you know. Kids asking questions all day long. Yeah. You know, I wonder how, how they figure the other two Santas at the intersection. Our kids think of only one thing at a time. <laughs> Moises? Sure, Pat. You know, uh, one of them other Santas got hit by a car tonight. Oh? Yeah, packed up a few minutes before I did, started crossing the avenue, and bang! You know, hit and run driver. Oh, gosh, that's too bad. Was he hurt? Yes, yeah, he was killed. Here's your soup. Oh, with traffic the way it is nowadays... Well, I better take a look at the stew. Somebody's the door. I'll get it, Peg. Okay. Yeah, what? Oh, oh! Mike! Wolf? Yes, Archie? I've been thinking. Good heavens. Oh, I admit it won't bring about a national emergency... But Mr. Wolf, Christmas is only a couple of days away. If you're hinting about your present... No, no, no. I was just imagining you behind a team of reindeer. Your imagination is morbid. You'd make a wonderful Santa Claus. Really? You've got the perfect build for it. Of course, as for character... Archie. Yeah? <laughs> Can you picture me scrambling down a chimney? <laughs> well, they might have to build bigger chimneys, but... Bah. Well, there's that, too. However... That is the front door. True. I was thinking... You might see who it is. Well, if nobody's been lying to me on the phone, that'll be Santa Claus. Maybe me. But I haven't decided what I want for Christmas yet, Mr. Wolf. For example, should she be blonde or brunette, tall or short? Archie. On my way. Good evening. I dislike dawdling on anyone's doorstep. Well, stop dawdling. Come in, please. Mr. Wolf has been warned of my arrival? He has. Through here. Uh, Mr. Wolf, this is, uh, Santa Claus? My name is Barton. John Barton. How do you do, sir? I have no time for the social graces, Mr. Wolf. I'm about to be murdered. Well, in my house, I have objections. I'm a frightened man, Mr. Wolf. Me? This, this costume you see me in is responsible for it all. Why are you in it? I had a notion it might be, well, entertaining to play Santa Claus in public. I'm a wealthy man, sir. I can afford to have whims. Therefore, I have assumed this masquerade... However, it apparently <laughs> is going to be the death of me. Mr. Barden, you have adequately conveyed an atmosphere and an emotion. I suggest you concentrate on facts now. Very well. I have been acting as Santa Claus for the tuberculosis fund. My station is the corner of 34th Street and Carlisle Avenue. I might add the northeast corner. Why? Because at that intersection there have been two other Santa Clauses. One on the southeast corner and one on the southwest corner. Three Santa Clauses, then, on three corners. Yes. Now, then, earlier tonight, the man on the southwest corner started home. He was crossing the avenue when he was run down and killed by an automobile. A regrettable accident. The car was running without lights. It deliberately ran the fellow down and then vanished. Not an accident, Mr. Wolf. 
You saw this yourself? I did. One cent across death. The man in the southeast corner got home all right. According to the radio news flash, that's where he was killed. By bullets. Coincidence? Possibly. But I wouldn't want to risk my life on the chance. This is Friday night. In the nature of things, you would have made two more appearances. Very well, Mr. Barton. I'll write you a check as a retainer, then hurry along home. I'm late now. No. I beg your pardon. You will neither hurry home nor notify anyone at your home of your whereabouts. But... You will remain here until such time as I think it's safe for you to leave. The house is well guarded. I can't do that. In which case, I cannot accept you as a client. I fail to understand. Mr. Barton, it is very easy to murder someone. Avoiding the consequences of such an action is something else again. However, I'm assuming that you're not primarily interested in what happens to your murderer after you're dead? Of course not. Therefore, you remain here. Archie? Yep. First, the corner of 34th and Carlisle, a complete report. But that's nonsense. The corner will be deserted Mr. now. Mr. Barton, you're hiring my intelligence. You will therefore permit me to use it as I see fit. A complete report, Archie? Right, sir. You will then visit Inspector Crame at headquarters. You will, in whatever manner you find effective, collect all the police information about the two already murdered Santas. Fine. The manner, I think, will be applying a blowtorch to the inspector's toes. Your levity is ill-timed. The inspector is likely to throw me out of my ear. Your problem. My ear. And on your way home, you might stop in at Mr. Barton's place. I don't see any purpose in that. Mr. Barton, there is a basic problem to which we must find an answer. Whether those two men were murdered because they were Santa Clauses, or because their deaths were merely preliminaries to yours. Archie, I suggest haste. Yes, sir. And avoid blondes. Hmm? <laughs> I would like you to be home in time for Christmas. Mm-hmm. Yeah? At the price of a cup of coffee? <laughs> you sure you mean coffee? Either you're gonna dig it up or you ain't. Never mind the questions about my personal affairs, see? Oh, I apologize. Here. Two bits. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Don't let me keep you. You're not. 34th in Carlisle, huh? During the day filled with milling throngs... Hey, that's a nice phrase. I'll have to remember it. Milling throngs. And now, desolate and deserted. Well, that's life. Is that a fact? That's philosophy. Yeah. Well, but two bits, I don't have to listen to no philosophy, see? Good night, bud. <laughs> The inspector's got company. If all you reporters will shut up and ask your questions one by one, I'll answer them. Inspector Kramer, it's true a couple of Santa Clauses have been knocked off tonight? It's true that two men who have been employed as Santa Claus by charitable organizations have been murdered, yes. Any connection between those two guys, or does somebody just hate Santa Claus? Well, so far as we know, there is no connection. That means it could be maybe some kind of maniac who decided he doesn't like Christmas or Santa Claus. Is that right? Yeah, the department is investigating along those lines. Like how? Well, we're checking all the local asylums for possible escape lunatics. Yeah, but, Inspector, suppose this nut has never been in an asylum. That'll be all, boys. Oh, but listen. Oh, I wait, said that'll be all. Now, anything new comes in, you'll get it, understand? Oh, well, a hey, good one. Hello, Inspector. Yeah, I spotted you coming in. What happened? You decided to reform and got a job on a paper? Nope. I'm a public-spirited citizen, that's all. Yeah, I could add a few things to that description with practically no strain at all. Mr. Wolf and I are very sentimental about Christmas. We object to Santa Claus is being killed. Nuts. Oh, Inspector, aren't you in favor of Christmas? I'm in favor of Christmas. I'm in favor of motherhood. I'm in... Leave motherhood out of this. Neither of us are mothers. Our chances of becoming mothers aren't too good either. And furthermore... Okay, would... okay, you're not given. So get out of here. <laughs> Thank you, Inspector. Uh, but good one. Yeah? In case Wolf decides to send me something for Christmas, you know what I wish he'd send me? What? Your head. Well. Oh. Now I know what I want for Christmas. What did you say? I said my name is Goodwin and it's cold on your doorstep. 
Oh, oh I'm sorry. Come in. Mm-hmm. Uh, you didn't mention your name. I'm Laura Barton. Mrs. Laura Barton? No. Fine. fine. That is, what relation are you to John Barton? His niece. Why do you ask? Oh, you've got a beautiful voice. Uh, all this marble and no butler? I don't know where Pleasant is. He should be here. Have him but... shot at sunrise. Oh, Laura. Oh, Wayne, this is Mr. Goodwin. I never heard of him. What does he want? Well, I don't Wayne know. Wayne he... what? Stevens. Uh-huh. Friend of Mr. Barton? Half-brother, but we seem to be doing all the answering. How about your answering some questions, Goodwin? I'll try. Come into the library. What do you want? For Christmas? Uh, erase that. I would like to see Mr. Barton. He's not home. Where is he? Don't you know? I wouldn't have come here asking for him if I did, would I? I suppose that's true. What did you want with him? Conversation. About? Anything. You see, I like to talk to rich men. Are you rich? <laughs> I can't play the piano either. You could always learn. But being rich is harder, I found Mr. it. Mr. Mr. Goodwin, you must have some reason for coming here. Some reason concerning Uncle. Laura, you're being imaginative. Well, Uncle is late. He's probably still on that street corner playing Santa Claus. He enjoys it. Why bother about I what... I don't know, except... He's never been as late as this? Well, no. Not since he started that masquerade of his. Would you happen to know where the butler is? Out getting drunk, I suspect. He was in the kitchen a little while ago. Disappeared. Pleasant likes to look on the wine when it's red. Or even when it's rye. Uh, no, I take that back. Oh, you do? He prefers Irish whiskey. We don't stock it. Therefore, oh, um... too bad. I better run along. Good night, Mr. Stevens. Miss Barton. Good night. Uh, I'll see you out. Prettiest butler I ever saw. Blonde. Now, old Dr. Tidmouse always said, beware of blondes, because... Mr. Goodwin, I... Well, I'm waiting. Well, I... Mr. Goodwin, you must know something about Uncle, something you didn't want to tell us. Makes you think so. Well, otherwise, your visit was just pointless. Let's suppose I know. Now, I might be a kidnapper. Oh, no. My honest brown eyes. Your first name is Archie, isn't it? Archie? Archie Goodwin. Hmm. Goes together nicely, don't you think? You work for Nero Wolf. You're going back to him now? I might be, but then again, I might be going to the movies. I recognized you. Your pictures have been in the papers. Take me with you to see Mr. Wolf. You can trust me. I never trust blondes. Well, that's unfair. Well, no, I don't trust brunettes either. Furthermore, I'm not sure Mr. Wolf would want to see you, so I... Uh... So? So why don't you, uh, trail me home, hmm? <laughs> Archie? Archie? Where's Santa Claus? Guest room. He was tired. What, uh... I've been trailed home. Me? By a blonde. Phooey. All right, I admit I didn't make any strenuous effort to shake her off, but she trailed... Where is she? Outside. Good. Your report. Oh, but she might freeze to death out there. That's her problem. Your report, Archie. It's short and simple. It would be simple. I haven't got time to resent that. A blonde is dying. As for the report... Corner of 34th and Carlisle is a very quiet spot at night. No one was around but a bum who got into me for a quarter. For coffee, he said. You will not put that quarter on the expense account. Stop worrying. It was a private gesture. There were four corners. Corner number one had a dress shop on it. Corner number two, a drugstore with a beautiful redhead in the window making with a hair rinse. The ad said her name was Noreen, but it didn't give her phone number. Ah, I... gee. <clears throat> third corner was devoted to a shoe store, and the fourth corner had a bank on it. A bank? Mm. Uh-huh. Kind of thought we'd have a pause at that point. Mean something? Inspector Kramer's information consisted oh, of... Oh, you're being coy. Kramer furnished the information the police could find no connection between the two murdered Santas. Except for the fact that they were both playing Santa Claus. Well, isn't that a little on the obvious side? This is an obvious case. The Barton home, Archie. Uh, marble and old lace. The butler, his name is Pleasant, was among those missing. Among those present, Laura Barton, the old man's niece, and Wayne Stevens, his half-brother. Ah. Yeah, only for Laura. Stevens was not at all pretty. It was Laura Barton who followed you here. It was Laura. 
Archie, uh, go upstairs mm-hmm. yes, and... Uh, oh, now, wait a minute. The girl, the weather, common humanity demands that you have... Louis, you speak for yourself, not humanity. I'm human. On occasion, a debatable point. Very well. Let her in. Oh, thanks. Laura, yes. come in. Laura Barton, Mr. Wolf. How do you do? How much money do you inherit on the death of your uncle? What? That is known as the shock treatment. However, I need an answer. Uh, Uncle isn't dead, is he? That, for the moment, is irrelevant. How much? Half his estate. The other half? Wayne, Uncle's half-brother. Very well. Archie, will you go upstairs and inform Mr. Barton that his niece is here? Uncle is here? On my way. Archie, Mr. Barton. Come in. Mr. Wolf would like you to come downstairs. I suppose he has a reason. Mm Mm-hmm. A blonde reason, your niece. My niece? That's right. She just... Where'd you get that? A man of my wealth finds it safer to carry a revolver. But it's not safe to point it at people, especially for the people. Turn around, Goodwin. But, Mr. Barton, we're protecting you. By letting that girl into the house... If I had the time, I'd be amused, as it is. Archie, you been drunk? Good heaven. Uh Uh-huh. Santa Claus came early. Your head. Which one are you referring to, my own or the one Santa gave me? You had better sit. No, no, I had enough trouble getting up a little while ago. I'm staying out of any positions in which I might have to do that again. Mr. Barton is among the missing. Indeed. Mm Mm-hmm. Hit me on the head and use the back exit. I checked with Fritz in the kitchen on the way here. He offered a reason for his peculiar behavior? Laura Barton. So? I I don't understand. Uncle wouldn't do... Uncle apparently has... He also would appear fancies himself in costume. He used to be very much interested in the stage. He he acted for a while, a long time ago, till the family objected. Archie? Got it. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. You recite very nicely, Goodwin. This is Kramer. Let me have Wolf, huh? Mr. Wolf? Inspector Kramer. Yes, Inspector? The papers haven't been carrying it, Wolf, but uh, you're working on the Santa Claus case, aren't you? Possibility? You didn't send Goodwin down to headquarters on a possibility. Uh, Never mind. We're working on a line down here, Wolf. Now, look, uh, if it doesn't strain your professional ethics, you might be able to help. How? There's a bank on the corner of 34th Street and Carlisle. We got the thought that suppose a gang was preparing to take that bank tomorrow morning. Those Santa Clauses have been on the corner for nearly a week now. They might have noticed something about the bank's routine, guards or what have you, that could interfere with the gang's plan. A mighty ingenious and imaginative thought, Inspector. Hey, you didn't say yes or no. I have at the moment no opinion. That's all you're going to give us? At the moment. However, Inspector, in a very little while, I shall give you, uh, <laughs> the murderer. Archie, Miss Parton will remain here. As for you... Yeah? You return to 34th Street and find our coffee-loving friend. Hmm? You will persuade him in whatever manner you think best to return here with you. Huh? Yes. <laughs> you know, I think it's possible you may be able to put that quarter on the expense account after all. You. What? Oh, why? I've seen you before. Yeah, I've learned to love the neighborhood. That's why it's going to break my heart. What is? Leaving it with you. With... It's sensitive about having guns pulled on me tonight. Let go of me, will you? Not until I... I... Yeah. Will you? Gun looks in a lot better shape than you do. You're coming with me. Oh, where? Mr. Wolf would like to see you. Hero Wolf? Yeah. Well, Why? He's trying to salvage a quarter. Ah, Archie. Uh-huh. 
complete with the... He wouldn't give his name. He did have a gun to it, though. This one. Yes. Archie, you know Miss Barton, of course? Hi. And Mr. Stevens? He joined us a moment ago. Miss Barton thought she'd be happy if he were here. Hello, Stevens. That's not the only reason I came. My brother is still missing. I'm concerned. Yes. You, sir, will you sit down? Watching people stand makes me uncomfortable. I don't have to. You do. Archie is stronger than you are. Mm, all right. Ah, that's better. If you don't mind, Mr. Wolf, I've never been here before and never met you. But you look as though you could handle things. I think my brother's been kidnapped. Possibility we should have to consider. Miss Barton, perhaps you have a theory, too? Well, I don't know. Uncle's been behaving strangely for weeks now. In what way? Well, I'm not sure. Wayne... Well, of course, John's always been a little peculiar, but I'm afraid I saw nothing especially strange outside of this Santa Claus stunt, of course. I see. Miss Barton, your uncle played Santa Claus all week on one of the corners of 34th Street in Carlisle. I know. On two other corners, two other men indulged in the same activity. Those two other men are now dead. Oh, no. Well, wait. Mr. Wolf. you mean they were killed by mistake for Barton? It is true that one man made up of Santa Claus looks very much like any other man's similar costume. But the answer is no. One of the two men was shot in his home after he had removed his costume. Well, then, what connection? Miss Barton, in the event that you wanted to hide a tree, where would you hide it? Hide a tree? Why, I wouldn't even begin to know. If you were very clever, you would hide it in a forest. If you wanted to hide a murder and were very clever, you would adopt the same principle. Wait, you mean that if someone wanted to kill Uncle and didn't want to be suspected, he'd... Go about murdering several people with an ostensible, if lunatic, reason. He would never say go about killing Santa Clauses. I get it. Then people would think the man he really wanted dead for a special and private reason had been killed for something that didn't point to him. True. That was why two Santa Clauses were murdered tonight. The third Santa Claus, however, the real object of the murderer's attention was lucky or suspicious. He fled. Ah, uh, do I have to hang around here and listen to all this? You do, my unwashed friend. Mr. Barton fled, and the murderer was in a quandary. He had, so to speak, invested in two murders merely to make the third one confusing. But he found himself unable to commit that third murder. He couldn't find his victim. Could he ask the police to do so? Hardly. But he might try to inveigle a private detective such as myself into the job. Uh, that makes sense, Mr. Wolf. but uh, why would my brother have deliberately fled from your house, uh... I, I mean, he was protected here, so... But do I make myself clear? Very clear, Mr. Stevens. Archie, that gun you took from that dirty gentleman, you still have it? I still have it. Then would you mind pointing it at Mr. Stevens here until the police remove him? All right, come along, Stevens. Well, that's the end of Mr. Stevens. Inspector Kramer will take good care of him from now on. But, now, Mr. Wolf, Laura and me and the refugee from a washcloth over here would still like to know how and why and who was involved. I knew two people had a motive for John Barton's death. Laura Barton and Wayne Stevens. One of them proceeded to kill Santa Clauses in the hope that the police would assume those killings to be the work of a lunatic. The paper certainly hopped on that assumption. Yes. However, John Barton, aware that his life was in danger, escaped his murderer and hid. In this house? No. A man in Santa Claus costume came here and said he was Barton. However, he was an obvious imposter. He proved that by his flight when his niece came here. You mean he could fool you, but he knew he wouldn't be able to fool me, so... Precisely, therefore, was not Barton. Who was it? Who else had disappeared at the propitious moment? The butler, Pleasant. True. I distrust coincidence. Stevens needed an accomplice, hence he sent Pleasant here. And Pleasant would give you a song and dance about Barton's danger and then scram. You'd start investigating, discover Barton was missing, try to find him, and lead Stevens to his victim, huh? I frustrated that part of the plan by insisting on Pleasant's remaining here, which he did until... That part of it's fine. But how did you choose between Laura and Stevens? 
It was Stevens who knew, without being told, that Barton had been in this house and had fled from it. Yeah. Yeah, you yourself mentioned that Stevens had only been here a moment, so you hadn't told him. Obviously, the butler phoned him as soon as he had hit you over the head and escaped. Furthermore, the butler masquerading as Barton had attempted to throw suspicion on Miss Barton. That convinced me of her innocence. Well, you've done it again, Mr. Wolfe, except for one minor detail. You are not very successful at irony, Archie. What minor detail? Where is Barton? In this house. Huh? When did that happen? You arrived home with the gentleman sitting near you. The bum? The... Wait, wait a minute. This I ought to be able to figure out myself. Laura said Barton used to be an actor. That's item one, huh? Yes, Archie. Also, why is a supposed tramp hanging around a deserted intersection for handouts? The answer is he wasn't. He was keeping an eye out for trouble he knew was after him. <laughs> oh, so it turns out I gave a quarter to a millionaire. Uncle, your uncle. Well, that is, I... I know, my dear, yes, I'm uncle. <sighs> I did a rather decent job, didn't I? <laughs> no one recognized me. Uh, except, of course, you, Mr. Wolf. Not recognition, Mr. Barton. Logic. Archie, open some beer for us. Yes, sir. Logic, eh? Well, whatever it was, Mr. Wolf, I owe you a good deal. How can I ever repay you? Hardly enough. The answer is simplicity itself. <laughs> Make out a check. have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolfe, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Howard McNear, Grace Lennard, Vic Rodman, Herbert Butterfield, Bill Johnstone, Gene Bates, and Bob Bruce. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Bashful Body. Don Stanley speaking. Crime Photographer. <laughs> Case. Hi, Ethelbert. How did Santa Claus treat you? Uh, fine, just fine. I'm so full of Christmas spirit, I could even kiss the city editor. What do you know? And me, I could even forgive and forget one or two of those Christmas neckties. <laughs> hey, some of those things are Lulu's. You ought to see the one Marvin got. It lights up and spells a message. <laughs> well, anyway, it's a, it's a beautiful sentiment. What's it say? The most wonderful words. Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. <laughs> gentlemen, this is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole, our adventure for tonight, The Santa Claus of Bums Boulevard. Christmas, about one o'clock in the afternoon, the Blue Note Cafe. Ethelbert, the head bartender, gazes sympathetically at the two glum faces opposite him, sighs and... Uh, Casey, I know just how you and Miss Williams feel. It ain't right to have to work on Christmas Day. Mm, the three of us should have different jobs, Ethelbert. You say, Ethelbert, where's Herman Chittison? Well, he's having Christmas dinner with his family, the lucky dog. Uh... Johnny Paul dropped in to play the piano for us today. Oh, good. Oh, my. Holidays don't mean a thing in our racket, Ethelbert. Newspapers must be printed. And guys in my profession have to stand behind bars and make with bottles. Mm, and lemons. Oh, well, it might be worse. At least we ain't got families. Well, that's what makes it worse for me. 
My family's a thousand miles away. I haven't got a family anywhere. Well, you've got sisters, Casey. Sure, they're all married. They all got families of their own and all 2,000 miles away. My sister Edna ain't married, but you know Edna. Yeah. Well, let's can this deep philosophical discussion, Annie, and get started for Hackett Street. Hackett Street? We yep. have an assignment down there. That's the crummiest street in town. Nothing but gin mills, flop houses, and bums. Yeah, it's Bums Boulevard. Why is your paper sending you down there on Christmas? For a story, of course. Yeah. Heather Burford, you know, for the past two years, at exactly half past one on Christmas Day, a guy has shown up at the corner of Hackett and Finley with a wad of new $1 bills, which he's handed out to all the rummies around there. Then when his wad is gone, he's beat it. Without telling anybody who he is, where he's from, or anything. If he shows up again this year, City Desk wants pictures of him and a complete yarn about him. We'll play him up as the Santa Claus of Bums Boulevard. The guy must be nuts, giving good dough away to a bunch of lushes who'll spend it on nothing better than cheap hooch. Huh. What kind of a guy is he? Oh, probably a publicity hound, I guess. Well, come on, let's get started, Annie. Yeah, we haven't too much time before 1.30. So long, Ethelbert. So long, and Merry Christmas. Mm. Yeah, it'll be a very merry and very Christmassy Christmas among the panhandlers and drunks we're going to see. You know, the holiday spirit's a lot of malarkey anyway, unless you've got a family. Come on, Annie. Yeah, you're right, Casey. Oh, uh, yeah, he's right. Walter, bring up some lemons. late. That man will have given away his dollar bills and be gone by the time we get... Well, Annie, can I help it if we ran out of gas four blocks from the nearest open filling station? You I could have had that. the tank filled before it went dry. Oh, sure. You? I'm wrong. I'm always wrong to hear you tell it. All you women do is nag. And a Merry Christmas to you. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry, kid. I'm a dope. <laughs> I'm sorry. I love the bracelet you gave me, Casey. Huh? Yeah. You have exquisite taste. <laughs> It uh, looks swell on you. Hey, I-, I wanted to get you a ring. A ring? Yeah, with your birthstone. Amethyst. See, I know it. Oh. Right. I didn't see any I like. It's just as well. I don't care for amethyst and rings. No? No. Oh. Wish I could afford a family of my own, Annie. Hmm? What makes you think you can? <laughs> my pay envelope, the cost of living. Well, maybe someday. Oh, but maybe when that someday comes, no woman will want you. Yeah, you may have something there. I've been a bachelor so long, Annie, it's become a habit. You know, this this morning when I woke up in my dinky little apartment, I felt oh, empty and lonely and useless. I haven't got a home. I felt the same way. I wonder, maybe, Annie, if the two of us... What about... The two of us. Well, I... Oh, nuts. Look at this crummy street and the people on it. How can anybody think of home and a family life down here? How can anybody believe in anything or dream of anything? Every one of these bums, Annie, had big ideas once, and now look at it. This street is frightening, isn't it? If anybody reaches here, he's finished. It's the last stop. There's a, there's a crowd lined up at the next corner, Casey. Yeah. Is that where they... Yeah, that's the place where the dollar bill Santa Claus has shown up before. Well, maybe he's been there and gone. Mm-hmm. No, if that were so, those rum-dums wouldn't be standing in line. They'd all be in the nearest gin mill spending the dough or fighting to get it away from each other. Well, I'll park the car here and walk the rest of the way. Now, the car may be safer away from that mob. That's how I figure. Let's see. I got the camera. Lock the car. Okay, let's go. It's um, quarter of two, Casey. According to his previous schedule, Santa Claus is 15 minutes late. Maybe he won't show up. Mm. It'll be a big Christmas thirst on Bums Boulevard if he doesn't. Sorry. Pardon, this says not see you. <laughs> okay, sister. Take it easy uh, now. I'm all right. Don't I know you? I don't think so. Holy. Miss Arnold. Oh, I... Uh, we're both mistaken. I don't know you and you don't know me. Uh, excuse me for bumping you. Goodbye. Casey, what... Annie. That dame is Julia Arnold. Julia Arnold? She was a big actress, a great star. Julia... She was a Broadway sensation when I was in college. Why, she was beautiful. Oh, Casey, that woman can't be... The way she denied her identity proves she is, Annie. I heard that Julia Arnold hit the skids, but... 
Okay. She was married to a nice guy who got killed in the war, and then her kid died. She... <clears throat> it's not nice, is it? Ain't fair, die, mister. Mister, die. <laughs> I guess so, old-timer. Let me see. I ain't a drinking man, mister. I'll spend it for food, not liquor. You don't look like a rummy. I ain't. I'm just old. You can ask anybody around here about Smitty. That's me. They'll tell you Smitty don't drink, don't steal. The worst they'll tell you about Smitty is he's just too old. Look, I, I, I haven't got any small change, Smitty. Here's a buck. Oh, and here's, uh, here's another for me. Two dollars? Oh, God bless you, boy. Forget it. Yeah. Goodbye. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas. And Merry Christmas. You didn't look like a faker, Casey. <sighs> no, just old. Christmas. There are plenty of fakers in that mob we're coming to, though. Oh, they look like a line of uh, zombies. Yeah. Dead and won't lie down. Uh-oh. Not that big guy over there, though. I need a, see that big, heavy-set mug with the green lumberjack coat. Why, he looks like a prize fight. I know that guy. His name is Boots Driscoll. He's a yellow skunk. He's mean as a copperhead. You know, that louse would steal pennies from Kid, and he's the uh, he's the boss of Bums Boulevard. I uh, gather you don't like him. I don't. Well, well, look who's here. Hello, Boots. Hi, Casey. I ain't seen you since... Yeah, since the last time you came out of the big house. <laughs> That's right. Who's the good-looking dame with you? This lady's a friend of mine. Well, ain't she gonna introduce us? Nope. Oh, what are you doing down here in my territory? Came to get a line on the screwball who hands out new dollar bills on Christmas. Apparently he's late. Yeah, the louse. When he shows up, I get a good mind to kick his head in. Yeah, not until after he hands out his dough, of course. You think he'll show up? The folks think, think so because they want to think it. Me? I just stick around and keep everybody in line. Well, so you got them all lined up. Yeah. First come, first serve. If and when Santa Claus gets here. All right, stop pushing, you bums. Get back in line there. Of course, you'll get something for your policing service. Well, why not? Them jerks would tear one another to pieces fighting for a grab at them bucks like they did last year if I wasn't around. This year, I'm taking a cut of 35 cents out of every bum here to keep things peaceful. Hmm. Boots, you've got all the instincts of a big racketeer. I'll say. Where's the racket part? This is a legitimate business. I guess it is at that for you. This way you're getting the dough without using a gat or brass knuckles. Say, if that's meant as a crack... Skip it, Boots. I'm nearly as big as you are. Uh... Boots. Boots. What? Casey, that awful look hey, at Boots. What do you want, Creep? Well, Creep's a good name for him. Hey, the guy who passes out dough. Santa Claus. I just found him. You found him? Yeah. In the alley back of Fritz's gin mill. Somebody sucked him on the head and took all his dough. I think the guy's dead. Dead? Dead. Dead. Yeah, dead. Dead? Hey, you bums stay here. Show me, creep. Yeah, come on. We're going too, Annie. I'll say we are. <laughs> there he is, Boots. Lying behind a beer keg. Yeah, I see him, creep. Hey, his pockets have been turned out. He's been rolled. There ain't a dime left on him. You'd be sure of that. He's so still, Casey. Is he dead? No. His heart's good and strong, huh? Eh? And he'd been knocked out. He's such a little man. Such a mild, gentle-looking little man. Who could have done I'll that? find out who took the dough he meant to give us. And when I do... Shut up, Boots. The guy just opened his eyes. He's coming, too. Yeah. Who are you? Just a guy who wants to help you, mister. My headaches. Yeah. It'd be a miracle if it didn't. It'd been slugged hard. Yes. Something hit me. Did you see the rat who hit you? The rat who took your dough? My dough? Yeah, you've been rolled, fella. Your money's gone. Oh, the money. Who got it? I... I can't say. How much did you have on you? Three hundred dollars in new one dollar bills. Three hundred bucks? Well, maybe the cops can get it back. Annie, see if we can find no, the telephone. No, no. No, don't call the police. Why not? You've been assaulted and robbed. But my head doesn't hurt very much now. I haven't been really injured. And I'm sure the thief will return the money. Return? When he becomes aware that it belongs to his neighbors, to his comrades down here. You see, I... I meant to give it away. You think the thief will return it on that account? When he thinks about it? Yes. This guy must be nuts. Thieves can be good people. Mister, you haven't been around much. You've got as much chance of getting that dough back as I have of being elected a Supreme Court judge. If you had taken the money, wouldn't you return it under the circumstances? Me? Uh, well, uh, of course. I I'm different. Well, you're different from the guy who got the 300 boots. He has it and you haven't. But maybe I'm wrong. Hey, what do you mean? 
At what time do you think you were hit and robbed, mister? I entered the alley at about 20 minutes of two. And I've been on that corner where you met me, Casey, ever since one o'clock. Every bum in that line will say so. You can't pin this on me. Okay, Boots, but you should understand my natural suspicion. Yeah. Ew, creep. Uh, yes, sir. What were you doing in this alley when you found him? Well, I was just walking through, honest. I seen a foot sticking out from the back of them kegs, and well, when I looked closer, there this guy was. Well, I didn't take his toe, Boots. Don't look at me like that. I believe you, creep. Why shouldn't I? Well, I don't. Let go my collar. Shut up, creep. Mr. Santa Claus, whether you like it or not, I'm going to find a cop and have this creep guy searched. Wait. You're not the wrong person. And I will make no complaint. What? There's nothing you can do, Casey, if that's how the little guy wants it. It is how I want it. you got to let me go. Okay. If it's just on being a sap, mister, it's your hard luck, not mine. Well, come on, Annie. Let's get out of here. Oh, I'd like to, Casey, but I've been assigned to interview this gentleman. Oh, no, that's so, yeah. Interview me? Yeah. Uh, to begin with, what's your name? Why, Shepard. Shepard? Yes. Uh, first name? Uh, no. Oh, Casey, catch him. That got him. Hey, the guy passed on. The crack on the head did more damage than he admitted. Hey, look, there's a clinic up the street. We'll get him to a doc. I guess you can take care of him alone, huh, Casey? Yes, I won't need your help. We parked our car near here. This alley, Casey. No okay, right. Annie. Well, how can you get along myself, Boots? So long. Oh, no, creep. Hey, why are you grabbing my arm? You're going to give me that 300 bucks you took. Our story will continue in just a moment. All of us at Anchor Hawking want to wish you a Merry Christmas. We hope that this great day has brought you all the joys that were so carefully planned. The gaily decorated tree, the happy exchange of gifts, the reminiscences of a united family group. Yes, Christmas is a great day for getting together, a time of goodwill, good cheer, and good food. Food that you can buy with all its freshness, taste, and purity, perfectly preserved. For this, we have to thank the many great organizations who process and ship us our better foods, and who know that flavor, purity, and freshness are best preserved in clean, sanitary glass containers. Containers that preserve and safeguard flavor and taste while they permit you to see in advance exactly what you're buying. Anchor Hawking is proud that so many of the leading brands of food of all kinds come to you in Anchor Glass containers sealed with Anchor Caps. Products of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. Are you sure you feel all right now, Mr. Shepard? Yes, Miss Williams. The doc said you got a really nasty crack on the head. I'll drive you home. He wants you to stay in bed for a few days. Thank you, but men are seldom as sick as their learned physicians say. I- I'm quite all right. Oh, just the same. We're taking you to your home. Yeah. Where do you live? Uh, very close by. What? You mean in this neighborhood? Yes, but I have some unfinished business to attend to before I lie down, Mr. Casey. That money hasn't been returned yet. If you get it back, Mr. Shepard, I'll believe in the faith that moves mountains. Mountains have been moved by steam shovels, Miss Williams. And man's faith in himself created the steam shovel. By that you mean you're going to do something to persuade the thief? I shall only remain near the thief so he can find me. I don't get you. Casey. Huh? Look. Holy. It's that creep guy. His face is terribly bruised. He must have crashed into a ten-ton truck. Yeah, he's, he's, he's dragging himself along. Hey, creep, what happened to you? Uh, How did... Hey, Boots. Boots. Beat me up. Boots? Uh, in the alley. After you left. Why? Uh, he, he thought I took that 300 bucks. He beat me up and then searched me. But he didn't find it, because I didn't have it. Hey, uh, buy me a drink, will you? I need a drink. Look, we're going to take you into the clinic and get you patched up. Uh, no, no, no. When the docs get their mitts on guys like me, they send us to the hospital where we can't get no liquor. So just buy me a shot, mister, huh? That's all I need. No, I'm gonna... We'll serve this man best by doing as he asks, Casey. At the moment, his body 
needs its accustomed alcohol more than his bruises need medical treatment. Ah, you're a wise guy, mister. You're a real gent. Unfortunately, I have no money to give him. All right, creep, I'll buy you a drink. And I'll go into a gin mill with you. Well, you tell me more about finding Mr. Shepard in that alley. I already told you all I know. Now, we'll talk about that later. Come on. We're going to this joint here. Yeah. Oh, this is... This is an awful place, Casey. Yeah, it is. You stay outside, Annie. Oh, why should I? There's another woman at the bar. Huh? Yes. That's Julia Arnold. Oh, I see. The actress. Yeah. You coming in too, Mr. Shepard? Yes, thank you. Hey, Gus. Hey, give me a shot, huh? Give me a shot quick. Not like see you got the dough to pay for it, Craig. I'm paying for his drink. Oh. Oh. Uh, while you gents and lady have. Nothing for me. Oh, me either. I'll have a little wine. Hey. One of the gents ain't ashamed to have a drink with the likes of me, Gus. Uh, what kind of wine, mister? Plain red wine. Uh, I'll keep for me, Gus, and quick. Okay, okay. All right, now we'll do some talking, Creep. Mr. Shepard says he went into that alley at around 20 minutes of two. Where were you at that time? Mr. Casey, no purpose can be served by questioning this man. I'm making no complaint to the police, and I... You may condone a crime, Shepard, but I don't. I don't condone the crime. I'm forgiving it. Well, we wouldn't have much law and order if everyone did that. Perhaps we'd have more, Miss Williams. This guy just don't care about 300 bucks, Hank. Ah, here your drinks. Uh, Give me close. The money wasn't mine, Mr. Casey. I'd have given it away in another few minutes. And a lot of good it would have done him. A buck a piece that it slide across bars like this for raw alcohol. Mr. Shepard, you seem like an awful nice guy, but it's time somebody taught you the facts of life. Few can teach the facts of life, Mr. Casey. Few but little children. Because man forgets the simplicity of childhood, he forgets that all the world is one great family. I think our friend Creep would like another drink. Yeah. And, uh, thanks a million, mister. Hey, Gus. Okay, Creep. We're with you in a minute. Hey, Gus. What do you want, Julie? Another drink, of course. You drank up the buck you gave me. No, Casey, that fine actor. Come here, Gus. Come here. There's nothing anybody can do for her, Annie. <laughs> Julia Arnold's hit bottom. Look. I fooled you, Gus. <laughs> I held out. I got another dollar bill. Not a brand new one, Julia. Yeah, another new. Uh, where'd you get this dough? When you were in here this noon, you said you didn't have a dime. <laughs> Julie found them, Gus. I found them, and I got more I hid away. You hear that, Shepard? I heard. When she leaves this place, we follow. <laughs> She's turned it into the same alley where you were robbed, Mr. Shepard. I see, Miss Williams. We saw her come out of that same alley just a little while before Creep found you. Poor woman. Yeah, it's a rotten shame. Julia Arnold was a fine person once. She can be a fine person again. Casey, why didn't you let Creep come here with us? Oh, because these bums all stick together. I know how they act. He, he might have tipped off Julia Arnold that we're trailing her. She's going down into that cellar, Casey. Come on, we don't want to lose her. Wait. That man... Uh, Boots Driscoll. He was hiding behind those ash cans. Now he's going down into the cellar. As though he were watching for Julia Arnold, as though he's following her now. Come on, let's go. There are rooms down here. She probably lives in this cellar. Yeah, but which door? Get out of here! Her Get voice. Out. Uh, that door, Casey. No. No. We're going in, all right. Let her go, Boots. I didn't. I said let her go. Broke my arm. What's the big idea, Boots? I ask her. He came to rob me. He said he'd make me tell where my money was hidden. And you're going to tell me all of you. Stick up your hands. Casey. The man has a gun. I see. Stick him up, I said. Okay, Boots. But you're losing what little mind you ever had, a lousy 300 bucks. Ah, shut up, Casey. This is my territory. I'm boss, and I don't take no double crossing. Hand it over, Julie, or... I haven't $300. I don't know what you're talking about. Hand it over. Don't shoot. I'll give you what I have. I found six dollar bills in the alley today. You have the four I have left. You're bluffing, but I ain't. Give me that three hundred. Keep back, Casey. You you get it first. You're crazy, Boots. Listen. Shut Tom. up. This is your last chance, Julie. Give me that three hundred or... Oh, Boots. Huh? She ain't got it. Creep. 
I got it. I stole it and I hid it. Here it is. You lousy double-crosser. Mr. Shepard, I... I'm sorry for what I did to you. I, well, I... Ain't never been no good. Standing at that bar with you... You drinking with me like I wasn't just a rat. I... I don't know. I... I had to get the dough. I didn't bring it to you. I'm sorry I had to hand it over to Boots. You gave it to him to save this woman's life, Creep. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I did. Another thing, I dropped them six new dollar bills on purpose in the alley when I saw Julie come so she'd find them and spend them and take the rap for me. There'll be no rap for anyone. You said it. None of you birds are going to live to squeal on me. You don't want to shoot us, Boots. Don't I? Do you? I got it. I got myself in too deep. Not yet. You haven't taken life. And your life isn't finished. I ain't gonna finish it and stir. I got a chance and none of you talk. Yes, you have. Why don't you shoot us, Boots? Well, I'm gonna. When? Shut up. I can't shoot a guy who talks like you do. Words have never stopped a bullet or a true desire. Ah, ah nuts. Here, Casey, take this gat in this dough and send for the cops. I'm tired of being a phony tough guy. Shall I send for the cops, Mr. Shepard? If you wish, Casey. I am. Uh... You're running this. We have $300. Everyone seems to agree that my original plan for its distribution was unwise. What do you suggest we do with it? May I have your suggestion, Creep? Uh, I tried to frame Julie. Give it to her. And your suggestion, Boots? Give it to Julie. It's yours, Miss Arnold. Mine? Three hundred dollars. Oh, I can buy a, a decent dress. Once I earn that much for a single performance, I, I can do it again. If you believe so. But I, I don't need this money you intended for the poor. I'm not poor. God gave me gifts I've squandered. I still have some left. They're all I need. Give this money to the really poor. What shall I do with it, Casey? Mr. Shepard? You're still running this. I'm photographer. Oh, hello, Casey. What's Tony Marvin worrying about over there? Why, he's writing a holiday poem. <laughs> and he's stuck for something to rhyme with Christmas stocking. But, Ethelbert, are you kidding? Certainly not. Oh, you mean... Anchor, anchor hocking. hocking. Oh, gee, fellas, that's wonderful. Anchor Hocking. A great name in glass. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole. Our adventure for tonight, Christmas Shopping. Late afternoon, a crowded aisle in one of our city's largest department stores. Making slow headway through the jostling shoppers are... Casey, I've never seen the store so crowded. Yeah, we say that every year during the week before Christmas, Annie. Where, where are you taking me now, huh? Well, you haven't anything for your Aunt Harriet yet, oh, so I thought right. we'd look at umbrellas there. On this side of the store somewhere. Yeah. Annie, look, uh, you can pick up a much nicer umbrella for Aunt Harriet than I can. I trust your judgment absolutely, Annie. So suppose, suppose you... I shop for all the uninteresting items while you go up to the toy department and watch the electric trains again. Uh, 
Well, you know I've still got to pick up a few more things for my sister's kids, Annie. And... Mm-hmm. Hey, Annie, wait a minute. Hang on to your pocketbook. Keep an eye on that little guy in the black overcoat just ahead of us. Who? That's Fingers Fogarty. One of the best-known dips in the city. Pickpocket? Yep. Shove through this mob a little faster, Annie. Now, keep him in sight. I think he's closing in on a prospect. You mean he's made up his mind about whose pocket he's going to pick? Sure, smart dips like fingers don't dive into just anybody's pocket. They hang around bars and wait for some guy to flash a roll. And they tail him. If he gets into a crowd like this... Look, Fogarty's doing his stuff now, Henny. No. Yeah. That big fat guy he just bumped into. Fingers took a wallet from his inside pocket. Well, I didn't see him. Neither did the fat guy. Fingers is a smooth worker. Come on. You'll feel very badly when we stop his special brand of Christmas shopping, but pocket picking is considered antisocial. I've got to get Mr. Fogarty. Well, he squeezed through the crowd. I can't see him anymore. Uh, neither can I. Look, Casey, yell out for somebody to stop him. Well, I yell, stop thief. Well, you can't let him get away. He won't get away. Uh uh-uh. uh. Every cop in this precinct knows fingers. He'll be picked up quick after a charge is brought against him. I'll help that guy who lost his wallet bring the charge. Yes, too. if you appear as a witness. I will. There's the fat man. Excuse me, mister. Huh? <laughs> Something happened to you a minute ago that I don't think you know about. What do you mean? Your pocket was picked. My pocket? Yeah. A little guy bumped into you, and as he did, I saw his hand go into your inside pocket and come out with a wallet. Well, I happen to know who he is, and when you report your loss to the cops, I'll be glad... You're to... mistaken, mister. I didn't lose my wallet. Huh? I'm sure I... I'm more sure. I tell you, I saw him. When a guy sees something that couldn't be seen, he's either goofy or drunk. On your way, fella. Well, I'll be... Hmm... Good thing you didn't get your hands on Fingers Fogarty. What, what he could have this? plastered you with a nice suit for false arrest. And I know he took a wallet from that fat guy's pocket. I was watching every move that Fingers made. Well, I was watching him, too, and I didn't see him take anything. And that fat man says he didn't lose a wallet, so... Okay, I'm goofy or drunk. Well, maybe you only need glasses. Well, I do after this. Several glasses. Let's head for the blue note. <laughs> You and Casey get your Christmas shopping done this afternoon, Miss Williams? Well, I accomplished quite a lot, Ethelbert, but not Casey. He got sore, and after that, nothing would please him. What'd you get sore about, pal? Nothing. Oh, he had a little eye trouble. Oh, gee, that's too bad. Did you see spots floating in front of you, Casey? My eyes are okay. Now, fill that glass up again, Ethelbert, and don't ask me any silly questions. Mine too, Ethelbert. Right away, Miss Williams. Oh, now, Casey, don't you think it's about time you snapped out of your grouch? Well... It's pretty silly to get yourself all burned up just because you made a mistake. I didn't make a mistake, Annie. Fingers Fogarty took a wallet from that fat guy's pocket. What burns me up is I I didn't find out why the fat guy denied it. Well, how could you have found out? Oh, I don't know. But I'm supposed to be a newspaper guy, Annie. Well, we may have missed a story with pictures. Here's your refreshment, folks. Oh, thanks, Ethelbert. Say, have you stopped into your office since you finished shopping? Say, uh, huh? bartender... Who's the boss here? Well, uh, what do you want? You want to buy a nice Christmas tree? You got some nice ones? A wagon full of them, fresh from Nova Scotia. Hmm. Let's see one. Well, I'll be right back. Say, um, Casey, have you two stopped in at your office since you finished your shopping? Certainly not. This is our day off. Then you ain't heard the big news yet. What big news? One of your police reporters, Jake Birkin, was in a few minutes ago and tipped me off about it. Gee, he was all excited. What happened, Ethelbert? About half an hour ago, the cops arrested the kidnapper and murderer of Gregory Walters. They did? Where? Well, where'd they get him? Well, like you know, before the Walters family paid over that $50,000 ransom to the kidnapper, yeah, yeah. the FBI made a list of the serial numbers on the bills, yeah. which they circulated all over the of country. Of course, now. we know all that, uh, Ethelbert. I... How's this tree, mister? Nice and bushy, huh? Hmm. Let's see one a little taller. A little taller, okay. Ethel Bird, will you tell us about that kidnapper? Well, I'm getting to it. Come on, come on. Well, a guy walks into a tavern over on 36th Street tonight, orders a drink, and hands a barkeep a 20-buck bill with one of them hot numbers on it. The barkeep checks the number, calls a cop, and when the cop searched the guy... He found about 500 bucks more of the ransom dough in his pocket. Well, Ethel, but who is the guy who had the ransom dough? The cops identified him? Well, they knew him as soon as they laid eyes on him. But, Ethel, but who is he? Uh, Please. uh, Hey, hey. Is this tray big enough, mister? Uh, let's see. 
Well, let's see one a little thicker around the bottom. Thicker around the bottom. Ethelbert, yeah. will you please Casey tell and us? I know him. He's always been a small-time crook, and I was surprised to learn he was mixed up with anything so big as kidnapping and murder. Oh, say, will you tell him? I am telling you. It's that little runt, Fingers Fogarty. Fingers Fogarty? Yeah, the dip. He had Walter's ransom dough on him? About 500 bucks, just like I said. Naturally, Fingers denies having anything to do with the kidnapping. He said he lifted the dough out of the pocket of a guy who was Christmas shopping in S.J. Franken's department store. Franken's. Around 4 o'clock this afternoon. Casey Franken. And that fat guy denied he's been robbed. Do you think he was the oh, I can't see Fingers as a kidnapper. He's always been just a slimy little sneak thief. Hey, what's this about a fat guy, Casey? Annie, Annie, come on. We're going to tell Logan what happened in Franklin's. Well, what did happen, Well, never Casey? mind. You'll hear it later, uh, Ethelbert. So long. So long. Hey. Hey. Is this one big enough for you, mister? I tell them to a whole complete news story in two short words, then they run off and leave me out on a limb. What limb? Too big? Hmm? Oh, you. Ah. Uh, uh, oh, no. We've got to have a really big tree. Uh. Do you think Fingers Fogarty may be just the victim of circumstances, Casey? Circumstances peculiar to his profession. Miss Williams and I have told you what happened, Logan. You can add it up. Captain, have you got anything on Fogarty outside of the $500 found in his pocket? Uh, not yet, Miss Williams. A joint he lives in is being searched, but uh, we don't think he was chump enough to hide the rest of his ransom money there. Well, if he lifted the five C's in that fat guy, he has no rest of the dough to hide. Now, look, Casey... Fingers Fogarty knows you pretty well, doesn't he? Yeah, sure, he knows me, certainly. Now, hasn't it occurred to you that he may have put on an act for your benefit? Hmm? I don't get you. Now, let's assume that Fingers is the real kidnapper. It's been over a year since the ransom money was paid. Fingers has been careful. He hasn't tried to pass any of the 50 grand because he knows it's red hot. But now he figures the heat has died down, so he sends up a trial balloon. How do you mean trial balloon? Well, he's got a record as a dip, Miss Williams. He figures if he gets caught passing that dough, we'll believe that he lifted the money from a guy's pocket. And to cinch it, he acts like he's lifting it from a guy's pocket while Casey is watching him. <laughs> he, he picked you for his star witness, pal. Logan, huh? hasn't it occurred to you that the fat guy might have been sending up that trial balloon? Huh? What do you mean? Assume the fat guy is the real kidnapper. And he wants to know how safe it is to pass those ransom bills. He knows that Fingers is a pickpocket. Well, he goes to one of the little runt's hangouts and flashes a roll in front of him. And then he leaves the joint, saunters into a crowded store where it'll be easy for Fingers to work, and Fingers does exactly what's expected of him. Uh. That's a reasonable theory, Captain. Well, sure. If Fingers gets caught passing that dough, the kidnapper learns about it from the papers and continues to let the money cool off. Also, Fingers has a long record. You cops won't believe anything he tells you. You'll tag him as the Walters kidnapper. Which will leave the real one sitting pretty. The only thing the real kidnapper didn't figure was that someone might see Fingers take his wallet. Well, maybe you've got something there, Casey. You and Miss Williams have never seen that fat guy before? Mm -hmm. No, no, but we'll know him if we see him again, though. Definitely. Uh, your description might fit a thousand guys in this town. I want you two to go up to the record room and, and look at some pictures we've got in the files. Uh, oh, great. That'll only take us about four or five hours, Logan. Oh, Casey. And this was to have been our night off. Perhaps you'll forgive this last-minute reminder, but there are now exactly four more shopping days until Christmas. That means a very real problem to those of us who like to put things off, as who doesn't? Is there anyone you've overlooked? Anyone to whom you want to give something beautiful, practical, and inexpensive? Well, you'll find the answer in Fire King Oven Glass. Whether it's a single Fire King casserole or an entire set of Fire King Oven Glass, prices are unbelievably low, and it'll take a minimum of shopping time at your favorite chain, variety, hardware, or department store. So remember, with housekeeping a real problem in this post-war era, Fire King Oven Glass is a gift that makes it easier in so many ways. Because Fire King makes foods go farther and enables you to turn leftovers into delicious main courses. Fire King Oven Glass is a product of Anchor Hawking. A great name in glass.
I don't recognize any picture here, Logan. Oh, me either. Oh, golly. Captain, why don't you have some good-looking crooks in your files? I'm going to have nightmares looking at pictures of so many ugly men. Oh, you should see the women. <laughs> Logan, you know, there's one picture here that bothers me. It, it, it resembles the guy a lot, but, but well, look at the description that goes with it. Nick Pencer, Woolstock Prison, discharged, 1944, armed robbery. Age 30, height 5 feet. Well, you said your fat guy was a six-footer and at least 45 years old. Yeah. He weighed a good 250 plus, too. This Nick Pencer's weight is given as only 135. Well, they can't be the same man, then. No, no, not a chance. It's funny, though, there is a resemblance. Well, uh, we need more than that. Uh, let's all go home and get some sleep. Me yeah. for that. Me too. I'm so tired I can't think. I'm falling over. I'll murder anybody who wakes me up before noon tomorrow. Oh, no, no, thank you. No, thanks. Oh, oh, oh. Hello. Morning, Annie. Who's this? Wake up, kid. It's Casey. Casey? Oh, oh, Casey. Yeah, Casey, yeah. You remember me, don't you? Yes, I do. And it's only 9 o'clock, and what is the big uh, idea? Annie, Annie, look. I think I know where to look for that fat guy. You do? I certainly do. The old beam wasn't working last night. But when I woke up a few minutes ago, I had it. The strong resemblance between that young half-pint crook, Nick Penser, and our big, fat, 45-year-old guy can't be just coincidental, Annie. They must be relatives, maybe brothers. Mm-hmm, go well, on. Well, I've, I've looked in the phone book and found only one Penser listed, John Penser, contractor, who lives and does business out on Dudley Road. I thought you might like to drive out there with me and see what John Penser looks like. Uh, why don't you have the cops go out and look at him? But Annie, you're not awake yet. Only you and I can identify that fat guy. Besides, if, if you and I find him, Annie, we get, we get an exclusive. The cops are in on it. Every paper in town will have Well, it. I'm awake now, all right. Where will I meet you? I'll be outside your door with a car in 15 minutes. Casey, I've got to dress. Uh, oh, we'll make it a half an hour, then. We'll make it a full hour and no sooner. Well, what are you going to dress, yourself or a Christmas tree? Listen, Annie, I can bathe, shave, and get into my clothes in 10 minutes. I put on underwear. Goodbye. <laughs> Getting close to that address, Annie. Yeah. This isn't a very attractive neighborhood. No. Oh, John Pence, a contractor, can't be much of a concern. And John Pence, a contractor, may be no relation whatever to the Nick Pence in the police files. The name's very unusual, Ann. I have a hunch. Uh-oh. There's the place. Yep. I'll stop here so we can look the joint over. Well, there's a concrete garage attached to the house with a good-sized truck inside and... Room for another. Hmm. Concrete mixer in the workyard. Oh, Casey, established businessman. Don't go in for kidnapping. I think we're on a wild goose chase. Annie, that guy coming out of the garage. Hmm, what about him? He's just a skinny little... Annie, you need glasses and a more photographic memory. He's the man of that police picture. Of course, Nick Penser. Now I know my hunch was right. He's looking over here. Well, he's never seen this before, but I'll get rolling anyway. Now, how can we find out if he has a fat brother? Well, we drop into one of these neighborhood stores and make a few inquiries. Then what? Well, how can I tell until I find out what I hope to find out? Annie, you're the darndest girl for asking questions. You really mm. are. Now, let's stop there. Now, we'll stop here. We'll go into this little drugstore right here. The druggist usually knows everybody in the neighborhood. Come on. Okay, but I think it would be simpler and more sensible to make inquiries at the precinct police station. I don't want the cops in on this until we know where we stand. Here, let me do the talking. It's your party, wise guy. You handle everything. Uh... What can I do for you, young people? Oh, hello, Pop. We're going to have, um... Well, what kind of ice cream soda do you want, Annie? If I must have an ice cream soda, chocolate. Chocolate. Same for me. Uh, two chocolate sodas. That's right. Oh, huh? uh, by the way, uh, I'm looking for a party in this neighborhood by the name of Penser. I imagine you know the family well. Penser? Yeah. Never heard the name before. Uh, you never heard of it? Change my order to raspberry. Uh, yes, miss. One raspberry. <clears throat> I'm uh, just a stranger here. 
Come down from upstate to handle this place while my son's away hunting. Maybe my granddaughter can tell you what you want to know. Say, uh, Katie. Yes, Grandpa? Come here. Fellas looking for a party by the name of Penner. Penner? No, not uh, Penner. Pencer. Oh, I know the Pencers. All of them. You do? That's swell. Eh? Mr. Pencil is down the street. Uh-huh. Over his office. He's a contractor. Uh, what's he look like? Is he, uh... uh is Mr. Pencil short and skinny and his first name's Nick. Uh, well, Nick Pencil's not the contractor. Yes, he is. Ever since he got out of prison a couple of years ago. You say somebody's gone to prison, Katie? No, Grandpa. They've come out. That serves him right, then. The man's reformed now. Oh, that's bad. Very bad. Well, Grandpa's a little deaf. Yeah, I can see that. Uh... Sister, I I understand that my friend, Nick, has a brother or a cousin. No. Uh, uh, maybe an uncle? No. Uh, here's the sodies. Uh, who gets the raspberry? He does. Uh, here you are, mister. Thanks. And, Mr. Casey, you have earned it. Sister, you mean Mr. Nick Penser has no relatives at all? He's got a sister and a nephew. Oh, that's a great help. How old's the nephew? About ten? No, ma'am. He's <laughs> the funniest thing. Mr. Gus Pence is a lot older than his uncle. Huh? Mr. Gus is Mr. Nick's partner, I think. And he comes in here all the time. What does Mr. Gus Pence look like? Well, he's tall and fat, and in the face he looks like Mr. Nick. Annie, give me that chocolate. You take the raspberry. Here's Mr. Gus now. Oh, Casey. He's our fat guy. Mr. Gus, these yeah. people were just asking about you. They're friends of Mr. Uh, Nick. Oh, that's bad. Is that so? He recognizes us, Casey. Yeah. Wasn't it lucky I had dropped in here when I did to find friends of Nick's? Uh, Grandpa, go back to your back room and put me up uh, two bits worth of turpentine. Uh, two bits worth of turpentine? Uh, go along and help him, sissy. He can never find anything. I'll no, show him, no, Mr. Gus. No. So you two were asking about me. You've been told that we were. I noticed a car outside with a press sign on it. Yours? Yeah. And you were looking for me because of what you happened to see in Franken's yesterday. If I said no, you wouldn't believe me. Right. This hand in my pocket has a gun in it, mister. So do exactly as I tell you. Okay. Remember, and don't pull anything. Here's a bottle of turps. Thanks, Grandpa. Here's your two bits. Uh, come on with me, folks. You said you wanted to pay Nick a visit. Uh, Casey. We got no choice, honey. Right. Uh, so long, Grandpa. Hey, ain't you folks going to finish your sodas? No, we lost our appetites. You didn't take even a sip of your raspberry, mister. That's what you think, sister. Get into your car. Both in the front seat. You drive, fella. I'll sit in back with this gat. Well, I drive, too. Just down the street to Nick's place. Mine. He and I are partners in everything. And he'll be tickled to see your old friend. <laughs> Turn into the work yard and park in our garage. And next to the truck there. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Now what do we do? You and your boyfriend don't do anything, lady. And to make sure you don't... You hit Casey with your gun! And you get the shape! That'll keep the two of you quiet for a while. Nick! Nick! Yeah? What do you want, Gus? Come into the garage, quick. Okay. Whose car you got in there? You'll see. Come inside and help me close these doors. Okay. What's the idea? Take a look inside this car. Who's the guy and the dame? They're the two I told you about last night. Saw that dip take the hot dough from my pocket. They got wise to the way out and located us. Hey, police? No. These two are newspaper mugs. I figured they were making this play on their own, so we got to take care of them. Uh, we can't bump them off here. We can. We do it nice, clean, and quiet. Get those big spools of adhesive tape from the house. What are you going to do? You'll see. Get that tape. Yeah. Yeah. Got the girl all tied up, Gus. And help me with this guy. Yeah. Wrap some more tape around his ankles. Okay. Yeah, hey. He's fixed now and solid. All right. I climb into that truck and start the motor, Nick. Oh, the carbon monoxide treatment, huh? Yeah. Nice, clean, and quiet. We just lock them in this closed garage to breathe the gas. Tonight, when it's dark, we get rid of their bodies in their car. 
Start the motor. Ann, I worked the tape off my mouth against that fender. Nod your head if you're okay, kid. Good. <coughs> I'm going to try to pull the adhesive tape off your wrists with my teeth. I'm getting lightheaded. Gas is beginning to work. <coughs> I've got the tape. Now pull and turn your wrists. Pull more, Annie. <coughs> Yeah, that did it. Your hands are free. Pull the tape off your mouth now. Oh. Okay. Take it again. Keep your head down low, kid. Try to hold on. I will, I will. Pull this tape off my hands. You, you, you better let me free my ankle first so I can get to that truck and shut off the motor. No, no, no. Free my hands. Those two guys may be just outside where they can hear. Yeah, but, but, but if it keeps on running... We'll, we'll... If it doesn't keep on running, we'll have no second chance like this. Free my hands. All right, all right. I, I, I've got the end loose. I... Pull now. There, yeah, does it. Now, unwind your ankles while I get this stuff off of mine. What What good will it do us? We, we, we can't get out of here. We'll get out. Don't this, breathe, Judy. This, this get out. garage is solid concrete. And I heard them lock those heavy doors when they went out. So nah, I've got my ankles free. Now, hang on, kid. I'm picking you up. What are you going to do? I'm putting you in this truck. This truck? Why? It's taking us out of here. Keep your head down. Okay. I'm driving through those doors. Okay, you get through. Pure air. Wait a minute, look. Also, those two panzer guys, they heard us. Yes, and they have guns, too. Step on my gas, Casey. Drive past them. Let's get away. I can't. You, you can't. Oh, What's oh, the I matter? I the motor. Duck this. Oh, why are they running away? They're, they're getting into that car. They're going to try to get away. If I can only get this motor started again. That did it. Now, come on. Casey, don't drive toward their car. They'll stop I'm driving into their car. <laughs> This 10-ton truck does a nice job when it hits a tin can like oh, that. Oh, Casey. My nerves will never be the same again. I'll never recognize mine either. Come on, let's call City Desk. <clears throat> get the cops out here so we can get to the Blue Note. I need another pair of glasses. The kind you fill. <laughs> Recently, in a big eastern city, a group of trained men and women called on thousands of housewives and asked this simple question. What kind of container do you prefer for the foods you buy? An overwhelming majority of housewives said they preferred to buy food packed in glass. Among them were a great many mothers of small children. And by a ratio of more than eight to one, these mothers said they insisted on prepared baby foods packed in glass. They gave many reasons, as you might expect. But here are the three reasons mentioned most frequently. First, glass lets you see what you buy before you buy it. Second, you can heat, serve, and store leftover portions of prepared baby food in the same glass container. And third, these young mothers agreed that sterilized glass containers are cleaner and more sanitary. You can buy an increasing number of the better brands of food packed in glass. And all of the better brands of prepared baby food come to you in anchor glass containers sealed with tamper-proof anchor vacuum caps. Both products of Anchor Hawking. A great name in glass. You didn't kill them two kidnappers when you threw that truck at them, Casey? No, Bethelbert, no. The cops pulled them out of the wreckage in fairly good shape, considering. They'll be able to walk to the chair. How about the ransom money? Did the cops find it? Yeah, yeah. Gus, the fat guy, confessed the Walters' kidnapping and told where he and Nick had hidden the dough. 
Gee, and all because you and Miss Williams did some Christmas shopping. <laughs> Say, what happened to the little dip, Fingers Fogarty? Well, in trying to clear himself of a kidnap and murder charge, Ethelbert, Fingers made so many admissions about his own specialty that the cops can keep him in jail until 1999. Gee, 1999, huh? Good heavens, Casey, what's that coming in the door? Hmm? What, what on earth? Hey, hey, what do you say, mister? That's the biggest tree I got on the wagon, okay? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, now that's what I call a real Christmas tree. Ethelbert, what are you going to do with such a big tree? Well, you couldn't get a little tree in that big room. Mm-hmm.